Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Museum of Cultural History at the University of Oslo. The seminar today has an extremely interesting agenda, thinking through making. How do we think and learn about the world through making and creating? How do, we, how do practical and physical activities shape cognition? Through six lectures, or more precisely five lectures now, this subject will be explored as an interdisciplinary collage of different perspectives and through a wide variety of sources. We are especially delighted to introduce the keynote speaker this morning, Professor Tim Ingold from the University of Aberdeen. Ingold is undoubtedly one of the great thinkers of our time. Through numerous books and articles, he has explored and discussed society, nature, and human life from many different angles and with an impressive interdisciplinary overview. One theme has been reoccurring in his extensive production, and that is the importance of practice or techniques in human cognition and social constitution, or thinking through making, to paraphrase the seminar program of today. No doubt, the theme is well chosen for contemplation because it offers intellectual path back to the founding texts on contemporary social research. For the local participant, it is perhaps also interesting to know that this subject was thoroughly dealt with, with by Marcel Moss when he visited Oslo in 1925 to give nine lectures about primitive civilization at the Institute of Comparative Research in Human Culture. We are, so to speak, walking the path, <coughs> old and well-proved path of classical ethnology today, but I am sure that this new journey on old ground will reveal new sites and new walking techniques that will make the path quite different from the, most, from the one most presented in 1925. With anthropology, archaeology, art history, and alchemy as the starting point, we shall explore a wide selection of themes that all discusses the relation between thinking and making by different means and with very different starting points. Finally, we will try to bring all the different papers together in a panel discussion this afternoon. I hope you all will enjoy the program and the lecturers, and please welcome the, our keynote speaker of today, Professor Tim Ingold. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's a great Honour to be back here. Do, you, do I need to be wired up? I think if you would mind, no, you no, would mind okay. if you can use this, just oh, put oh. this on your head. To find that I've been stuck in the sort of centre of this programme, um, with, with the reference to a course that I um, devised and taught in the University of Aberdeen, uh, it, beginning in the year 2003 to four, um, a course that was called on the official syllabus the four A's. Um, you know how in, in uh, university bureaucracies, if you want to uh, put on a new undergraduate course, you have to fill up a lot of forms explaining what your objectives are, what your learning outcomes are going to be, what the student progression is going to be, what the mode of assessment is going to be, and, I, I, and what the title of the course is going to be. And I said on my form that the title of this course would be the four A's, and was quite expecting that the bureaucrats would be completely unable to comprehend uh, such, a, such a program. But curiously enough, I don't think the bureaucrats ever look at these forms. They just tick, make sure that all the boxes have been ticked. So it went through. Uh, and um, the, the, the purpose of this course was partly, um, partly to bring together uh, these, these four disciplines of anthropology, archaeology, art, and architecture, but it was also to try and experiment with a different kind of pedagogy. It was actually part of a research project uh, linking anthropology in Aberdeen with art 
in Dundee, and we were looking at what would happen if we tried to introduce the techniques of uh, teaching, of pedagogy used in an art school into teaching anthropology. Uh, because anthropology was still being taught, uh, and still is being taught, in a very traditional kind of way. I mean, the, 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 the teacher would come up and give a lecture, the students would read articles, then they would sit down and they'd have tutorials and they would discuss these articles, and then they would write an essay, and then the essay would be assessed. There was no sense of actually getting one's hands dirty, getting oneself out into the landscape. And one thing we found very quickly was that, that we could read books or articles in anthropology, for example, about, about the perception of landscape, very learned articles, all written by uh, anthropologists and archaeologists who were sitting in front of their computers as they were writing about the landscape. As soon as we went out into the landscape and we started discussing these issues in situ, everything seemed completely different. So, so the purpose of this course was to see what, what would happen if instead of having tutorials when people would, would sit and read articles and discuss them, we actually did practical things uh, which, which actually involved people going out there into the landscape, making stuff and so on. And it, and it really transformed the way, um, the way learning happened. And, but I also I wanted to bring these, these disciplines together um, in such a way that, that we, would, we would think of, of art and architecture in particular uh, not as things that you could have an anthropological or archaeological study of, but ways of studying with. Uh, that's to say that, that in, in much of anthropology and archaeology too, art and architecture are understood as works of art, or buildings, and then the archaeologist or the anthropologist comes along and, and documents them or excavates them and then tries to interpret their meanings. So, uh, so you come along and, and treat art and archaeology as something, objects that you make studies of. I wanted to think, no, no, art is what artists do, and architecture is what architects do. And these are disciplines that explore and try to understand the ways people make, build, live in, inhabit, perceive their surroundings. And in that sense, they have much in common, art and architecture, with the disciplines of anthropology and archaeology. And, and one of the surprising things I found in when we started teaching this course and bringing things together was that the, the boundaries between these disciplines simply disappeared. It, it never actually figured as an interdisciplinary course at all. On the outside, it looks as though here are these four disciplines and we're trying to paste them together and build bridges. Uh, and, but, but soon we found that the, the bridges simply disappeared. Uh, students were reading uh, work that might have been written by an anthropologist or an archaeologist or even by an artist or by an architect, and it didn't really make any difference. The important thing was what they were talking about and what they were discussing. So um, I, uh, I began to think of, 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 of this not as a combination of four separate disciplines and trying to build bridges between them, but as the creation of a new discipline that didn't really have a name yet. But part of doing this, in, it, or it, it, in doing this, one of the things I had to do was to, was to set up a quite radical distinction, which is still very controversial uh, in my own field of anthropology, between anthropology and ethnography, thinking of ethnography as a study of the lives of lives and times of other people, but anthropology as an inquiry into the conditions and possibilities of human life. And that these are things that have different sorts of objectives. And I realized that, that this, this division between anthropology and ethnography is very parallel to that old division that has split the study of art between art history and art practice. This is a very deep-seated division that often is, is institutionally reflected. For example, in my own city of Aberdeen, we have two universities. The University of Aberdeen, which is very old, and Robert Gordon's University, which is quite new. Our university has a department of art history, but there's no art practice or architecture in it. Robert Gordon's university has a school of art and a school of architecture. And this division is, is reproduced over and over again, that the art historians are, are looking at works from different times uh, as, as complete objects, 
subjecting them to analysis and interpretation, uh, placing them in their social, cultural, and historical contexts, delivering explanations and interpretations for the rest of us who are not experts to, to, to read. Art practitioners are doing something completely different. They're actually uh, producing art, uh, and, and their concerns are, are, are very, very different. And, and today, these things are beginning to come together, but only, only just. And I think that division between the art historical approach and the arts practice approach is really very parallel to the division between ethnography, where we treat lives as things to make studies of, and anthropology, where we treat lives as experiments that we can learn from in trying to figure out what the conditions and possibilities of life actually are. Um, but by the same token, I found that we had to make a distinction um, within archaeology as well uh, between the sort of archaeology that is interested in trying to reconstruct as best as we can the lives of people living in different places in the distant past on the basis of whatever uh, data, materials we can recover through excavation, and on the other hand, a kind of archaeology that is uh, fundamentally um, exploratory uh, in, in trying to uh, find one's way in to, um, in, into the world through a particular set of, of techniques. So it was very taken by an article by the archaeologist Matt Edgeworth, who who talked about the way in which an archaeologist uses a trowel as they're, as they're feeling their way through uh, a section with the trowel, actually opening up this, uh, this site as a space of possibility from the inside. It's a place so that, so that in that sense, archaeology is, is thinking with the materials of a site in order to understand our perception of the landscape or about how landscape is formed, rather than trying to produce detailed reconstructions of how these people or those people happen to live. So we, we had the same division within archaeology itself as we have between art history and art practice and between ethnography and, and anthropology. And in putting anthropology, archaeology, art and architecture together, I really wanted to emphasize the, the exploratory part, the idea of an, of an art of inquiry of trying to find, feel one's way forward into the world and, and through that exploring the possibilities that, that open up. So that one could think of, of archaeological excavation in much the same way as anthropologists think of participant observation, as a way of opening up the world with other people from the inside. So as I mentioned, the, the students taking this course didn't have the experience of trying to build bridges between what uh, they perceived as distinct fields. And this, this was something that came as quite some, something of a surprise to us when we found that actually these boundaries didn't really seem to exist at all. So that I began to think of this course not, not as an interdisciplinary course at all, but as an anti-disciplinary one. And that's the way that I, I wanted to, to break down this very idea we have of the academic discipline as having a particular field of study. And so for anthropologists, this is their field. Archaeologists, this is their field. Artists, this is this, their field. Architects, this is their one. And we then have to, to somehow build bridges between these different fields as though we were like um, international negotiators trying to build bridges between, between nation states and actually creating the barriers in the process of, of doing so. I began to think of a discipline rather as, as a set of lines, a set of pathways of inquiry. And these pathways sometimes come together, sometimes split apart. And one could think of a discipline or an, an area of study not as a field, not as a territorially bounded space, but as a kind of knot, a knot where lots of different lines of inquiry start beginning to get tangled up with one another. And that's what we were finding with anthropology, archaeology, art and architecture. So, so we were trying to, to undo the territorialization of knowledge that is so deep-rooted in the foundation of the academy uh, as it's traditionally constituted. 
So in doing that, then we, we, we found that there, there were a set of topics that everything seemed to congeal around, and, and these topics were uh, design and making, materials, objects and things, gesture and performance, craft and skill, the senses in perception, lines, drawing, and notation. So that was how the course was structured, and on each of those topics, people would be reading uh, articles, books that might be written by people uh, in any of those four fields. Just very briefly, um, design and making was um, really about the question of how, how we understand making in the first place, and particularly in, in what sense can we possibly distinguish between the act of designing something and the act of making something? Is this a real distinction or is it an artificial distinction? To what extent does this distinction actually rest upon a particular model of how making happens? The so-called hylomorphic model, very, very deeply embedded in Western thought since Aristotle, which is that when we make something, we have an idea in our head of what it is, and we have a, a, so we have a form, doesn't yet have any material substance to it. We have a, a lump of formless raw material, and then we get to work, and once that lump has achieved the form that we started off with in our head, we're finished with the work. That is the hylomorphic model. Aristotle explained it in terms of, your, in terms of sculpture. Suppose you, you've got a block of marble, it hasn't got any form at the moment, it's just a block, and you have, it, and you have in your head the, the, the figure that you want to create in it, so you get to work, and once, you, once the figure appears into the marble, you've imposed the form on the material, and you've actually uh, made something. And in that sense, there is a clear distinction between design and making, because design is an intellectual operation. It's the formation of this image you have in your head. The making is the actual working to get that form onto the material. But what if the forms of things actually arise in the making process itself? Uh, what if, in fact, we don't throw a form onto the material, or perhaps perhaps the, 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 the form, in some sense, emerges out of the material, that we discover it in the making process, as many artists and sculptors, Michelangelo, for example, would say that the form actually was there in the marble. It was the maker's job is just to bring it out. Then how are we going to think of what making means, what design means, what's the distinction between them? So, uh, so that was the, 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 those were the, the, the issues that we, we were discussing there. And then we turn to the question of, of materials. And one of the, the first questions we, we asked is, well, what, if, what, what difference does it make if we um, regard something as an object or something as a material? I mean, here is glass. We call it a glass. Um, but you say, this is an object. It's been formed. It's been manufactured. Um, and we could pick it up and say, OK, here's an object, it's a glass, we can look at its form and the rest of it. But what if you said, actually, um, this is a lump of glass? What, what if we thought of this as a material? How, what difference would it make to the way we perceive this thing? And of course, the difference is that if we think of this as a lump of glass, then we can do all sorts of things with it that you can do with glass. So you, you immediately think of, of, of stuff not in terms of the form it already has, but in terms of its potential to give rise to other kinds of forms. You shift, in a sense, from a logic of being to a logic of, of, um, of becoming. So as soon as we move from the materiality of objects to the properties of materials, we begin to think of a world in formation rather than a world already formed, uh, and, and, and of materials as things that are continually in circulation, that mix, solidify, dissolve, and so on. And that led then to the third topic of the, of the course, which was about the, the, the difference between, between objects and things. You know, there, there's a great literature in, in anthropology, I think rather, rather silly literature, much of it, uh, surrounding the concept of agency and the central question of this, um, this literature is, do objects have agency? And the argument is that uh, that clearly objects must have agency because uh, if, um, if this, 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 here's, here's an object here and um, the thing is that uh, if, if I remove this object then uh, we're in a different situation because I can't pour myself a glass of water. Therefore, 
because of the object's presence, it does something, creates that possibility of me being able to pour myself a glass of water. Therefore, this must have an agency in the object, which is just another way of saying that the object actually exists, because if it wasn't, didn't have any agency, it wouldn't be there. So, so it's, it's a sort of circular argument. But, but the, 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 the question is that as soon as you start putting this into, into operation here, and then pouring a glass, then, then the way this isn't an object anymore. There's water flowing out of it, and water flowing into this, and stuff coming and going the next one. And water's going into my body. And we, we begin to see a, a world where, where they're not separate things, as though this has sort of turned its back on me. There's me and there's it, and I'm against it, but rather things that are continually uh, uh, engaging with one another with, with flows and fluxes, and where this thing here, it just happens to be the momentarily coming together of glass and water uh, in, in this particular um, gathering, as, uh, as Martin Heidegger famously described the thing. So he would say, this, this is a thing because it gathers the water into it. Uh, it's not an object which stands over against me. So we were talking about these kinds of issues, about, about objects and things, and, and the way we uh, addressed it actually was by making and flying kites. Uh, we, we, um, we, we, we all made, made these rather simple paper kites and went out onto the university's playing fields to fly them uh, and, and observed, now what's the difference when suddenly you find yourself out in the open with the wind and running about and this kite flying in the air, what looked like a rather passive object sitting on the table suddenly becomes a thing. I must say that uh, my, my colleagues, uh, other of staff at the university, even students uh, who observed us flying our kites on the playing fields were slightly puzzled as to what was going on. Uh, and I had to explain that this was a, a course, actually, and that we were doing proper academic work. Um, and then they were all rather envious and saying, I wish we could do things like that in our courses. So then the next topic was, was on uh, gesture and performance, where we were... <coughs> We're looking at the way there about how, how forms themselves emerge out of regular uh, rhythmic movement. Um, we're particularly looking at, at, um, at basket weaving and the way in which the, the regularity of rep rep repetition of, of movement in, in weaving a basket actually gives rise to the pattern and gives rise to the form. In our own experiments, we tried making making string out of fibre, and, and which you do by, by rolling your hand. It's, it's a very tricky movement. It turned out that the, 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 the girls on the course were much better at it than the boys at, at making string, uh, but this was partly because they were used to plaiting their hair and, and quite accustomed to this kind of, of movement. Then we got on to craft and skill, um, thinking of, of, of skill there as a coordination of action and perception, uh, where what is really fundamental to skill is um, the attunement of perception to the changing conditions of a task. We talked about the difference between, say, for the work of David Pye, the difference between the workmanship of, um, of, of certainty and the workmanship of risk, and, and about what's happened to skill, the debasement of skill um, in relation to particularly architecture and the fine arts in our contemporary society. I mean, that, that, that it is remarkable how, um, how nowadays uh, we talk about a skill as something that you might acquire on a one afternoon training course somewhere, uh, that, that clearly this concept of skill has become very seriously debased. Then we talked about the senses, uh, particularly thinking about seeing and, and listening, um, the difference between haptical and optical modes of perception, uh, critique of, of the anthropology of the senses, which tries to rather think of, of seeing and hearing as the way in which we construct a sensory input in our own heads. I wanted to argue that, that the way we, we see and we hear is part of our own practical observation in the world. If we think of, of seeing, for example, um, very often in the literature, vision is regarded as an objectifying sense. As when we look at something, we see it at a distance. But if you talk about seeing as watching, that's 
quite a different matter because in watching something you, you, you harness your own movements to the movements of the thing that you're watching with so it becomes very close and very engaged in just the same way as touching. And then finally, in a set of three things, the lines, drawing, and notation. Lines is a subject that's long been close to my heart, um, thinking about threads and traces and how they're woven into surfaces, and, and particularly about why it is that um, we are so obsessed in modernity with, um, with the straight line that if lines are not straight, we accuse them of being non-linear. People keep going on about, about um, linear thinking and non-linear thinking. And non-linear thinking turns out to be thinking that goes like this. And linear thinking is a straight line. But why should this not be a line? So it's really a difference between, between two kinds of lines. There's the line that is the trace of a movement. And there's the line that is the connection between points. And, and, and it's uh, uh, interested in how it is that we somehow moved from thinking about the line in one way to thinking about the line in another. And that brings one to the question of, of drawing. Um, it's a remarkable fact that, um, that traditionally architects, artists and archaeologists have all been trained to draw. Even if drawing is not going to be central to their practice later on, the assumption is that that somehow if you're going to be a real archaeologist, you know, you have to be able to know how to draw a site or how to draw an artefact. If you're going to be an architect, you need to be able to draw buildings. And if you're going to be an artist, well, you're so you need to draw. Why are anthropologists not trained to draw? They should be, because um, drawing is an extremely powerful tool of observation, as we all know. Uh, by drawing things, you learn how to observe them. And the beauty of drawing is that the observational movement itself leads a trace. So you can see what you've observed. And you can see where your observations have gone wrong or where they've missed something. So, so, so just recently we've seen the beginnings of what has come to be called a graphic anthropology, an anthropology which actually does take drawing as the heart of its method. And that's drawing on, on, on experience from these other disciplines. And then finally on the subject of of notation, a question there is, you know, how would you distinguish a, a um, say, a diagram from a drawing, or a script or a scrawl from a handwritten sketch? And what potential might there be for combining different kinds of notations? For example, on an architectural sketchbook, it would be quite normal to, to find on the page, side by side, mixed up, a, a drawing, some numbers, some writing, a bit of diagram, some arrows pointing this way and that. On that one page is combined all sorts of different notational systems. And th there's great potential, I think, in, in trying to combine these different notations. It's something in anthropology we've hardly even begun to look at, as to what would be the possibilities of combining different forms of notation. So, we were looking at all of those things, and that's just to give you a, a, a brief summary of, of what that course was. Um, I taught it up until about um, 2011 and then made it into a book, and you know, by the time the book's out, there's no point in teaching it anymore. And anyway, I, I was doing other things. Now, here I am in Oslo's Museum of, of, of History, and I'm told that the Museum's Research Council has been charged with breaking barriers between disciplines, and specifically the disciplines of anthropology, archaeology, art history, conservation, and chemistry. So I was thinking, well, this is interesting. Suppose that I was to uh, try and design a new course, not anthropology, archaeology, art, and architecture, but something else that would respond to this challenge from the Museum's Research Council then perhaps I should design an alternative for A's course. Anthropology, archaeology, art history, and alchemy. And I thought to myself, well, if I'd been charged with developing a course on these four A's, what would the common themes be? I've told you what the themes of, of the original four A's were, design and making materials, senses, and so on and so forth. What would be the themes 
If I were designing this course, what, what would be the headings that I would come up with? So I want to suggest a few possible themes, and they're all things that have been on my mind lately. They don't exactly fit together, and they certainly aren't ready to be assembled into a book. But, so here they are as, as scattered thoughts. So here would be my topics for a course on anthropology, archaeology, art history, and alchemy. Gatherings, recipes, the palimpsest, burial, time and history, experiment, and the post-human. So those, those would be my, my lecture topics, I guess, if I was on such a course. And so I've got to just say a few words about each of those in a rather random way. First of all, the gathering. This is becoming a very key concept in, in what I've been thinking about recently. And it goes back to a question which is very fundamental, though rarely asked. And that is, what does it mean to join things? I mean, things can be joined up in all sorts of ways in practice. You, think, you can think of couplings and stitching and, and welding and screwing and nailing. and you can, you can list almost indefinitely all sorts of different techniques that are regularly used in different sorts of crafts which would say this, these, these are ways of joining stuff up. And it, only when you join stuff up do you create something coherent out of materials. So any kind of work that makes something involves joining of some sort. And what, what really does it mean to, to join things up? Now, there's a word that's come into vogue, a sort of must-have accessory for every aspiring theorist. It's, it's this word, the assemblage. Uh, if you're going to, if you're going to you know, pose in front of a lecture and like, sort of make, a, make a talk, make sure you have the word assemblage in it. So that you sort of, so you, nobody knows exactly what it means, and it's all, all sorts of problems of translation from the French agencement, which is, doesn't mean, quite mean the same thing, and, and everybody's in the muddle, but you've got to talk about assemblages. And, 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 and what's, when you read about what, what this assemblage is, it appears to be that if you... If you have a, a number of bits and pieces that happen to come together just for a moment in, in, a, in a combination, so here I've got a little assemblage of a, of a mobile phone, a, a jug, and okay, there's a, you can, probably can't see it, because of, but I've got a little assemblage here of things that, that are not designed to fit together particularly, but, but by force of circumstances they happen to have come together here. They can go apart and each one be its own thing again and can, they can combine with other things in other sorts of ways. So the assemblage is, is bringing together bits and pieces that are thrown together by force of circumstance for a certain length of time before they fall apart again and get thrown together in other combinations with other things. And that seems to be what people take an assemblage uh, to be. And the, and the beauty of it is that it allows us to talk about the way things can combine into larger wholes without getting too holistic about it. It means that it's, it, instead of saying that once something comes together into a whole, it sort of completely become part of the whole of which it's a part, that it's subsumed its own identity into the identity of the whole thing. We can say that, well, at least the bits, they still have their own identity, and they can still go off and do different things, even though for the time being they've come together. And of course that's a very good analogy for what goes on in social life most of the time. People come together, they split apart again, they come together in other combinations, uh, we don't want to talk about society as this complete integrated whole because it tends to fall apart, but we don't also want to talk about individuals as though they were completely separate from one another. So the assemblage gives us a way of talking about that, that in, a, in a more dynamic, um, fluid way. But the problem that struck me is that that's all very well to talk about the way in which things are joined up but these particular things have histories and histories of becoming in which they actually don't just join up, but join with um, one another. And th the way I was thinking about it is, is w when, you, when, if, when you write a, a formula for joining up, and I have to do this gesturally because in a high-tech environment there's no such thing as a blackboard and chalk, so I'm going to do it in a sec. But, 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 but suppose that 
um, we have a number of objects and we're joining them up into an assemblage, we would use a plus sign. A plus B plus C plus D. Now, A, B, C and D are all different. But what about the plus sign? The plus sign seems to be just the same. It's just adding one thing to another. But what actually happens when you add one thing to another? One example that actually goes back to the work of Gilles Deleuze, who introduced this idea of assemblage into the literature under agencement, was a, a dry stone wall. If you're building a dry stone wall, uh, the stones are not cut in such a way that they fit perfectly with one another. Every stone is its own particular shape, but the wall builder identifies stones that would fit quite well here and there. And, um, and so you end up with a, with a, a, a structure uh, which looks like a very good example of an assemblage. Every stone has its own particular identity, but nevertheless they fit together. Into, into something that looks like a hole. And you could, you could say, OK, stone plus stone plus stone plus stone. That's the wall. But what's happening with the plus? That, that plus sign is hiding something very important. It's hiding the labour of, of the wall builder, who, or, who's actually maybe even starting with the quarry, where he's quarried the stone, transported it to the site, selected it, lifted it up, put it on the stone wall, and then... Of course, the weight of stone upon stone in settling after the thing has been built. In other words, this, when we look at the, what happens under the guise of the simple plus sign, we find a history. We find a whole lot of stuff that has been going on, from the labor, labor of the wall builder through to the ways in which stones um, interact with the weather and with one another, with animals the timing the graves by the wall and so on and so forth. In other words, that, that historical process. And if we put that dry stone wall into the historical process by which the wall came to be built and after that maybe eroded, fallen down, whatever, or used, then you begin to get, um, you, then each stone looks more like a line, looks like a historical trajectory and the wall is the way in which all these lines momentarily come together uh, before maybe uh, splitting apart again. So instead of having a, a convocation of bits and pieces, we have a bundling of trajectories. And it's that bundling of trajectories that I want to call the gathering. And, 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 and the argument here is that, that you, if you take any uh, constituent of the material world you're going to find these two things together. It's like a thing in its shadow. You're going to find the actual substance of the wall, which you can see, but you're also going to have the gathering, which gives the wall its coherence, meaning that it's something that took time to build and it will only last for so long. And you have to put those two things together. So uh, in all sorts of matter, the the explicate structure of the assemblage, made out of these separate objects, like stones, is accompanied by the complicate structure of the gathering, just like a thing and its shadow. One gives it substance, the other coherence, and only if we take the two together can we comprehend a world full of connections, but which, in which everything takes time to build, and nothing lasts. One way to think about it is that, is that the world is both chunky, like a mosaic, with bits and pieces together, but also woven like a textile. And this chunkiness and wovenness are like two sides of the material world, and they always come together. I'll just give you four examples of this, just to bring the theory down to earth. The first example is, is concrete. Concrete is, to put it very simply, the, big, you know, the most the general building material in, in modernity. Um, it's transformed the planet in many ways. Concrete is made up of two elements, the aggregate and the cement. The aggregate is gravel and sand, which are, which are you know, particles, lumps, chunks of matter of different sizes, depending on what kind of concrete you want to make. The cement is a binding agent that percolates around, in and around all these bits, 
and, and in a sense, um, glues them together. Okay, so concrete is a mixture of, of chunk and this stuff that's weaving in and out. And it's because of those two that, um, that's, that concrete has both substance and coherence. Second example, a brick wall. So it's an ordinary wall of bricks. And you're a bricklayer and you see the, the bricklayer putting layer of brick on layer of brick. But, but between each layer, he applies some mortar. The mortar is the binding agent that holds the bricks together. Now, you could, you could look at this brick wall when it's, it's made in, in two ways. You could say, well, okay, this, basically this, this brick wall is a pile of bricks. Well, it happens to have some water in between, but we can, that, that's just the space, that's just the spaces between the bricks. Basically, a brick wall is made up of bricks. But we could alternatively say, well, actually, let's suppose that the brick wall is made out of mortar, and the bricks are, 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 the, are the spacing between the mortar, rather than the mortar, the spacing between the bricks. So imagine the brick wall, and, and imagine in your mind's eye, take away all the bricks, what are you left with? You're left with something like a continuous fabric, actually with a pattern. And if the wall has two or three layers of bricks, as many do, it becomes actually quite a very co uh, complex pattern, and it's a continuous one. It, it, with the bricks, you can say, here's one brick, here's another, here's another, but with the mortar, you've actually got a continuous weave. Or, here's a third example, a construction kit. You've got a kit to make a, a model aeroplane out of, out of uh, plastic parts. And you've got the instructions and all the parts are preset, so they, they all fit together. They, and, and, and the instructions say, in order to make this kit, you need, this, you need all the, the parts. There's one other thing you need. You need a tube of glue. And you think, OK, what's the, where does the glue belong? Is the glue another part? You know, does that fit along with other parts? Or, 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 or what is it, this, this glue? And, and, of course, the glue, the glue is a binding agent that holds it all together. And glue works because it's um, usually, most, most glues consist of very, very long protein molecules, uh, which are like, like long threads or long strings. And, and at the molecular level, when the glue uh, encounters a, a, a smooth plastic surface, it doesn't see it as a smooth plastic surface because it's a, we're at the atomic level. It sees it as full of holes, and the protein... So it goes down, goes down in, into the, in through the holes on one side, up into the holes on the other, and it's like actually tying, tying the two sides together. So again, the glue is like a, a threading its way through what appear to be solid blocks of plastic material. And then the final example I want to give, which is, which is really fascinating, and I've only just been, been reading about it, is in the history of the book. Um, the, the, I, I can't go into the whole history of the book, you know, but, it, but um, it starts with, well, before the Romans, the Etruscans were making books out of, out of linen, but the, but the Romans were, were, were making two kinds of books. There were wooden tablets, which were bound together, and there were also folded notebooks, of just basically um, sheets of soft parchment. You put a few together and bend them over and, and, and tie them along the, along the fold. Uh, but then, uh, in, in, in early medieval times, we begin to get what is called the multi-gathering codex, which is basically a whole lot of these notebooks bound together in the same way that wooden tablets were originally bound together. And the people who did this binding were, were craftspeople who were experts in the craft of textiles. And, the, and the, um, the techniques of looping and binding that they used were exactly the same techniques that they would be using in other kinds of, um, of weaving and textile making. And they were the same skills actually operated by the same, the same people. If you were a bookbinder, you would likely also be a shoemaker or, uh, an, uh, or otherwise working with, with materials that have to be, to be tied up. And, and what scholars have shown is that if you, if you take away, if you imagine again in your mind's eye to remove the paper in the same way as you'd remove the bricks in the brick wall and just look at the, the, the binding, the looping structure, what you've got is a textile uh, with the fabric uh, looped in, in exactly the same way. There are a number of different variant forms of looping, but they all have their equivalents in, in the arts of, of textile making. So in every case, you see, you've got this, this mixture of, of chunkiness uh, and, and, and wovenness of, 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 of mosaic 
and textile of assemblage and gathering. So that would be my first topic for this, for this course. The second topic would be on, um, on recipes. Uh, and in a way it goes back to this question of what, when we, when we put together different bits and pieces of stuff and um, put a plus sign in between to indicate this putting together, what does the plus sign actually mean? Um, and this becomes particularly interesting if we turn to chemistry. Because chemists, when they uh, describe a chemical reaction, uh, say put H2O plus CO2 gives whatever it is, or whatever the thing is. So they, they put a plus sign in the, in the middle. And this plus sign is, is very far from a simple addition. What it is, is standing for a whole operation in which the chemist puts some material he's got from somewhere with some other material he's got from somewhere else into some sort of vessel and then something happens. And all of that is, is compressed or hidden underneath this, um, this simple plus sign. And the really interesting thing about recipes is what is being hidden under that sign. And we have to recognise then that materials are, or, or rather that, that stuff is, is made out of made up out of ingredients which um, where, where it's not simply a matter of joining together or weaving things and, and the, the, the simple example is is making a cake okay you're making a cake and and maybe the ingredients include uh, flour butter uh, sugar uh, maybe um, milk flour, butter, sugar, milk, you, you put them all together into a bowl, you do some stuff, you stir, you put it in the oven, and then out comes a cake. Now many theorists have been uh, very taken, myself included, have been very taken with the metaphor of entanglement. And they say what we have to do is to follow these different materials and we show how they all tangle with one another. But when you take your cake out of the oven, do you see a tangle of, uh, of, of uh, flour, butter, um, milk, and, and sugar. No, you don't. You see a cake, which is something altogether different from all of these things. So the, we, have a, we are faced then with a real problem of how to explain what materials are and what happens to them when they can become the ingredients of something in which they disappear completely and no longer, you no longer have any of these things after you've baked your cake, but you have something else entirely. What, in, um, what on earth has, has happened? And we are still stuck. We, st we still don't have, I mean, there's no problem for the practitioner in the kitchen, they just go down making the cake, but for the theorists, we still don't have a language to really account for what is going on here. But um, I in order to address this problem, I found that I have to make a distinction between thinking of the physical world as a space that is full up of different kind of particles that can assemble, elementary particles that can assemble into more and more and more complicated structures, or thinking of the world as continuous material and everything within it as like a fold or a, or a, a crumple within this. I mean, here, to take a very simple example, um, so here's a Here's a continuous sheet of paper. Imagine that this sheet of paper just went on forever. Okay, so then I go crumple it up, and then, and then I spread it out again, and I find I've got a rather remarkable surface that is full of all kinds of features. Hills, valleys, things. I could, I could, and, and now imagine that the whole world is like this, and that everything that there is in the world is like a fold or a crumple. It's not that the world, this world is filled with, with, with particulate things, it's rather that we have a world of continuous matter which is then folded and bent into all sorts of shapes and objects of the things we actually perceive. And um, so that's the difference between thinking of a world that is solid and a world in flux. And I, th and I think that the, the world according to alchemy is, 
In fact, a world like this, a world made up out of continuous substances, it, which are not made up out of, uh, out of bits and pieces like molecules, but, but, but substances that, that, are, that are folded, wrapped together, put together, uh, and, and then come out in different kinds of, of ways. Um, the art historian James Hel Elkins said that alchemy is the old science of struggling with materials and not quite understanding what is happening. And of course that's what painters have always done. And their, their knowledge, and before the days of synthetic paints, was also of substances which were very different, different not, not very different from the substances you'd find in an alchemical lab. And, and they bring these together, these diverse materials, uh, to combine and redirect their flow in the anticipation of what might emerge. So recipes are basically stories. They, they always have a narrative structure to them. Um, you know, first do this, first do that. Um, observe as you do this and that, how the, consisten con how the consistency of your ingredients changes. So in recipes, we don't see the transmission of coded information but a way, as in storytelling, a way of bringing the past into present experience. And, and we can show how knowledge grows in you as you follow the paths, paths of your predecessors and under their direction. So that would be all about recipes. We'd be thinking about, about how we think of the material world. Is it made up of lots and lots of molecular bits and pieces? Or is it a, a folded, crumpled a domain of continuous matter? In alchemy, what happens if we think of substances as part of that continuous domain of in flux, recipes, and then how does that translate into recipes seen as stories rather than as repositories of coded information? Now, how am I doing for time? Have I got, how much time have I got left? I'm, I'm okay, so I'm fine. So, so then the next thing is, is the palimpsest. Um, a palimpsest, is, I'm sure you, you know, is, is, the, is the technical term for uh, a piece of parchment that has been written on over and over again. I mean, in medieval times when, when writing was done principally on, on parchment, parchment was very expensive, and so um, it was very commonly reused over and over again. So you'd take your parchment, uh, you'd write on it with a, with a pen and, and ink, then later on you want to reuse it, so you take your pen knife, the same knife that you use for, um, for, for, for uh, scribing uh, guidelines on the parchment, you take, or, or for sharpening your quill, you take your pen knife and you scrape. Scrape the surface until as much as possible of the original ink has come off. You can never get it all off, but um, there's some of it comes off. And then you write again. And then after that, same thing again, scrape, and then you write again. And because um, you can never get rid of it all, because the ink tends to sink very deeply in, so however much you scrape, there's going to be a little bit, then the palimpsest looks like you've got some, some very clear writing, the last bit you did, but underneath there's sort of the ghosts, the remnants of, of the writing before, and the writing before that, and the writing before that. So that's, that's a palimpsest, and... Um, and archaeologists have drawn on the uh, analogy of the palimpsest to talk about what happens in a landscape, too, which is multiply reused. It's an analogy that actually goes back to an archaeologist called Osbert Crawford, writing in the 1950s. He said, and apologies for the nationalist connotations, the surface of England is like a palimpsest, a dot a document written on and erased over and over again. It is the business of archaeology to decipher it. And the features are uh, roads and field boundaries, woods, farms, the letters and words inscribed on the land. So there is an archaeologist making a quite explicit analogy between the writing and rewriting of, par of parchment and the use and reuse of the land, for example, in an agrarian society where, where people are, are farming, building field barrier boundaries and, uh, and, and buildings and so on. But actually um, the, the formation of the palimpsest is precisely the opposite of what you might think. That it's not composed of, of layer upon layer 
because precisely the opposite occurs. Between each act of inscription, you're actually erasing it. Now, again, it's difficult to do this, this without a blackboard, but, um, but let me just, just try and imagine it. Here's, here's a surface of parchment or the ground at time one. We, um, we write on it. As we write, our inscriptions, or perhaps we walk on it or, 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 or do agricultural tasks on it. As we write, our inscriptions seek, sink quite deep down into the surface. Then we scrape away that surface. So now that the surface is a little lower than it originally was, we write again, our inscriptions sink down, then we do the same thing and again. Now imagine what's actually happening is that the oldest inscriptions are coming up. So imagine you're, 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 um, you're an archaeologist uh, doing, um, out in the landscape um, looking for, uh, doing field walking and, and looking, for example, for evidence of ancient pathways. And with a tra trained eye you might say, ah, I can just see, just see the, the remains of an ancient track there. A few more years with the erosion from the wind and rain, it's going to disappear, but we can just see it left. That's right by the surface, the most ancient things. The most recent things are very clearly marked, well inscribed into the land. So you can see, actually, the principle of the palimpsest is not adding one stratum onto the other, but precisely the opposite. It's an anti-stratigraphic principle in which the past rises up even as the present sinks down. And there's a, a natural analogy to that in the idea, the old agricultural idea, of turning the soil. You turn the soil to bring deeper layers up and bury most recent layers down. And it's only in modernity that we've begun to think instead of the ground not as something that you regularly turn over, but as something that you add layer upon layer. And the really interesting thing is that this has an absolute parallel in the history of the idea of volume. The volume was originally a scroll. It was a thing that you rolled up or unrolled. A volume comes from the Latin uh, volvere, which means to roll or to turn. Now we think of the volume as a three-dimensional block, space. Um, in the history of the book, the scroll has given way gradually to the printed book, which is a stack of pages, in exactly the same way that we now think of the ground, tend to think of the ground stratigraphically in terms of adding layer upon layer, whereas traditionally you would think about it as something that is completely turned over. So there's a really, really fascinating set of problems around the changing perception of the page and the ground related to uh, changes in the way we write, um, and, uh, and the way also that we think about time. And that would then lead on in this imaginary course to my next topic, which is on burial. It leads on very naturally. Um, and burial, of course, is a very central issue for, um, for archaeologists. It always has been. Anthropologists interested in questions of life and death. Uh, uh, and um, I, I'm sure it has of, of concern to art historians as well. And to go back to uh, Gian Battista Vico in his New Science of 17, whatever it was, early 18th century, who's, who, who, who was wondering about where do we get this word human from? And he reckoned it came from the verb uh, humando, to bury, which of course has it, uh, correlates in the word humus for soil. Uh, so he reckoned that we called ourselves humans because we are beings that bury our dead. And a burial, then, is the essence of, of a human kind of life. And what we do when we bury people is to renew the force of life. The burial is something that then uh, uh, puts the past into the ground in such a way that the ground can then grow, can give rise to new life. Burial puts an active force into the, into the ground. And of course, the Enlightenment project turned that upside down and said that, no, actually, uh, we build, we generate new things by building up. We go upward from the ground. The ground is just a passive platform 
and the history that is deposited on the ground is just a residue, a leftover. It has no more force to it. All the force is going upwards. And that was why the Enlightenment project then gave birth to archaeology, because once you reckon that the ground is just a, a, a residue, the sort of the cast-offs of history, it's perfectly all right to excavate it and, and to try and figure out what went on in, in the past. So the Enlightenment treated nature as a, a passive depository for history whose energy is effectively spent rather than a source for, for growth. And with that, archaeology was born, along with the idea, of course, of the human career as an ascent from savagery through barbarism to civility. So then, what happens to the burial? For, for archaeologists, the burial is a kind of de double negative, the already buried of a buried past. And in such, it becomes a locus of dehumanization. In the burial, it's where you've got a human body that is basically reverting back into nature. But if we if we go back to Vico and also, of course, the ideas of most people who actually do bury their dead, quite to the contrary, um, the, the ground in which the body is buried, that ground is the very source of life itself. So this has uh, implications for how we think of the archive, for example. We tend to think of the archive as a place where all these this sort of um, leftovers of history are buried. We can go and dig there and see what we can find. But, but what is this archive is actually like the soil, the ground from which plants grow, from which histories, from which lives sprout, then we have something like um, Aaron, the philosopher Erin Manning has called it an anarchive. The soil is an anarchive. It's just the opposite of an archive. It's not, it's not all these buried strata underneath, but it's the ground coming up again, life turning over itself. And that then gives, would lead on to my next topic in this imaginary course, which would be on... Um, on the question of, of time and history. And I would go back to uh, a, a, a rather r famous pronouncement by the art historian uh, George Kubler, uh, writing in the 1960s, uh, who had this to say about the difference between time and history. He said, our actual perception of time depends on regularly recurrent events unlike the awareness of history, which depends on unforeseeable change and variety. Without change, there is no history. Without regularity, there is no time. Time and history are related as rule and variation. Time is the regular setting for the vagaries of history. And this is a very... Uh, what, what Kubler is bringing out here is, 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 is very deep-seated in our modern way of thinking, which is that, that time basically is given by repetition. And then historical events happen in time because they're a unique. But as soon as historical events begin to repeat themselves, they kind of fall back into time again. This is part, explains partly the way, what, way we talk about old people. You know, that, that, that um, people really do things in the prime of life. But as they get old, they don't really do things anymore. They just start repeating themselves. So the old person kind of falls back in, into time. We celebrate their anniversaries. We, we don't really expect them to, to do anything. And, and, and we talk about people in their prime. And, and the example, again, that Kubler uses, well, it's, it's like the difference between prime numbers and unprime numbers. If in, in, a, in, a, in a numerical series, every prime suddenly pops up as a new thing that simply cannot be factored as a multiple of anything else. So it's like the prime numbers are like these unique events in history against the background of all the rest that is, is simply um, multiples. That's the idea of history of as a series of unique events that is deeply seated in, 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 in our current historical consciousness. So what if we thought otherwise? What if we thought of history uh, not as a series of unique events, but as a process of becoming, as a process of growth, which is indistinguishable from time itself, understood as duration. Duration in the, 
as is beautifully put by philosopher Henri Bergson, duration, the process in which the past gnaws on the present and swells as it advances. So he has this idea of time and history as something that is growing and growing and growing and growing, and not unique to humans in any way, but is part of the whole process in which all inhabitants of the world in what they do create the conditions for the growth of further generations of beings in the earth. Two more topics, and then I'll, uh, I, because I've, I've gone on too long. Um, the, 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 uh, experiment, uh, and this will go, take us back into alchemy again, and what, what is the difference between an alchemical experiment and an experiment that might be performed today in a modern, uh, in a modern laboratory? Uh, and this would, would draw on the connection between the idea of experiment and the idea of experience. That in an, in an experiment that is also an experiment that is also an experience is one that where we intervene in the world in some way and then look to see what happens. And these are experiments in which not only are the things we experiment with tran are transformed, but we are uh, ourselves. So we begin to think of, of the experiment not as um, the repetition of an event under controlled circumstances, but as part of a journey that simply carries on. Deleuze makes this wonderful distinction between iteration and itineration. Iteration, which is done by major science when it just repeats itself and every experiment is supposed to be repeatable under controlled conditions, and itineration, in which every experiment is an intervention in the world in which we carry on and takes us to somewhere else, which then takes us to somewhere else. And in that sense, life itself is a collective experiment, a series of experiments we live in living, we are trying to figure out how to live. And then finally, all that would lead to um, the question which is on everybody's lips at the moment as to whether we are now living in an era of post-human humanity, um, or at least in, in an era in which, in which humanism has, as it, as it were, had its day, the, the, the humanism of the Enlightenment. What then would happen to the disciplines of anthropology, archaeology, um, art history, and in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an era beyond humanism. And there perhaps we can look back to the practices of alchemy and to the way in which uh, alchemists proceeded. And my, my own um, hero in all of this is a, uh, a 13th century uh, mystic and philosopher, uh, Ramon Lu. Uh, who argued for a definition of the definition of the human like this? He said, "He said, Homo est animal homificans. The human is a humanifying animal. And what he meant by that is is that humans are not humanizing the world. It's like we're not we're not putting our human imprint. We're we're continually creating ourselves. We are we to, to human is actually a verb. It's something he, we do. For, for Lul, everything in the world is what it is because of what it does. So fire is its burning. White is its whitening. Um, and and so he said, well then human, the, how do we define the human? Well it must be humaning. It's what humans do. And what the humans do is that they make themselves and they make the world as they go along. And we're continually doing it and we're still doing it. So I think we would perhaps, well, I would want to reimagine a humanism in which humanity is not already formed, but in, but in which to human is a world. And uh, sorry, in which to human is a verb. And that, of course, has implications to go back to the beginning for how we would understand art and indeed architecture because ever since the Enlightenment art has come to symbolise one of you know, the marks of specific human accomplishment but what if we said that art too is a verb it's an, an artifying and what if artifying was something where we could go back to the original Greek meaning for art comes from um, the Greek uh, araristo, um, from which all sorts of other words uh, derive with art in it, um, which means basically to join. What if then um, we get back to the original question I began with, what does it mean to join things? Because only if we join things can we inhabit 
a world that has some sort of coherence. Um, and I apologise for an incoherent talk. Before, while you think about uh, comments and questions, I have one myself. And uh, uh, from, from the beginning, you mentioned that, um, that your way of distinguishing ethnography from anthropology uh, might be a bit controversial. And, uh, and I was wondering, because the way you defined ethnography as sort of the description mm. of something, and mm. anthropology as uh, the engagement with um, uh, an experiment of living, mm. and made uh, participatory uh, observation sort of the, the, the core of that. Mm. I'm thinking, to my way of thinking, participatory observation and engagement with a way of seeing and living is also a core of how I see ethnography. Yes. Okay. So, so I, I wonder, mm. is there, do you have any examples of things that are referred to as ethnography that you would rather call anthropology? Lots. I mean, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everywhere people are, are, are doing, and my colleagues are doing, um, are doing what I would call anthropology, um, and they're calling it ethnography. Uh, and in a way, you know, amongst anthropologists, that's not a problem. We, we can have an in-house understanding amongst ourselves at least amongst anthropologists, you're not all anthropologists. So we can have an in-house understanding amongst anthropologists when somebody says, I, this is my ethnography, this is what I've been doing. We, we kind of know intuitively um, what it's about. The problem is that, that um, it's very difficult to explain that to people outside of anthropology who don't have that in-house understanding. Uh, 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 anthropologists have always had a problem with, with their public, with the public understanding of their discipline, and and um, the uh, the difficulty, in a way, is if we call what we do ethnography, then people out there are going to say precisely what you said. Oh, you're just collecting the data on other cultures. Thank you very much. And that's what mainstream and you get mainstream scientists think that's what it is that basically anthropologists are there to provide the data on other cultures that they can then crunch according to their theories, whatever it might be, no, scientific theories. So, so people in the humanities are there to, 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 to gather in the data, and which, which of course is not true. But as long as we go on calling, up, calling what we're doing ethnography, people are going, not going to understand what it is that we do because it's the wrong word. I mean, why use the word ethnography when there is no identifiable ethnos and where the intent is not graphic. It makes absolutely no sense. That's, that's the point. And, and, and because we're still using this word, we are conflating to our disadvantage two perfectly legitimate objectives. One objective simply to describe and document richly, faithfully, truthfully the lives and times of the people. That's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing to do. And on the other hand, to inquire into the conditions and possibilities of human life. And we've got to recognize that these are different things. They're both good, but if we confuse them under the same label, uh, we, that will be to the detriment of both. That's my argument. Okay, thank you. Yes? Any comments or questions? Um. Uh, mm, I have a question, and it's about um, uh, uh, it's about uh, the idea of alchemy. Uh, that, for instance, uh, Nicolas Bourriot has uh, been uh, speaking in, as an art curator, and uh, where he has uh, developed the idea of. Uh, uh, an inclination towards repetition uh, that it would at some point yield something exceptional. Mm -hmm. And this is also an idea that you find in Deleuze and, and, and difference and repetition, mm -hmm. that the point of repetition is not to arrive at something generic, mm -hmm. but in some way to arrive at something unique. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I'm thinking of your uh, stoneworker in a way at the semiotic border between something very physical and, and uh, also a cultural heritage somehow. 
And I'm wondering whether this idea of um, uh, repetition combined with Eden potence, that one plus one is one, that a stone plus a stone is a stone. I mean, you're, uh, the stone plus a stone is a new stone, as it were. Yeah. And that this, uh, the joiner is actually taking place within the stone builder, uh, embodying, in, in a way, this uh, repetition. Uh, and I was uh, thinking maybe about uh, you know this point of uniqueness when you uh, when is it you decide that the wall actually is built uh, that there is a sense that uh, now the job is done mm -hmm. as the alchemical moment so to speak um, it is in a way tangential to some of the things that you have been writing about in uh, with regard to, to Simon Don mm -hmm. and uh, these uh, things that he is talking about when it comes to individuation the synolon, not the symbol that kind of joins ide ideally uh, uh, shards that have come apart, but, but something, uh, a, a form that is terminated when we decide that the job is done. Mm. Uh, I'm just wondering if this idea of the job and uh, the uh, idea of repetition and, in alchemy are somehow related. They probably are. It's an enormously interesting comment, and it, there's so much in it that would take... I'm not sure that I can argue it, uh, answer it all on my, on my feet without going away to think. Um, but the, the, point about the, the, the point about repetition, of course, is that there's always difference in repetition. So that every, every time you do something again, it is on the one hand a repetition, but it's also on the other hand a new thing. It's like, like you know, I, I, I'm playing, uh, I'm playing uh, Bach suites on my cello over and over again. I play the same piece over and over again. And every time, well, I'm repeating it, yes, but every repetition is a new performance. And, and, and that, that, that's the key thing um, uh, which, which distinguishes it, say, from the idea of, um, of, of repeatability, formal repeatability in the scientific experiment, you know, where, where it was supposed to be, it's not, um, it's an identicality rather than the difference that's in it. So, so that, and, and it's the difference in repetition that allows for growth and becoming for concrescence, for the world to surpass itself. Um, otherwise, it would, we'd be stuck, you know, like an, a, a groove on a, on a record. So, 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 so that idea of, of, of difference within repetition allows us to, uh, to encompass a whole lot of things. Uh, with Lefebvre, for example, it, it allows us to talk about the rhythmicity of, of these kinds of actions, uh, about their generative force, about their becoming, about the way in which um, history can always surpass itself. So we can bring all those things together. But then that comes to the issue you mentioned about when do we know that the job is done. And it, it may be that in alchemy, you know, there is a kind of aha moment in which suddenly, you know, after lots and lots of trials and tribulations, something uh, suddenly appears. Uh, uh, and uh, it's a glorious moment. And, but, but then it, it, it is a moment of it's a moment of, of, of revelation rather than perhaps one of discovery in the formal scientific sense. Suddenly, now after all these trials and suffering often, um, the, 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 the world reveals itself, something, something appears. Uh, and it's the appearance that, and, and um, the, Henri Botov, the Goethean philosopher, has this wonderful idea about, um, about appearing. He says that although in ordinary language we say it appears, uh, philosophically we ought to say appears it, meaning that um, when you say it appears, the it is already there, um, we just have to find it. But with appears it, you're actually bringing the it forth in the act of appearing. And I think that's, that's what the alchemist is doing in that, in that revelatory moment. And that's what the wall builder is doing. He's appearing a wall through all this work. And, and there is a point, it's very difficult actually if you're, if you're building a wall, it's the same thing as drawing. Um, you know, when, when, does a, when, when if you're drawing, do you, do you say this is the last line? When you're weaving a textile, what is the last weft to put in? It's always a problem and it's the same that, that, that actually the, the it, and it's a question of the limit, and the limit is almost like an asymptote. You get, you get closer and closer to it, uh, but never quite manage 
to cross it. So that actually that, that idea of the limit, not as something you cross or something that you literally bump into, but as something that you, after a while, begin to inhabit, is, is really, really interesting. It's like another thing that I'm thinking about at the moment. You're, what happens on the border between life and death uh, is just, just fascinating. Um, over here. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm Mazia Rain. I teach at the uh, National Academy of the Arts. Mm -hmm. here. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Uh, I was very struck by your uh, comment about anthropologists being taught to draw uh, yeah. since we in art schools have been forced to write. So I think it's a nice swap to have Ooh. it the other way around. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I just wanted to share a small anecdote with you, and I'd be interested to hear your comments on it. Um, I was in a conference in London, and um, it was a, a group of artists and designers and art historians. And we poured out of this building to go to the next session. And the building we'd been in had this kind of white Portland stone uh, quality. It's a Portland stone. White stone, and the building opposite us was a modern building that was clad in blue glass. Mm. So as we poured out on one of those rare sunny days in London, the uh, the sun reflected off the blue light of the blue modern glass. building onto the Portland stone, which glowed mm. amazingly. And as we all poured mm. out, all the artists and designers stopped and turned around and were in awe of this amazing mm. sight. Mm. And all the art historians carried on walking uh, to the point where one of them stopped, looked back at us, came back and said, what are you looking at? And at that moment, I realized there's a difference between looking and seeing. Our training has trained us to see, which is different to looking. And I wondered, well, I just wondered. I'll leave the rest to yeah, you. But, but, but that, that, that's absolutely it. And it's why um, you know, I've always found art history profoundly frustrating because um, the art historian is, is, as we say, looking at a picture, trying then to extract uh, all sorts of meanings that can then form the basis of an interpretation, but is not actually seeing anything at all. And there's a wonderful pastiche that uh, Vasily Kandinsky wrote in, in one of his uh, essays from the 1930s, I think, when he he describes visitors to an art exhibition, and 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 they they've got their catalogue and they're going round from one canvas to the other, and there's you know there's a there's a lady who's not wearing anything, and here's a bowl full of flowers, and here's a landscape with cows, and here's a duke somebody or other with them, and and he goes through all of these things, and 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 then they come out at the other end, and Kandinsky said, why ever did they go, you know because these people. They can tell you everything about, about what works they saw, what the artists were, what school of, uh, of, of art they came from, who had influenced them, uh, what the context was in which this painting was done, who it's a painting of. But had they actually seen anything? No. Because, uh, and, and, and it was actually that, that little essay really... It, it did something to me because it, that, that was an aha moment for me when I suddenly realized that the whole problem lies in our insistence on wanting to put everything in its social, cultural, and historical context. And, and, and that, of course, is what we always say to the, in Anthropology 101. First thing we say to anthropology students, what we do as anthropologists is we, we see, look and, and, and see what people are doing and we try and understand and interpret what they're doing by putting it in its uh, uh, cultural, historical and social context. All understood, accounted for, and it doesn't trouble us anymore. And I realise that that is the problem because when we do that, when we embed, when we put everything to bed in its context and we've interpreted it all, we've understood it, we no longer see we no longer listen. Uh, we, no longer, we no longer have the challenge of this thing really in front of us and saying, look at me. And, and, and that, that's, that to me has is, is become a sort of <laughs> very, very important. And, and, and it is 
I suppose it's still that, that division in terms of training of students is still there, that, that art historians uh, are told that just seeing is not enough. You have to put that seeing into its place, and then you don't see anymore. Thanks a lot. A very, very short question. You, you started off studying uh, uh, Skolti Samis in northwestern, uh, uh, eastern Finland. Yes. How did you end up here? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a rather long story. Um, but there is a, there, there, there's a sort of a continuity to it. How can I... How can I... D um, because I was working with the Sami, I couldn't avoid thinking about relations between humans and animals. I mean, we're, we're fishing and reindeer herding and things like that. So, 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 so uh, and, and um, there, there are a whole lot of things I learned during my field work with the Sami. I, I, I did what I was supposed to do. I collected data on kinship and social organization and all that sort of stuff. But, but there are things that work in uh, work on you at a, at a, a sort of unconscious level uh, that, because you're growing up as a young man and so you, I, I learnt a lot about life and about how to be uh, from just working with the Sami there and, and I didn't know what I had learnt until much later on and, and, and there were the, the things I'd learned were about actually how you know by paying attention to things how, uh, how you understand the landscape by moving around in it uh, the, the importance of movement um, and, uh, and then um, the, 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 the fundamental point about that the, the world is not just human, but it's full of all sorts of, 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 of other kinds of non-human beings. And so that sort of drew me gradually into all these issues about environmental perception that I've been working on. Um, and that then... And the, and the questions about perception led on to its issues about lines, and these lines issues with lines led on to questions about art and architecture. There was one particular moment in, which in 2002, and I have been working in the general field of comparative hunter-gatherer and pastoral studies, because I've been working with the pastoral people who also hunted and gathered, until I figured in 2002 I'd had enough, and I said, I'm not going to do hunter-gatherer studies anymore so that I could concentrate on all the art and architecture stuff that I was finding more and more interesting. So that was a watershed moment in that moment in there. So it's, a very, it's too long a story to... But it's sort of one, one thing leads to another. Um, so two points. Uh, one to slightly lower the tone of the comments so far, um, and one genuine question, really. Um, so I'm usually based in the UK at an institute where we teach archaeology and anthropology as an integrated undergraduate course. Mm. Um, and it's really interesting to me even to see, so I'm technically the archaeologist on the anthropology interview when we were assessing them for admissions. And then within a few months and within a few terms, I suddenly have some of my more archaeology-minded undergraduates looking at each other going, well, do you know how anthropologists pluralize data? anecdotes um, and it's really strange to see that even within the same institute I know it's a it's a stupid joke it's not even funny by any means but it's just really interesting to me to see that even though we're really trying to go at it from a sort of integrated point um, that these whatever demarcation lines that they seem to pick up on or perceive them up, yeah, yeah um, compared to Norway where it's actually to be, it's actually two different disciplines being taught at entirely distant, um, different faculties um, so of course here we have entirely different systemic problems really um, but to follow on um, what you said about joining, um, I think it's really interesting to start thinking about technology and the studies that we do and the themes we're looking at really from the point of themes and verbs and actions and motions. Um, being a Stone Age archaeologist, um, it's, it, I still think it's interesting to think about joining and kind of the movements, even though technically all of the things that we do are reductive. Um, which then kind of immediately jumps back to the point you mentioned about Ma Michelangelo saying that the thing was in it mm. and appearing it. Um, so it'd be really interesting to kind of maybe start expanding on the ideas of what kind of technologies are, are um, in terms of gestures and 
if something is reductionary, maybe that still sort of falls in gathering and joining and composition and um, yeah, not so much a question as well, just a comment. Thank you. Oh, okay, two, two, two quick comments back. I mean, it, it, what, what you say is absolutely right about, about the, the way in which students seem to have a nose for, 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 for disciplinary identities and they, they pick them up very quickly and, and then sometimes exaggerate them, even if we're trying to do um, just the opposite. And, and I think maybe part of the problem lies in, in, in the way we present things. If we present something as a self-consciously, deliberately interdisciplinary enterprise, and we say to people, look, we are putting, here are two disciplines, and we are going to put them together. Um, just in doing so, actually, those disciplinary identities are, are reproduced. Uh, if, on the other hand, you said, here's a really interesting issue. Now, how are we going to distinguish design from making? Or here's a really interesting issue. What do we mean by material? forget about the names of disciplines and get students working on them, tell them to read this and that, might happen to be written by an anthropologist or by an archaeologist or whatever, so they forget about, oh, is this anthropology, is this archaeology, then, then it works. And, and I think that there's two, that's why I, I'm, I'm very sceptical about, about this push for interdisciplinarity. I think it actually has a tendency to reproduce the very boundaries we want to bridge. Um, that's a comment on on that one. On the other one, and just quickly, I mean, the, 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 I'm not sure. I, 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 just the question of, of your, how things are joined um, in practice is really interesting. And I think, and, and I think that we, instead of trying to sort of theorise the, this, we, we can we can actually draw our ideas from the action itself. And to, to, if, in a very simple case, say, suppose that you're you're hafting an axe, right? You've got a handle and you've got a blade. And, and, and there are different sorts of techniques involving resin, skin, string, various things for joining one thing, which is one sort of material to another, which is a very different material. They have different shapes. It's, a, it's an issue about how you join two such different sorts of things, maybe wood and stone or wood and bone, uh, together. And, and, and simply through doing that and through experimenting with different ways of doing it, all sorts of ideas emerge which then have uh, a resonance elsewhere and I, and I think that's the way to go about it to start from from that working with materials and then letting the ideas come out of that it's very productive thank you just hang on to your thoughts until the, to the the final uh, panel uh, uh, conversation I I just just a simple question uh, at the very end because I've been working with making things in, in my field works in, uh, in uh, Polynesia. And I, you have to help me out with how to understand my carving as a kind of joining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it is a joining in the sense that um, you've joined with it in the carving. Uh, I, think I, I think that's how I, I get away with it. That, that, um, that um, all sorts of things actually are joined with that, um, even though the technique involved, so, so it's, it's just one block of wood that mm -hmm. presumably has then been, been, been worked with it. But, but in working with it, um, you've joined with it, the, the chisel or whatever tool you've used has, has joined with it, flakes have been taken off. So as soon as you put it back into the into the process of its making, instead of yeah. looking at it as a finished product, that's when the that's when the joining comes in. Mm. Okay, thank you. Back everyone to the second session of today. Uh, my name's Caitlin McQueen. I'm also a member of the uh, museum's research council, and um, now I have the pleasure of introducing our next invited speaker, uh, Jan Arpel who is a senior lecturer at the Department of Archaeology and Classical Studies at Stockholm University. Uh, he specializes in prehistoric stone tool technologies and uh, has extensive experience with Swedish rescue archaeology projects. Um, his research focuses include flint technology, cognition and human evolution. And today he will talk to us about the importance of nodes and tokens in traditional tool making. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this seminar. 
Um, um, I will talk about uh, some of the experiences that I have had in stone tool technology, uh, working uh, with experiments and interpretations of Stone Age stone tool material from uh, Scandinavia, but also from an evolutionary perspective. And I call it tokens and nodes in traditional crafts. And I, and I hope that uh, that, that, um, that are appropriate ways of describing how stone tool technologies can re be reproduced uh, throughout uh, prehistory. This is a picture of Eric Callahan. Uh, sadly, he passed away in June this year, but I worked a lot with him. He's a, he's a dear colleague, uh, archaeologist, an, an artist, a good, uh, a good painter and drawer, and also an, an excellent uh, flint napper. And we worked together, for, for, well, we started working together in 1993, but we worked together uh, for, 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 um, for, for, a long, for a long period. Uh, so I'd like to dedicate this talk to him uh, uh, as a thanks for his uh, contribution to archaeology and, and uh, flint napping. I have a quote here, which is written by Carl Lashley, one of the proponents of the cognitive revolution of the 1950s. <clears throat> he was a biologist, and he wrote in 1956 that temporal integration is not found exclusively in language. The coordination of leg movements in insects, the song of birds, the control of trotting and pacing in a gated horse, the rat running the maze, the architect designing a house, and the carpenter sewing a board presents a problem of sequences of action which cannot be explained in terms of successions of external stimuli. And this was, of course, a critique against behavioralism, behavioralism which was the, which was the main uh, way of, of, of explaining uh, how humans learned things in, before the 1950s, or in the 1950s. Uh, it's interesting, I think, to, 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 because Lashley, of course, meant that that's some of the abilities that we, have, have, that we have and that we need to have in order to make, for instance, tools are innate. And they cannot be learned, but they, but they are innate, and others we, we learn. Uh, I wrote uh, in my abstract that humans are not defined by their, their ability to make tools or uh, that they communicate with speech and sign language because many other species make tools and use technology and material culture. And language, of course, is, is also is also used by, by, by almost all creatures, use, use language in some way or another in order to communicate. But what's special with humans is the complex ways in which their technology and language are constructed and executed. So, so both language, language has properties such as syntax, for instance, which means that the same words put together in two different sentences can mean two different things, and that's unique to... to to humans, uh, especially when, when we connect symbolic uh, meaning to, to the language, because, because birds have, have that kind of syntaxes as well. Um, of course, this behavioral mental flexibility that, that, that humans have is expensive. Uh, it, it requires large brain capacity, it, it requires pedagogical learning environments that has to be created socially in order to pass information on to, to, to the next generations and so on. But, of course, in a, in a new evolutionary perspective, it, it maximizes adaptation. It's very flexible. It, it's, if you, like humans, can learn uh, strings of, of uh, gestures together with tools and then put these strings of gestures together into whole sequences of gestures that produce different parts of a tool, stone tool technology, for instance, 
you are very flexible and you can adapt to environments uh, in a way. And maybe that's one of the evolutionary uh, pressures that have, have created this ability. Another thing is that human tool making exemplifies a capacity for multi-level action sequences that characterizes human cognition. And I will return to that. But what I mean here is that when we do a complex uh, activity, we, we, we have different goal levels. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you can, we can imagine that my main goal today is to go to a conference in Oslo to present the paper. But in order to that, I have to achieve lower level goals. I have to, I have to buy tickets or, or receive my tickets. I have to go to, the, to take the bus to go to the airport. I have to take the, the, the I have to fly to, to Oslo and then go on the train and, and, and book into the hotel and so on. And of course, on, a, on an even lower level, I realized that when I walk to the bus station, I have to stop to, to avoid cars driving over me or something like that. And, and uh, I think that's the way, that's a productive way of looking at complex technologies. But it also means that it's different to, to understand or, or describe complex technologies bottom-up. Uh, and I will expand on that a little. So, there are uh, complexly organized goal structures involved wh when, when we're producing tools. Uh, th this one interesting thing with, with, with material culture in a long-term perspective is that it seems to change uh, through time, but also that, it, that it's constant during long periods of time. And this is just one example from, from Pitt Rivers. It's the, the, it's, it's the development of the digging stick in, in Australia and Southeast Asia, where you can see that he, he imagined that the digging stick was the, was the original tool, and then this tradition was developed in different ways, becoming boomerangs and clubs and, and so on, through time. Uh, so so there, there is a systematic change of, of, of material culture over time that can be traced, and of course that's the reason why uh, typology, formal typology worked so well in the, in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, b because there is a systematic way that, that material culture changes through time. But it's, uh, it's difficult to understand why material culture remains the same uh, over large periods of time, and especially stone tool technologies. We have stone tool technologies that are almost... Un almost uh, uh, well, that, that stays the same for, for thousands of years without changing. Uh, and of course, when we look at, at experiment, experimental work on, on, uh, on uh, uh, culture, as for instance Bartlett's Remembering, a study of experimental and social psychology from 1932, we can see that the information loss in when people copy material culture is great. So between each generation you have an information loss of maybe 10-20%. Uh, and that, that makes it difficult to understand how can humans produce artifacts that are similar for long periods of time when we know that in copying experiments uh, information is lost uh, in a rapid rate between each generation of copying. And, and of course Bartlett, you, he did a lot of experiments. He did drawing experiments where people copied drawings, he did, he did uh, text experiments where people copied text and so on, and he could see this information loss uh, over and over again. And of course, the whispering play, where you whisper a, a sentence around the table is an example of that, that we lose information and we add the information between each generation. So there is a problem here. Uh, there is a low fidelity culture replication and it tends to wash out selection effects. Uh, th this, is, this is just an example. Let's say that we have an artifact. 
uh, with different traits, 10 different traits, and this artifact does not have a pure function. So, so, so it's not driven by a function, for instance, an edge or something like that. Then we, we, we could, after 10 generations of copying, end up with a completely different artifact. That, that, that's how great the change is when you do experiments. And the paradox here is that a fidelity threshold in social learning has been crossed by humans. Um, and how did they cross this? Well, I think one, one, uh, one in important way may be the, the, the arrangement of, of pedagogical environments. Of course, you can see great differences between chimpanzees, for instance, and, and humans when it concerns how, how humans try to teach their offspring, their children, and so on. Uh, so, so that might add to, to uh, high fidelity social learning that, 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 uh, that uh, guarantee that, that crafts can be maintained over long periods of time. But we also have the idea of cognitive types and share mental representations. In archaeology, uh, Dietz introduced uh, uh, the idea of cognitive types, uh, and, uh, and he suggested that, that people, when they make artifacts, they share, within a group, they share a mental template of how the artifact uh, should be made, uh, or should look like, the properties of the artifact. And then they reproduce that, that mental template in the material. Um, so that, that's... Uh, uh, another thing, and, and I was interested about this, so, so f I think for the last 10 years I've done these experiments with my students. We, we started in Gotland when I was working there, and I got the idea of this experiment from Don Sparber, uh, 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 I think he's uh, uh, maybe psychologist or anthropologist, I'm not sure, but <laughs> anthropologist, yes, yeah. And Don and this, is a, this is an old paper of Don Spaber where he, where he criticizes the idea of the meme. Uh, and, and the meme, of course, at that time was a very popular uh, theory. Uh, the, the idea that there are some kind of physical things moving between, between people and, and, and spreading in populations. Uh, um, and... and Don Sparber designed an experiment where he used a star like this. And he said that, that if we here in the room do a copy experiment where, where we copy a star like this from each other, we won't actually copy the star, but we will reproduce our mental template. And that means that the, that the variation in different stars that, 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 that we would end up with uh, is, 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 is not systematic. Well, if you, if you look at an arbitrary figure with, with, with a complexity which is uh, similar to the star here, we expect something, something different. We expect that people will actually copy the figure. And that means that we will have the information loss between each copy. Uh, and I use this because, because uh, I had... I had this was a course in uh, systematic archaeology. So, so the students were divided into two groups. One group copied my... The first person in one group copied my drawing there, looked at it for 30 seconds, sat down and waited for th three or five minutes, then went up to a blank paper and made a copy. And then the next person copied that drawing and so on. And the same with this. And then when, when we had the drawings, I mixed them up together and I, I, I let the groups make, make a chronological typology of these, uh, these uh, drawings. Uh, let's see. So this is an example of the first figure. So you can see that you have some kind of systematic change through time here. Uh, there, there is individual variation and, and things change. You see this little dot appears here. This, this gets a bit curved. 
when, when you let the student group make a typology of this, a chronological typology, they will succeed. Because, because of course, they won't know what was the oldest and what was the, what was the last, uh, but that doesn't matter. Usually they do, because this is more regular, so they, they, they think that that's the first one. Uh, when you look at a copy of a star, the, the, the groups have a very hard difficulty to, to make a chronological series of the stars. Because each star is not a copy of that star. Each star is a reproduction of the mental template that, uh, that, that the students have of a star. And that means that it's just individual variation, it's not chronological dependent. And you, you can make statistics on it and you will see that you, you, can, you can look at this uh, statistically as well. However, what, what's interesting is that after a certain amount of copying experiments, the arbitrary figure becomes, in this case, like a, an iconic figure. Now, an iconic figure in this case, uh, I would call it uh, maybe a snake or something like that. When it becomes an iconi iconical figure, you get the same results as with the star. So from here on, these will be reproduced and there will be individual variation that cannot be traced chronologically. So, it seems that uh, the students are looking for meaningful pictures and, and eventually a meaningful picture will appear and it will... My experience is that it will either be an iconic figure which alludes to something out there in reality or it will be some kind of symmetrical figure. This is another series with the same... And you can see here it changes quite rapidly from the beginning, but, but from here on it has some kind of... Uh, well, it's not symmetrical, but it's, it's easy enough to remember and it's symmetrical in shape. Um, and in, in this case it almost becomes like, a, like, like you, you draw a bird, or something like that. It's symmetrical and it's very easy to remember. So here you have gradual change, but then from here on you have this individual variation of a shared uh, mental template. Uh, so, so, so uh, I thought that... that um, well, I can wait for that. Just an example of, of uh, the fact that, that what is copied isn't actual, the, the, the gestures uh, uh, that are made the, the, from the bottom up, but that, that the, the, there is some, some mental ability that, that are used when, when, when you copy. This example is from a work that I participated with that Diet Stout, in, he's now in Emory, but he was at UCL when I worked there in 2008. And we did these experiments. And, and the, 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 the main aim with the project was to see uh, what the, the structural differences between making the earliest stone tool technologies that we knew then, which was the old one, mode one technology, and the developed Acheulean technology. And of course, this technology appears around 2.56 million years ago, and this technology appeared about 800,000 years ago. And these are the first artifacts that seem to have a kind of symbolic shape. It's the, it's the hand axe. What we did was we did uh, production experiments, where, and we designed a kind of alphabet for gestures, and then we coded the experiments uh, with, with eth ethological equipment. We filmed them and then we used ethological software to code the experiments. And then we could see that what really happens is that, that th th there is a big difference between the production of, uh, of uh, all the one all the one tools and, and develop the Julian tools. And it's a difference, and the difference is, cannot be explained by, uh, by a kind of, 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 of uh, increased manual dexterity, because that has been tested as well by French uh, groups of, 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 uh, of archaeologists. 
but it 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 could be explained and uh, by an increased uh, complexity in in the production sequence so so here we ha here we have tried to to explain it we have th th this is a biphase production we have shaping and then we have target selection we strike a flake off and we rotate the core and that's what happens in 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 uh, all the one napping it requires very little memory you 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 just work you 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 select a target on the stone tool you strike a flake and then you use that flake or you strike another flake and and it's uh, it's just that sequence that is repeated again and again and again and and create these uh, simple cores uh, however in a julian napping another sequence of gesture is added between these uh, sequ sequences and that is a preparation sequence where, you, where, we, where the napper preparates the edge and turns uh, the, the, the core around and then strike a flake. So it's an added sequence making it more complex and you can measure it statistically with different mes methods. So this, this is just a network analysis showing this and, and uh, this, is ca this is a hidden Markov analysis also showing it. At that time we, we thought also that, that because we had activity in the prefrontal cortex on the right side of the, of the, of the experiment people, we thought that the planning activity in the brain could be involved in this. It turned, turned out that it wasn't. Uh, but, but I can explain that to someone else if, you, if, you, if you're curious, so you can for, forget that slide. Uh, and of course, when, when we compared our experimental uh, hand axis with hand axis from Boxgrove, which is one of the uh, which is one of the sites with the largest amount of hand axis in, in, in Europe, uh, we could see that, that the quality of, of our hand axis matched also the quality of, of the box grow hand axis, meaning that our beginners did hand axis that, that were very irregular and, and uh, didn't have much symmetry, while the expert nappers did hand axis that was very symmetric, symmetrical. And that was also the case with, with the finest examples of hand axis in, in box grow. So symmetry seemed to play into this uh, uh, equation. Um, so, to sum up, uh, humans ha have this ability to, to pr probably because of our brains, to, to practice uh, and, and put pr practice sequences of events uh, in practical. You can perhaps. Uh, uh, compare it with when you when you nap the code when you when you walk into the university you have a four digit code that you press into the, to, to the box and then the door opens usually when i worked in lund every summer when i came back in in september i've forgotten that code uh, but the interesting thing was because I've, I've 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 done it so many times i just turned around like this and then i went back and raised my hand and then the, the hand pressed the code without me figuring it out. So, so humans practice these sequences of events in, in, in small strings and then they can put these sequences of events uh, in order like this. They start with a target selection, prep, preparation, percussion, core rotation and then they maybe continue and then once and again, they, they do a core rotation, flake abrasion, flake edge examination, and so on. And, and these systems can be, can be very, very complex. I mean, this is a very simple technology compared to, to, to later technologies. So we have this ability, free use of, of, of action, and, and I've illustrated it here with, with a late Paleolithic uh, hunter, I guess, who, who, who naps blades and these blades are turned into back blades and burins that are used on, on uh, antler to produce uh, spearheads uh, and so on and, and, and uh, th this is of course a, a generative 
uh, way of using technology, which means that technology changes very fast when humans are, when, when humans are involved, compared to, for instance, uh, the, the Neanderthals don't do technology that remain pretty constant for 300,000 years. Uh, uh, it clearly doesn't have the generative, uh, at least not, not, not the generative uh, aspect that, that uh, modern humans have. Um, and of course we can c compare that with generative language, that's a big debate. Uh, generative music, of course, is the same and mathematics has the same kind of property. It involves uh, sequences and recursion and, um, and so on. This is just another way of trying to illustrate it. And, and you can think of this chain as, 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 as an illustration of, of, of this multi-level goal structure that, that, that we have. The ultimate goal might be to, to produce a narrative, but, but in order to do that you have to have the phonemes, you have to have the morphemes, you have the sentences and paragraphs. The, the, the ultimate goal might be to produce an artifact with symbolic or, or practical, uh, pr practical artifact, but in order to do that you have to have the gestures with the tools, you have to have put the gestures together in technological elements, you have to put these technological elements into the proper technological syntax and reach the ideal symmetry of the artifact before it's uh, symbolically externalized. So, uh, w one idea here is that uh, I talked about the, 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 this problem or paradox with, with the reproduction of material culture, that we have this copying fidelity problem uh, but, but humans seem to be able to make artifacts that are similar anyway. And one way of, of approaching that problem is to, to use uh, a term called program level copying that was introduced, I think, by Bernard and Russell in 1998. Now, program level copying, they uh, developed the idea to understand uh, gorillas. Uh, and it was a certain behavior that they looked at. They, they could see that the gorillas in in a group uh, used the same method to prepare uh, leaves in order to eat them. So they packaged, it. they had a whirl of leaves, they, they took away the stems, they folded a parcel and they, they, had, they formed nettle leaf mouthful pieces that they could eat like this. And they wondered, is this a question of copying every every detail of, of this process. No, they, they realized. It was a copying of a, a few nodes that were important in the production. So in this case, all the gorillas had to have a world leaf, that's one node. Uh, they had to take away the stems of the leaves and have it in a world, that's one node that all had to reach. They had to fold the nettle parcel and then they, they had this package that they could eat. But the individual way that they did this was, was unique. So, so there, there, is, there is an idiosyncratic way to, to move between these nodes. Uh, and, and what's interesting here is that that might explain why material culture looks like it does, and especially in stone tools, in, in humans, because, uh, as I said, it's, it's very difficult to, to measure each gesture and, and try to understand the process of a technology, and it failed when it, come to, when it came to the Paleolithic artifacts that I showed you. It's very difficult to, to explain it from bottom up, and that's because it's very idiosyncratic. People use their arms and, and tools in very different ways, however, certain certain nodes has to be reached uh, and I suggest that those nodes usually have an iconic shape or they have a symmetrical shape because that's shapes that are easy to, 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 to remember and of course symmetry, the, the ability to recognize symmetry we share that ability with almost all higher animals because it was developed very early in evolution and it, 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 
it's supposed to be developed because uh, animals need to see objects in, 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 in the periphery of their vision. And symmetry helps to, to recognize objects there. But, but this could be... Uh, th this this uh, could, could, uh, could maybe uh, explain the, 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 the paradox with, with the copying. Because if you copy only a few nodes and everything else is idiosyncratic, then there will be much less uh, copying error. Uh, and of course, if, if the final product has a shape as well, you have to reach that shape. So I suggest that these nodes uh, need token. They need to be tokenized. Say, tokenized. And the, the tokens that humans use are uh, either iconic shapes that, that they are very familiar with, or symmetrical shapes that they have the ability to recognize uh, by, by, by nature. Um, uh, of course, the, the, so, so, so you could say, if you look at the Chan Operatoire uh, uh, diagram like this, uh, we can say that we have a group of people that share a recipe of action. They share knowledge of how to make a certain kind of art artifact. And, and they know about the gestures, the element, the syntax, the ideal, and the symbolic uh, relationships. And perhaps you could also, which Darwin did, of course, and, and Lashley, and Leroy Goron, and Holloway, and many others, uh, compare this with language and the way language is structured. Uh, and then we have the finished artifact here. Um, of course, we realize that, uh, that the, gr the, the group of people here who shares the recipe have very different abilities. Uh, so we have psychological constraints on individual know-how. So, so children will, will try to follow the recipe, but their access will be very poor. And, and beginners, their access will be very poor and so on. While those uh, proficient nappers will, will produce very nice access according to the same recipe of action. And, and of course, we also have environmental constraints co concerning uh, raw material availability and so on. But, uh, but uh, what we can say is that within a group sharing a recipe of action, we will have a variety of, 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 of different artifacts, even though the same recipe of action has been used. At the same time, humans copy finished artifacts, but, they, but then they introduce new ways, new, new recipes of action. So, so, so a group that are familiar with this artifact, but does not share this recipe of action, will frequently try to copy this artifact and they will develop their own uh, uh, recipe of action. But in that copying, you will have the copying error. So, so, so it, it, it's possible in archaeology to see, to see if you have what, what, I, what I call just phenotypic variation, which is not cr tied to chronology or anything like that, but, but just individual, or if you have chronological variation, because then you have someone copying this. <coughs> uh, this is... This is uh, this is an experiment that Kim Dormack did, in, uh, published in 2011, uh, which I think is also very interesting because he was interested in skill and, and how we could define skill in stone tool making. And he worked with bifacial artifacts, which is these flat, uh, 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 napped pieces. Uh, and he realized that, that by documenting three, uh, uh, three what, what do you call them, uh, three uh, dimensions. By, by documenting three dimensions on different arrowheads that, that different nappers had made with different experiences. And, and the dimensions are uh, outline, uh, uh, the, the symmetry of the outline, the symmetry of the profile, and the symmetry of the cross-section at three 
points. Uh, and the idea here was that, that symmetry is connected to, to skill. And sure enough, uh, the, what seems to separate the really good flint nappers from the less good flint nappers is the way to control three dimensions at the same time. The outline dimension, symmetry of the outline dimension, the symmetry of the profile, and the symmetry of the cross section. If, if you cannot control all of these three uh, outlines or uh, symmetrical outlines, you will produce less proficient, uh, uh, less symmetrical artifacts. And as you can see here, here we have the master nappers, the best nappers, and here we have apprentices which have napped a bit, and here we have novices, and you have a clear pattern here that, uh, that, that uh, and, and this is a scale that measures the overall symmetry on all of these dimensions. Uh, and I remember when he received the peer review, uh, one of the peer reviewers wrote that I tried this on my own material <laughs> and it works perfectly because he had napped for, a, or he or she had napped for a long time and uh, could, could, could see that the early, the, the early shapes were, 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 were less symmetrical than the, than the later shapes. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you cannot, you have to start to think about uh, iconic representations in, in uh, stone tools as well. There is a lot of, of, uh, uh, of slate knives uh, like this. This is a club uh, from, uh, from Arlunda outside of Uppsala, uh, 5,000 years old. It's probably a, a battle club or something like that with, uh, with an elk what we perceive as an elk head on the, on the other side. And, and it's tempting to, to, to see the use of icons uh, not only as symbol for something, uh, which we tend to think uh, always, but maybe as uh, guidelines for uh, ways in which artifacts uh, are made and used. Um, so, how, how much time do I have? It's 10 minutes. Well, I, I, uh, an another interesting thing, this is from, this is from uh, a paper that, that uh, me and Kim Darmack wrote in 2009. Uh, and what we looked at here was the introduction of a new technology in different places in, in uh, Russia, the Levant and Scandinavia. And it's the introduction of bifacial pressure technique. Uh, and, and we collected data from the Volga region, uh, the Levant, and, and Scandinavia. And, and pressure technique is just the way that you shape, the, make these little dents in the arrowheads. And one thing that struck us was that when this technology is, is introduced, uh, each of these areas goes through the same development in style. So, these are the early Volga uh, points used, made by that technology, and these are the late ones. And the late ones are more uh, symmetrical, and they are more shaped. You have the same development in the Levant. The technique is introduced, and it ends up with symmetrical and, 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 and much uh, more uh, developed types here. And it's the same in Scandinavia. Uh, so, 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 so uh, there also, uh, and this this cannot be explained by by, by some kind of functional uh, reasoning. Uh, it's it's something else, and it could actually, I think, uh, it could maybe be connected to the need of symmetry. Uh, to 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 keep traditions uh, traditions going. Well, these are flint daggers uh, from, from southern Scandinavia. I'm not sure if I can... Well, I can just mention this. When, when you look at, for instance, uh, one interesting thing with material culture is, of course, that an idea can take shape in different, in, with different techniques and, and, and uh, 
different materials. And here we have, we have, we have obsidian and flint daggers in Europe from different times. And the, the, the main idea with this, with this uh, slide was just to show that the same idea is reproduced with very different chain operatoires and very different raw materials uh, in very different times. Uh, but, but there is some kind of uh, systematic to it. Uh, I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for this very interesting talk. Um, I'm sure we have, uh, we have some time for a couple of questions, and I'm sure we have a couple in the room. Uh, any, yep. uh, thank you. Does this work? Uh, yeah, it works. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, was, I, was wondering, uh, I was wondering about uh, the role of... Uh, effectivity or function in, uh, in sort of stabilizing uh, a shape or a form? Or to what extent uh, you are able to sort of uh, decide that, okay, this is, uh, it, it has stayed stable because it's obviously very effective. And, uh, and to what extent you sort of separate the things that could have changed from the things that are stabilized through their effectivity in a way. Well, well, if they are driven by some kind of function, that, for instance, uh, these arrowheads. I mean, I mean, I, I guess the, the, if these are arrowheads, which we think, that then then the the, the, the part of, of of the tool that you put most effort into is the shaft, the arrowhead shaft. So, so what what you would need from a functional point of view is arrowheads that fit. The shaft, because you change arrowheads when you, when you need to change them. So, so uh, the base would be would be driven by by function, because you you need arrowheads that fit into the to the shaft, because the arrowheads break, but the shaft is remains the same, and it, it takes. So that could be a, a functional thing. I mean, you could also argue, of course, that symmetry enhances. Uh, uh, hunting ability, in, in, in some way, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, so that would be the main argument. I mean, the, the Louis Binford, uh, an archaeologist who worked with hunter-gatherer uh, tool technology, said that that um, uh, style is it appear among functional equivalents. So, so if you have arrowheads that are functionally equivalent, you will have style. But if you have an arrowhead that has better function, then you will, then that will be selected for. But, but I mean, that's not what I. But but you could you could use that argument, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have other questions or comments? Um, yes, Anna. Yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, you said that about 10 to 20 percent of the information was lost on a generational generational scale when transmitting the, the complex technologies, right? Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering how how is this affected by population size? Does a low population size, where you at least theoretically have less people and maybe fewer able students, does this affect this in a way? Uh, Yes, how, how I, I, yeah, yeah, I think so, and it, it has been argued, of course. Uh, and uh, Tas Tasmania has been the one of one of the examples where, where when Tasmania was was uh, lost contact with with Maine, Australia, uh, at the early uh, at the early Holocene, the population was isolated from the networks, and and they apparently lost a lot of technology. O over time, so so when they when they were isolated, they could fish. For instance, they didn't fish when when Europeans discovered them. They had composite tools when they when they were isolated, but they didn't have composite tools when when they were found. They didn't have uh, sewn clothes and, and things like that. So so so, so th th that's one of one of the examples that's been 
taken up. So, 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 so if, if a group is small and, 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 lack, and lack access to, to external contacts, then, then of course com complex technologies would, would tend to be, be uh, maybe disappear. Um, yeah. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jan. This was a very stimulating uh, take on uh, or kind of reintroducing typology <laughs> as a, a valuable category for understanding material culture. Um, I was wondering specifically about, uh, you're talking about the apprenticeship and the, the communities of learning. Uh, and in order to kind of um, to, to lose uh, or to, to get these breaks between generations, uh, what could conceivably happen? Uh, how, how do you see these apprenticeship communities? Uh, when you have big breaks? Yeah. Well, well, of course, you could have population replacements. Uh, that, that, that's, one, that's one thing. But, but I also think that... You, you, it, among individuals, you always have individuals who, who, who go their own way. The, 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 the problem is that tradition is tested. So in a stable environment, tradition is the way to go because it's been tested for generations. So it's very unlikely that you find out something uniquely, uh, something that is unique and that will be better than the, than the things that have been developed over time. But in, in times of, of environmental stress, uh, you, you would expect more variation in, in technological solutions because maybe the crazy people in the, <laughs> in the fringes will actually find out something that is really, it's really, it's really valuable. And of course, the same goes for, for horizontal transmission. So horizontal transmission, I would say, to borrow ideas from, from, from other areas would be risky if the environment is stable because, because of, of, of the fact that tradition is tested and has been tested through time for, for, for generations. But in, 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 uh, in um, situations where the environment changed a lot and, and the old way of doing things uh, uh, are not as effective, then horizontal transmission would, would be able to track change more more effectively, and of course you can see that today with with the computers. I mean, we don't rely on our parents when we learn new computer softwares and so on, because because the environment is changing so fast. So so we need to have horizontal transmission to keep to keep up with technological novelties. While for 300 years ago, if you grew up on a farm, you would be very, uh, you, 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 you would probably be profit from, from accepting the tradition instead of borrowing me methods from, from, from other places. So that, that, but that's just, that's just general, my general take on it. Of course, people do crazy things, so, so people will break these, <laughs> these things, and, 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 but, but, uh, but I would say, in, 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 in a very long term, that, that would be, uh, uh, I think that's the way it, it, it should work. Thank you. Mm. Okay, just one last question. Yeah, uh, when you talk about um, apprenticeship, I was kind of reminded of uh, Love and Wenger's uh, ideas about apprenticeship in, uh, in, in our days, yeah. where they try to find overlapping definitions that might work with traditional ways of learning and the computing age, and that they find it as uh, legitimate peripheral participation. Uh, and, and I find that interesting in relationship to, um, uh, to ask uh, a question about uh, memes, because uh, you, uh, you cited Dan, Dan Sperber to, um, to the effect that, his, uh, that he, uh, he uh, voiced a critique against uh, memetics or meme, memes. Yep. And then memes, uh, uh, has a, uh, uh, the concept has a powerful uh, tendency to resurrect all the time in new garbs. Uh, for instance, in, um, in the Tartu Moscow uh, School of Semiotics, it's, uh, it's, it's still uh, kind of alive and kicking. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering at what level is the meme which is under critique? Uh, what, what I would assume from what you've been telling is that a certain uh, number of junctures where you have to decide how much is enough. 
and uh, that the master has that uh, capability to make that decision, and someone watching him might actually pick it up somehow. At that edge between you know, the, the noosphere and the semiosphere, mm -hmm. there might still be memes uh, in a way. So I'm just wondering, uh, what is the meme which is under critique uh, by Stan Dan Sperber? Uh, well, I, I think that that, I might be wrong here actually, but, but, but I think that that was during the time when, when they tried to establish memetic as a, as a science. You know, and trying to find the places where memes actually, where you could recognize memes uh, as some kind of physical. I don't. I think that was. He, he, I, I agree with you. It's a very, it's a very good way of thinking. I mean, memes. I don't have anything. Um, I, I think that concept is very interesting. Uh, so, so, so. But I think Sparber meant that that. Uh, what, what it's really about is shared mental templates in a way, and, and how you define them from memes is uh, beyond me, actually. I'm, I'm not sure how, how, how to differentiate between them. Okay, I think we have to uh, close the questions there uh, mm -hmm. and move on, but um, can we all please thank Jan again for his very interesting talk? Okay, um, and uh, now I can introduce our, our next speaker, uh, Kaya Kolansurud from our own Museum of Cultural History. Um, Kaya is a senior conservator of paintings and polychrome sculpture um, with research expertise in medieval painting techniques, uh, perceptions of medieval painterly expression and applications to physical polychrome reconstruction. Um, and today she's going to talk about the material materiality and perceptions of medieval church art in a contemporary context. Thank you. Okay, let's see if I can get this the right way. On the church wall in Worcester, England, there's a 12th century inscription that says, look at the pictures that you may clearly see what may be their secrets. The painter's art has dis distinguished in a mass of colors and openly expressed what the letter wore within. So what did they see when they saw? Research on the painterly design in church art from the Catholic period between 1100 and 1350 preserved in Norway concluded that mater the materials used and their application was intentional in order to create specific effects in the painterly design that signal meanings through a visual vocabulary that can be interpreted coherently. The research aimed to uncover the deeper levels of meaning communicated to the medieval beholder by the material object through its physical polychrome presence in its original setting. And this requires entering the cultural context in which these works were produced to gain access to the associate powers of the materials and their visual effects. This also involved drawing from sources of a theological, philosophical, and proto-scientific nature, the Bible, poetic verse, and saga texts. And since God writes with things, as well as with words, this research discusses how image and text complement each other and it thereby treats images as more than illustrations of textual argument, but as keys to unlock meanings. And the result shows clearly how mental images described in words resonate in the polychrome object. Though its visual reading is dependent on the knowledge added to it by the onlooker, Tim Ingold in, uh, addresses the differences betwe between a modern positivist perception and the medieval believer that use this as a means, in his words, of acknowledging our imaginative participation in a more than human world. The cultural philologist Friedrich Uli, as interpreted, interpreted by Aidan Kamler and Christopher Leike, explains how when interpreting scripture in the medieval structure, 
It is the spiritual content within the written word and not the written word itself that is the real carrier of meaning. The historical, in their words then, the historical or literal sense which consists in the sound of the word, the vox, having a thing, the res, at its content, it is therefore inherent in the nature of Holy Scripture that it is precisely this thing in which the literal sense is exhausted, where, which is the real carrier of meaning. The 12th century Scottish Victorine philosopher and theologian Richard of St. Victor formulates the principle of the spiritual sense as the word of God is far superior to worldly wisdom and therefore not only sounds of words but also things carry meaning. Medievalists have been conscious for a long time that an object matters as much for its physical qualities as for its aesthetic appearance. Liz James has pointed out how the question of the relationship between matter, what something is made from, and materiality, the quality of being material, or even of being matter, is particularly relevant for medieval art. And in conservation, which is my field, physical matter and its materiality is what we handle, examine, work with hands-on, and thereby manipulate. We have made reconstructed copies that are based in the theoretical knowledge gained from the scientific analysis performed since the 1960s, coupled with a careful obs visual observation of the original surfaces and with the support of med the medieval Icelandic text the only text known to describe the physical steps of the application of ground and silver gilt glaze to turn it golden, through the, though the third page, which we think contains descriptions of how to make and apply the paints, have not yet been deciphered because of its poor preservation state. <clears throat> The reconstructions have played an important part in the process of approaching and understanding of what the original polychrome looked like when new. They have allowed experiments of how these panels and sculptures could perform in the church inter interior they occupied. And here, I hope it plays. The thing is, task copy is placed in front of the altar in St. Petri Church in Hardland, where the original ones belonged. And this is the way it responds to the light with a perceived glow resulting from the incoming light from the opposite western door being opened and shut. It's the multimedia show. <laughs> Uh, James Elkins defines real materiality as the sense of matter and substance experienced by artists in the slow studio. The laborious and time-consuming day-to-day work of making art. He is critical to the speed with which art historians reach conclusions about the pieces they are studying, as opposed to the slow involvement of the artist in their creation. And simply stated, Materiality of the art is encountered in ways that does not always take into consideration the de detailed, hands-on knowledge of the artist. The research-based reconst reconstructed copies of medieval church art are examples of real materiality reenacted in the slow studio, where the physical object is reconstructed using methods similar to that of the medieval production. The resulting object is a new original that enables further exploration of the visual effects of its composed materiality. The trial and error procedure have both challenged and verified established theoretical theories. In the medieval workshop, the paints were manufactured from their basic ingredients, 
Reenacting these processes has made us aware of the many implications behind the production of materials, the amount of manual labor re required to carry out specific tasks, the empirical adjustment of the ingredients to tailor the handling properties to perform well for their assignment, and indeed, the very high level of knowledge and skill required to gain a good result. The art of making thereby builds up an in-depth hands-on comprehension of the different steps of the crafting process, from the wooden core to the carved plastic form, followed by the application and preparation of the chalk ground, the gilding with metal leaf, the production of the various pigments, and the making of the different colors that has to be individually tailored to make workable paints. This physical knowledge is gained through the handling of tools and materials, through their sourcing, refinement, and individual adjustment. And this is a postmodern painters that buy their materials ready-made. <clears throat> the handling, handling of the materials is a sensory experience that engages the whole body, such as the tactile touch of fingers tearing the gelled surface of the glue to judge if its strength from the way the surface of the cold glue rips when torn, the visual observation of how sieved chalk absorbs into the heated animal glue and at what rate it disappears into the mix that informs the maker when the balance is right between glue and chalk in the ground mix. The level of resistance of the hand running over the chalk ground when sanding it allows the surface <coughs> qualities of the chalk ground to be judged, while any irregularities can be picked up by the fingertips. The action of sanding is accompanied by the rhythmic swooshing sounds as the sanding agent smooths the surfaces. Come on. All this tactile information guides the process and allows a judgment to be made when it's time to stop. For example, the resonance of the burnishing tool tapping a ground provides vital information about the moisture content to what to, so that the gilder can judge when it's dry enough to apply the metal leaf. And the resistance when crushing and grinding a hard mineral such as asteroid or vermilion followed by the swishing sound that followed the circular, cir this circular, circular movement. The quality of this sound and the color indicates to the grinder when the right particle size has been reached. Timing by singing a particular number of paternosters or Ave Marias is described in many of the recipes for refining the crushed asteroid mineral and would guide the rhythmic movements when swirling it to clean it in water. Analysis and reconstructions demonstrate that the binding medium was tailored individually to the specific pigments in order to make paints that create the desired design, as the various pigments behave differently in the medium. The feel of the viscosity of the paint and its handling properties can also be manipulated and modified by adding ingredients and changing their proportions to obtain the desired flow. And the way and speed of which the paint ground or paint runs off the brush and meets the surface provides information on its consistency and workability. And when taking on the challenge of producing paints, without additional solvents. This is crucial in order to make a good color. The real test is the physical application and the trials carried out in order to reconstruct the same phenomena as observed in the original surfaces. In addition to the theoretical knowledge of materials, a person well-versed in these tactile experiences are able, are able to collect information through a close reading of the characteristics that make up the surfaces of the original object. Valuable information can be gathered from the surface texture, 
such as pastel brush strokes or the lack of them. And the way the paint is distributed can inform us of how the paint did or did not flow from the brush. And on this basis, we can make an educated suggestion to the type of binding medium that pr produced such effects. Importantly, such a deep insight makes it easier to understand the changes that have occurred to, to the artifact due to the aging process. And furthermore, suggest an explanation to, the, to what caused difficulties for the painter. For example, here in the Virgin from Dahl, the way the paint has wrinkled indicates that too much oil binder was added as a medium, and this happened already in the drying process or soon thereafter. So, the informed eye of a vital, is of a vital importance for decisions we make when we conserve and restore the original. And as conservators, we have the privilege that we can uh, we are allowed to physically touch the objects, pick them up, turn them around, examine them with the aid of microscopes and various lights, and thereby get to know every detail in its construction and makeup. And most of all, continue to look and piece the information together by spending, ta spending time with the objects, which can stretch over months. And these processes involve invasive treatments which result will impact the source, the historical source document, the, its visual appearance, and the future perception of the object. It is therefore essential that they are performed on an educated basis. And unfortunately, history has shown how damaging badly informed treatments can turn out. <clears throat> This research made it clear from the painterly expression that, that the painterly expression is part of an intentional strategy to evoke in the mind of the beholder the splendor of the divine in the context of visual perception of matter and form in the medieval um, uh, Christian universe and within the pre-Newtonian pre classification systems of color that have light as the main signifier. In the Christian universe, it is a given fact that God created the world. One can therefore learn more about the, his creation by studying his book of nature. Lending Ingalls phrasing, they reconciled scientific inquiry with religious sensibility as ways of knowing in being. And then one exponent for this is the polymath, Bishop of Lincoln, theologian, early scientist, politician and poet, Robert Rossetest, whose optics was found especially relevant to this research. He represents a historically significant developer of many aspects of medieval thinking about perspectiva, the metaphysics of light, and the moral theological allegorization of both light and color. God created the Christian universe with light. Fiat lux, let there be light. Lux begins the universe and gives three-dimensionality to matter. Grossetus postulates that the fundamental coupling of light and matter gives rise to the material body of the entire cosmos, described in a cosmological model in which the universe was created from one point of light that multiplied, drawing matter along with it by subsequent condensations, and in this way creating ten spheres, nine above the moon and one below, divided into the four elements, representing our imperfect Earth. And consequently, matter and its design are direct products, intimately bound up in the properties of light. Lux, the original created light of divine source, is not visible to the human eye. It is lumen 
the outflow an image of the first light that is reflected inwards and participates in matter as refracted and reflected light in material form as ob as ob or as objects in nature, which is a quality that we perceive and th that is communicated in the works of art, where it is mediated through saturated pure color signaled in the rainbow motif and interacting with gilt surfaces and colored glazes. Lumen carries looks at its core. Though the spiritual aspect is hidden to the unlearned man, so at the core of the complex relation between these two qualities, looks and lumen, lies the, rela the re relation between the generator and its images. The metaphysical light is communicated through unadulterated and pure saturated color based on one or two pigments of a similar hue in clearly outlined areas with a planned surface texture. In the medieval work, pure saturated color work together with a variety of gildings. And when gildings are combined with translucent coatings, a range of radiant, shiny, and colored effects were, was obtained. The imitation gold that you saw glowing in the Tingelstad frontal is, uh, made, uh, uh, is, is a white metal gilding polished to a mirror-like finish and coated with an organic translucent yellow layer that turns it golden. Becomes, and this technique becomes extremely popular in the 13th century. The technique embraces the radiant and shiny effects gained when light travels through a transparent medium applied to a reflecting layer. And you see it, this is also what you see in the reconstructed copy of the Heerdalm Virgin. Um, in the material hierarchy of the med medieval cosmos, the purified material is more elevated than its impure forms. Grossetest argues in his posterior analytics how beautiful objects that are receptive to the divine light are made visible to a higher spiritual reading by the interior mind's eye, where judgments of beauty are made according to the principles of light in its harmony and distribution, such as it appears in symmetry, light, pure color, and the brilliance of shining materials. And with her glowing effects, the reconstructed virgin from Herdalen appears as a figure of light. Beard describes in his commentary on the ap 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 apocalypse how holy people shine brightly when struck by the sun's rays because their minds are always focused on heavenly things. It is these people's elevated understanding uh, and insight that work to illuminate them. And this insight, he explains, is renewed daily by the rays of heavenly light. God's own presence is thus made real and available for the believer when metaphysical light reflects in gilded surfaces and is mediated to believers through the polychrome in image. Grossetest explains in his Hexaemeron that in an allegorical sense, the light of the wise and spiritual prelates of the church who shine with the knowledge of truth with love and with the outward shining of good works, the darkness is their, su uh, their subjects who are wrapped in, in, in the darkness of ignorance and are animal and carnal. Also, light comes to be when the fleshy sense of scripture breaks through in the spiritual sense. It is as if light then shines out in the darkness when the historical uh, and fleshy sense of scripture becomes bright by moving into a spiritual understanding. And the more similar the object is to the first light, the more receptive it is to it, and the more it can be comprehended by the mind and lead to greater clarity and certitude in thinking. Analogies of light and brightness acted as a bridge between the terrestrial world and the celestial, and reference to light in its diverse forms 
is frequent in theological texts and was handed down in allegory directed towards a more vernacular audience. These works do no longer speak for themselves, for the modern viewer that lack the cultural key to unlock meanings associated with them. In the darkened imitation gold, the divine source is no longer present as metaphysical light. And though the visible radiant light lumen no longer elevates the object with its active play on the surfaces, nor are the colors preserved in their original splendor. And a central tool in the mediation is thereby lost. And this is where the reconstructed copies can help to regain an understanding of how these works of art were once meant to be, to, to be and perform in their original space. Thank you very much, Kaya, for this very interesting talk. Um, we have some time for questions before lunch. Um, are there any questions from the room to start with? Is that, yes, yes? I have a lot of I don't know quite where, where to start, but, but, but just the thing I wanted to, the first question was going right back to the beginning of your talk, when you were talking about about letters, and I was just struck by the fact that uh, the pictures you showed, um, the scenes were always bordered by a kind of trefoil pattern in the architecture, a, a tracery, like a window tracery. or mm. and, and then you were talking about how the picture is actually inside the letter, mm. and I wondered whether letters on medieval manuscripts, those very beautiful mm. big letters that mm. start with, with, with pictures inside, whether they thought of the letter as something that would frame a picture, whether the letter was then analogous to the tracery of a window frame, which would have, like a stained glass window frame, which would have the picture inside. Mm. Did people draw that sort of analogy ever? Um. I haven't worked that much with the frames, but I have worked with the rainbow motif, and I have there's a kind of dual shading that's like this this motif here that is shaded towards uh, it's a white middle and then graded with red or blue towards the middle, and that that's actually um, the way uh, the, the Aristotelian rainbow. So it's a, it's also light, you know, on her throne. Uh, and microarchitecture is very often in this dual shading. So m microarchitecture framing the scenes in a frontal or in a... She would be in a big cupboard with winged doors with scenes of Mary's life in microarchitecture with this rainbow motif. And um, there's a manuscript in the Getty where John is standing firmly on in the real world, and he's, he's looking at a, um, a holy scene, and the frame of the scene is like a picture on the wall with the rainbow frame, and he's looking through a little window, a black opening just like that, in the frame of the rainbow frame. So I think the framing of you know, uh, the, this, this uh, mediation between here and the upper square is uh, also then sort of, um, it's, it's also just a light frame, you know, it's a sort of transitional uh, frame, not a solid one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, I've seen you in action before, uh, and I absolutely love your work. It's, it's so Thank you. Into, because I'm saying in action because you're working while you're here, and you're so much imbued with all that experience. That you, and so it's paradigmatic in the sense of an example of everything. 
just about everything we, we've been talking about. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking when Tim, mm. Tim talked that, you know, we, it's all the four A's and more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so, uh, it, you know, this, um, you know, how, how one accesses critical detail of the action, in a way, when making choices linked to observation and readability it, it are at stake. Yeah. You know, this way of working is so fantastic to get a demonstration of that. And um, I have a, a, a question with regard to Robert uh, Russell Test. Um, and um, I'm wondering, uh, uh, since you are a specialist in, uh, in medieval uh, archaeology, uh, I'm wondering uh, if uh, he is uh, testifying to a worldview where uh, uh, bodies and agents were not uh, seamlessly tied together, that they, they were kind of not... Uh, we, you couldn't assume that bodies and agents were the same uh, in some sense. Uh, uh, the reason why I'm asking that is that he's, uh, there's a passage where he, he, um, he says, um, for light in, uh, of its very nature diffuses itself in every direction in such a way that the point of light will produce instantaneously a sphere of light of any size whatsoever unless some opaque object stands in its way. Yeah. So that's one thing. And then it says corporeity, therefore, is either light itself or the agent which performs the aforementioned operation and introduces dimension into matter in virtue of its participation in light and acts, though, uh, acts through the power of this same light. But the first form cannot introduce dimensions into matter through the power of a subsequent form. Therefore, light is not a form success, is subsequent to corporeity, but is corporeity itself. You know, yeah, so. yeah he, uh, he actually, his, his idea is that uh, matter doesn't exist without light. So light is matter. It's light that develops matter in front of our eyes. So without light, there is no... Light is at the core of bringing matter into being. He also has a beautiful description of uh, how, uh, like when you see the rays of light coming through the stained glass window, that it's how the, the sun, uh, the ray of the sun carries the, uh, the color of the window and is still incorporeal like the angels. So it's light yeah, light is light is matter. It's created by light, and it's also what exists as forms, as I have understood it. Yeah. I haven't worked with the sort of agency. I have this, I think, um, as we also discussed with Marion in the, in the break, that uh, people that made these, um, I mean, all the materials had agency for them. But the, in order to, uh, I have problems with the object having agency because it is in the mind of the beholder that you know, that we put the agency into them. Either we are making them or we are looking at them. We are the, it's in the mind's eye where we give them agency. But uh, this is not a uh, term I have worked with. <laughs> okay, um, we, we can just take one more question very briefly and then we uh, probably have to move on to lunch. <laughs> Now the second one. I, I, I wanted to ask about fire um, because I, I've been reading about about rays of light and beams of light, and and evidently the, the notion of the beam of light was used by the venerable Bede to refer to the fire that rises up from the body of a saint, and and it rises up in the same way as the trunk of a tree, and that's why the tree also came to be called a beam. So, and, and then I've seen actually from a picture from one of the Norwegian stave churches, a picture of the sun, in which the sun is, is this red, yellow, ball, but, but out of the edge are coming not straight line beams, but, but flakes. So, the question is, and sometimes you get images of the sun where there's a mixture of flames and, and straight line, sort of like, like uh, point, pointy symbols. And, and fire destroys, consumes matter. So, I don't know, did Grosseteste have anything to say about the light of the fire? And it seems like many people thought a lot about that. 
Yeah, because you know when the holy appears, it's not only the extensive brightness of light; it's also energy. And um, um, Grosse Teste has this uh, uh, poem, "The Castle of Love," where the Virgin is sat in her castle, like the Virgin from Dal, uh, that had doors. It had a maybe a church model on top, and you can see the crenellated top of the canopy. Um, and he describes this castle, the beauty of it, the, how well-crafted it is, polished every surface so the evil can't get hold. And the most, the topmost color, the most beautiful color is the red color. And because Mary has uh, the properties of the sun, in this tabernacle is one of the few we have with the remaining uh, canopy. You can see a little bit of it. She sat under the swirling sun. We, she sat, where do I push on the side? Now, under the canopy roof, the ceiling, there's a swirling yellow sun. And uh, uh, I don't have a picture of it here. But he describes her red color as the topmost color. It is like she is a flame. And that is the sort of energy to this red. That so, uh, because we don't have any blue Madonnas, we have either golden or we have the red ones. So she's actually, it's, it's the energy of this holiness, the brightness and the flame. You know, she has... She, she ha because she has the properties of the sun, she can thaw the cold sinner, so he melts in front of her. Does that mean that the flame is red? Is the flame but red the, red? The f you know, if fire and okay. red. Yeah, red. So, um, well, so at least in this context. So red means fire. Depending, I guess that will depend on the context, but here, you know, it, it, he ties it to her being a flame. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, and I think we will, um, we will draw the session to a close there and, and head to... In Archaeology, Heritage Museum of Cultural History, and her research focuses on Viking Age and on the medieval period, and she's been working with textiles and clothing, as well as medieval food culture amongst other things. So in the presentation, Stories Between Art and Archaeology, she will present the research on unique tapestries from the Usberg uh, grave dated to the Viking Age. And by interdisciplinary cooperation between archaeology, art, history, and chemistry, she gives new insight into the Viking Age worldviews. So, Mayana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my approach is a little bit different from the other um, talks we've heard today. Um, it's more an example of what I uh, experienced as a creative interaction in a way. Um, in uh, 2018, we started to make a small film about some of the objects found in the Viking ship burial at Ulsebad. And this was co cooperation between the Museum of Cultural History and Storm Films. Uh, the cooperation between filmmakers, photographer and archaeologists turned out to be a mind opener uh, for me as an archaeologist and also the starting point of a new book. Uh, these tapestries are in themselves storytellers and this form of narratives has a long tradition in Europe. The tapestries from Oseberg dates back to the late 8th and early 9th century AD and uh, are several hundred years older than the more famous uh, cousin, uh, the tapestry from Bayeux. Unfortunately, they are in a uh, state of condition that makes them very hard to interpret. A reconstruction of the stories told on the tapestries is only possible, um, is only uh, uh, possible through looking at a number of different sources. Uh, so, um, just to <coughs> remind you, the Ulsebar ship and its remarkable content was excavated in 1904. Uh, and among uh, all the objects found in this grave, sledges, 
horses, woodworks, etc., etc. Uh, there were also uh, hundreds of textile fragments found inside the grave chamber. Remnants of clothing, sail or tent, bed sheets and interior textiles. Um, and among these were more than 80 fragments of now wall hangings decorated with figural motifs. <clears throat> the tapestries are quite narrow. The original wall hangings uh, were only between 16 and 23 centimeters high, but probably quite long. The figurative scenes depicted on the tapestries are small, and it is necessary to get quite close to, the, uh, to them to uh, be able to understand the narratives. Each of the figures are between four and five centimeters high. Sophie Kraft, looking towards uh, the camera on the largest photo, was employed as an illustrator at the museum in 1907. And her work was to be continued by Mary Storm from 1936. There's Mary Storm there to the right. Uh, and their documentation of the tapestries are still invaluable. But it's been a long time since Sophie Kraft and Mary Storm worked on the tapestries. And new methods have been launched. But at the same time, the ta textiles themselves have become increasingly degraded. So where should we start the process of reinterpreting them? Uh, Piru Birgestam once said that the ideas are often created by switching between different positions. An aesthetic, intuitive position, he suggested, and a rational, analytical one. And the problem with the intuitive position is, uh, of course, that it's based on unconscious knowledge. And Birgestam suggested that a rational, analytical position could be used um, to structure this knowledge, and by switching between these positions, actors could be able to transform tacit cultural knowledge to new material form. One of the things we started out with was going through the old drawings and compare them to the original tapestry fragments, trying to see how accurate the old drawings actually were. Many of the originals have deteriorated even more since the first documentation of Sophie Kraft and, and Mary Storm. And it was of utmost importance to have a good photographer making new documentation. And fortunately, here at the museum, we have uh, quite a few of those. Uh, and here is uh, Ellen Holta to the right. And she is uh, very used to working with archaeological material. So it, uh, it was very uh, good to have uh, her on board in this project. And um, uh, this is a drawing of one of the fragments uh, that May Mary Storm made in 1938. To the right we see Ellen's new photo of the same fragment. And you see it's very, very deteriorated. But um, uh, this is a really tricky motive to catch because of the fragment's bad condition. But here we can see traces of red and blue colors in the original. And uh, she was also able to uh, make the figures stand out in a way. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure uh, how good you see, can see it in this light, but, but still. Um, interpreting the figures involves looking closely at the fragments and trying to follow their lines and how they were made. To understand the technology is essential here, but in this case a visual eye of a person making modern cartoon films was also of great value. Uh, so we asked Stig Saksegård, uh, who works with film animations, Stig and I have been studying uh, the original tapestry for many <coughs> hours, following, following the lines and shapes of the fragments. And 
Afterwards, I compared them to the old drawings and to Ellen's new photos. And with the eye of the cartoonist, Stieg could see the dramaturgical composition of the scene in a different way than I could, without drawing on earlier interpretations or archaeological mindsets. So we had fruitful discussions about what we saw. And Stieg always had access to my manuscript while I was writing, and uh, he was, on the other hand, sending me his drawings uh, to be discussed along the way. Uh, but on the other hand, I had to persuade him not to include fantasy characters in the areas that were completely destroyed. Um, so he, instead he made small white dots around. <laughs> Uh, so this is the new interpretation of a hanged man's tree that you saw earlier. Uh, possibly the ash tree Yggdrasil at the center of the world. A giant tree hurls its stylistically intervened branches across the patterned surfaces. Hung men are dangling from the branches with their arms hanging down and their feet dangling over the ground. So you see uh, eight, at least eight of these men uh, hanging here. And in the Edda poem Hovamol, Odin is sacrificing himself to himself to gain knowledge. And he hangs in the tree Yggdrasil for nine nights. The interpretation of the tree, tree Yggdrasil on this fragment is not new, but uh, together, Stig and I saw some interesting new features in the picture. For example, uh, the monster to the left down there. Who is he? We don't know yet. And we talked about flames earlier today. We discovered a flame here uh, licking the feet of, of the horse uh, by closely following the lines in, in the original fragment. And uh, more important, we were discussing how the composition of this scene differs from other fragments. The narrative is centered with the thickest branches of the three and the hung men as a focal point uh, in the middle of the picture. And this was one of the things that made me think that these fragments are actually not remnants of one, but several different artworks. Uh, and new, uh, not yet published carbon datings confirm this assumption. Uh, there are different ways of seeing form and function. Uh, this little figure here uh, is interpreted as a man in the shape of a bear. And the basharker, as they are portrayed in the sagas and poetry, are warriors with a mythical and ritual relationship with Odin. The bear is a strong and dangerous animal, and it seems like the perfect choice if you are a shapeshifter about to go into battle. To understand how an object works and how to make it, you have to have a mental model of the relationship between form and function. And this model is first and foremost culturally based. And we ca carry with us mental conceptual models of how objects work based on the knowledge that each one of us have. And these can be real or imaginary. If this is right, it also means that we are in a, in, when we are in a group, we can also make ourselves a common understanding of the relationship between the function of it, uh, an object or and of its form. And to understand other people's objects, it's therefore essential to understand the conceptual model behind the production, but also the production itself. Uh, there are at least two ways to interpret these tap tapestries, as storytellers and as active instruments of creating history. Kaya talked about objects and carriers of meaning. Uh, and here is a complete scene in which the bear man takes part. He's there in the middle. 
um, it's possible to see this as an illustration of a concrete battle, or perhaps a mythical one. Björn Haugen has interpreted the scene as an illustration of the Battle of Bråvala, the largest battle in, Nor uh, in Nordic epic poetry. However, it could be argued that there are few clues to link these scenes presented in the tapestries to this particular tale. But this scene shows a glimpse of tactics and warfare as it could be conducted in a battle where most warriors were fighting on foot. And there are several medieval descriptions of how such a formation could look. The book King's Mirror describes a wedge-formed formation to be used when the battle is to about to begin. Possibly that's what we see here. So this tapestry could be depicted, uh, could be a depiction of a battle, real or mythical, with information about tactics used in early medieval warfare and of Viking ways of seeing, for example, female warriors up here to the left, shapeshifters, and the use of weapons. Seen this way, the weaver is the keeper of a common truth. Several of the uh, old Edda poems support this suggestion. They also suggest that these pictures had a specific purpose, namely to secure that important collective narratives were preserved. But the tapestries could also be seen as something else. According to the sagas, the tapestry weavers could also be actively taking part in ongoing events, using their skills to interfere with destiny. In the old saga, there is an older poem telling a tale about a magical loom which influenced the outcome of war and sealed the warrior's fate. The poem describes 12 Valkyries who uh, secretly construct a loom out of space. The warp is made of human intestines and the warp thread weights are made out of human heads. They use swords to fasten the weft <laughs> and arrows to weave the fabric. And through the tapestry, they craft fate of the warriors and the outcome of the battle are sealed. War and violence are not passively rendered in the images of the Valkyries tapestry. By weaving in depictions of the battle, the weaver takes an active part in the battle, having the final say in who will stand victorious and who will lose. Seen in this way, the tapestries are not only reflecting the way the makers interpreted history, but they are tools used to make things happen. They are not only storytellers, but active instruments in creating history. The weave can thus uh, be seen as an interactive media, in a way, a weapon and a work in progress, both in the loom and on the battlefield at the same time. The shape of weave beaters from this period, made in the form of swords, as we see them to an example here to the, to the left, may also point to the loom as a potential magical weapon. Let's take a look at a tapestry fragment to the right here uh, that might be interpreted as referring to existence of magic. Here we see um, exercise of magic, so, sorry. Here we see a woman standing on a kind of platform uh, on the back of a red horse. You said, see the rump of the horse here. And, um, um, she's, uh, uh, the, the, the platform is clearly marked and discernible on the original fragment. A woman is standing on top of the platform, holding her arms up to her breasts and raising her head up towards the sky. At her left side stands an enormous figure with a long skirt, and her head is shaped almost like a bird's head, or perhaps it presents a horned headgear. It's a, it's a little bit easier to see on the drawing to, uh, in the middle there. 
A suggested interpretation of the strange platform could be that this is illustrating a sorcery seat or a sidealer. The sidealer is described in the later Fritti of Saga as a kind of platform which was located in a high place serving as a place of communing with the gods. This would make uh, sense both of the woman standing on the platform and of the oversized figure she is confronting. In Fritti of Saga, the exercise of side on the platform is used as a mag magical weapon in war. If in some cases these tapestries are remnants of things seen as history in the making, the techniques used to weave them are also of great importance. Is it possible to make these tapestries without planning the motives in detail before starting? This is uh, essential when we ask that question. The tapestries from Osebeir are made in a combination of weavi a weaving technique called free tapestry weave and something called sumak. And using this method, the weaver does not predefine a pattern, but on the contrary, the lines and style used to create, for example, the animal shapes, uh, can technically be um, formed as you go. The technique thus allows for freely composing the figures and shapes in the tapestry with endless pattern variations. And this combination gives the weaver a freedom of creation as the weaver weaving goes on, and at the same time an opportunity to highlight details. There is a long tradition in textile archaeology for cl a close relationship between archaeologists and textile craftsmen. And here's an example showing hand handweaver Lena Hammarlund experimenting uh, with her warp uh, and her warp weighted loom during the reconstruction of the Lendrian tunic from the fourth century. And this type of collaboration often concentrate on the weaving method itself, not taking into account the whole context. Uh, methods, the shape and materiality, not only of the product, but also of the tools used to produce it, as well as the context of the find, is of great importance if we're trying to remake the past. In a way. Uh, so, uh, and the work goes on. Uh, this uh, work on the tapestries um, and the film and the book uh, is now finished, but uh, the next step is to try to find out more about colors and about the puzzle, what parts of the uh, tapestries are um, fit together. Uh, and uh, the colors that were once so bright, uh, they are now barely uh, visible at all. So we have not been able to analyze them properly. Our next step will be to uh, do chemical analysis of dry stuffs and to use uh, computer-aided assembling to piece together the pieces of the puzzle. So hopefully we will be able to uh, reveal more of the tapestry's secrets in, future, in the future. So this is, was a small uh, example uh, of today's subject from uh, Museum of Cultural History's uh, archaeology department. So thank you.
It works? Yeah, it works well. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. It was uh, very fascinating. And uh, I was wondering, I mean, these tapestries were found, th 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 these were found in a, bur in a burial site in the Ulsberg, is that? that yes. It's the Ulsberg yes. uh, tapestry. So, so I wonder, any ideas about a possible relationship between the one buried and the tapestries, or the sort of they, they uh, glorify or uh, whatever, like uh, skull, the quads are related to, uh, to people of importance and things like that. Are there any ideas about that? That's an interesting question because uh, one of the uh, um, possible functions of these tapestries or tapestries in general in, in uh, early medieval uh, context uh, were that they were telling, you know, uh, um, uh, collective uh, memories or collective stories to uh, either um, display or confirm uh, the, their leaders or their uh, concept of the world. Uh, so uh, it has been suggested that these tapestries were made to tell a story about the funeral to come. But uh, actually, I don't think that's the case because as I, I, I said in my presentation, we're taking out some new, new carbon datings that show that these are at least three different artworks and um, the, 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 the oldest one is uh, maybe 150 years older than the, the youngest one and uh, that's the one that is telling a, a story of a procession. So. Uh, so uh, we can't relate them directly to the women buried in Osobar, I think. Anyone else have a question? Oh, yes. Thank you for a Yes, for a drug. <laughs> And um, I was uh, read your book. It's very interesting, and I find it's uh, with the, the you looked both at the texts and these things. But uh, I look at the horses, and I found that they are quite much bigger than the, uh, what we think about the Norse yeah. horses and the Icelandic horses. And have a, do you know if anybody has been looking at them, done something? Are these uh, Norse horses, or are they? Are Oh, the, are the, these tapestries produced here? Can, it, can they be from southern part of Europe? Mm. Uh, that's an interesting question because I've been looking at the horses and you're quite right. The horses are overdimensional in, in the tapestries. Of course, that could be a way, uh, this is often a way to present something that is... Um, uh, very special or highly valued. But it could also be that these, these are an, uh, another type of horses. Because as you said, horses in uh, early medieval uh, uh, Scandinavia was very small. Uh, um, probably around 30, uh, 30, 40 centimeters in shoulder height. And these horses here are double the size of a man, so it's a very, they are very, very huge. Uh, so it, c it could be either that these horses are very important in the narrative, or it could be that these are horses uh, imported from, uh, from uh, southern Europe, maybe uh, different types of horses, I don't know. But they have, um, many of them have uh, special features like uh, a knot on the tail, um, a special way to walk, things like that. Thank you. It's interesting to follow this up and it should be more research, I think. When do they start importing the bigger horses from Germany and these places which we know are used for military service and these things?
Thank you, Mariana. Uh, as always, very interesting to see this, what you got out of these tapestries, and especially after you started to work with the Storm Studios and the cartoon maker. So <laughs> that's really new kind of dis disciplinarity. <laughs> Inter. Um, I, I think your case is a very good one for showing uh, how uh, myth a narrative uh, is incorporated in material culture. Uh, and we are, you are in the lucky position to, to have the, the Skaldic poems uh, to compare with also, to, to get a grip on uh, the role of the, the, or the potential role of the weaver uh, in, in kind of creating history as you, you put it. Uh, my question, you, you said that with this particular kind of weave, you don't have to kind of plan uh, the layout of the tapestry ahead. Mm. So would you say that these uh, scenes could be kind of emerging during his or her work? Because that seems just incredible to me mm. since they're so well planned and you need to, if you, when you start on one line you have to know how many you know, <laughs> figures to put, to start with. Mm. I, I would say there had to be a, a plan. Well, maybe, maybe not. In theory, it's possible to make these without uh, a plan for the whole uh, narrative. And actually, we see that some of the figures are kind of squeezed into the scenes uh, in a way that you probably wouldn't do if you have planned the whole scene in advance. Uh, and I, I think this is also about uh, skills uh, because these are made, uh, they, they are very, very uh, fine uh, crafts. And um, uh, I think that uh, the weavers have been very, very uh, skilled. But uh, if you use free tapestry weave. You are not, um, you don't have to plan uh, the whole pattern in advance. And that's, uh, uh, that is different from other types of, um, uh, of uh, weaving technologies. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about uh, uh, tapestries as uh, agents uh, kind of interfering with the course of history as ongoing, ongoing events and so forth, and mm. if size uh, necessarily reflects uh, perceived size or its kind of magical size, like the proportions of Ron Villerslev, for, former director of this establishment, in his ethnography, excuse me, his anthropology about uh, with um, with uh, the Yukagir, the um, the shamans of, of uh, uh, shamanic hunters from Siberia, yep. uh, their uh, vision quests would be kind of regular in the sense that most hunters were all, were also shamans, so it wasn't like specialized in, in the way shamanic practices normally are. It's more like in the cultural weft and uh, woof, and, yep. as it were. So, but according to him, there uh, in the in the in this vision world, things would be big if they are far away and they would be uh, small when they come close up. So it's like the exact uh, opposite, opposite of what happens uh, otherwise. Mm. Uh, I was just wondering if this kind of negotiation of, of size is something that had, it could possibly enter into the idea of what kind of empowerment is sought for the, the, uh, the textile fabric uh, in the sense that if, uh, uh, let's say, uh, that uh, size is a uh, kind of negoci uh, negotiable yeah. in the sense of uh, what kind of action it should p perform or how it is uh, thought to act uh, in reality, so forth, that uh, interfacing, as it were, between a more, uh, let's say, shamanic way of looking at things yeah. and uh, uh, empirical observation of sizes of objects. Mm. That's very interesting. Yeah. Really very interesting. I don't think that is the case for the horses because they are old uh, they are all uh, approximately the, sa the same size in all these uh, uh, narratives but, but uh, 
it's a very, very interesting way to, to look at the narratives because uh, maybe it could be more um, uh, ac uh, it, it, it could be interesting to, s to look at some of the other figures to see if that sort of approach is, uh, is something uh, absolutely. Um, mm. Talk about this book, which uh, presents a narrative about 100,000 years of human history. This was a work that summed up half a century of research on human genetic diversity based on so-called classical genetic markers. And it was published at the dawn of the technological revolution in DNA sequencing, and it became an important point of reference for future genome research, such as the Human uh, uh, Genome Diversity Project and the Genographic Project. And uh, Carolis Forsas IDs, the main author, also reached the public through public scientific accounts uh, that can be seen as precursors for the combination of popularized science and marketing strategies that characterizes today another in front of the direct-to-customer DNA testing industry. So this is a very influential book, and uh, Carlos Foisa is often referred to as a giant in population genetics and as the founder of a new and important research field. So the book presents a theory about the co-evolution of languages and genetically distinct populations, which was based uh, or more general ideas about how genetic differentiation within humankind have co-evolved with the rise of cultural, religious, and ethnic differences. Yeah? Oh yeah. Okay, is it better now? Okay, okay. So uh, should I start from the beginning or? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah. So these ideas became an important point of reference for the, say, a post-genomic revolution boom in human population history research and the revival of migration theories in prehistory. Uh, the book also includes uh, theory about the prehistoric origin of the Sami people, which uh, will be the focal point of my presentation. <coughs> and I will compare it with a view on Sami prehistory that is presented in this book, Samnis Historia from till 1750. This, I think, is a Norwegian uh, reference work, which presents what was the dominating view among Norwegian archaeologists who have been studying Sami prehistory since the 1980s. This book. Um, <clears throat> and the view uh, uh, the, about the, say, the roots of the Sami uh, is very different in the two books. The Norwegian archaeologists saw the ethnic groups in northern Fennel Scandia as the product of social processes that took place in. Uh, in Scandinavia about uh, some 2,000 years ago. The geneticists, Kavali et, uh, and his uh, co-authors, proposed a migration theory. The Sami had assumedly their roots in the population of hunter-gatherers who, during the Stone Age, had followed their prey, the reindeer, westwards into Europe, where they had finally settled in Scandinavia and became partly intermixed with uh, their Scandinavian neighbors. 
And this theory was largely identical with theories that had been fashionable in the interwar years, such as the one put forward by Christian Skreiner in this massive monography, uh, which was based on the measurement of uh, ancient skulls. So, <coughs> how could the contemporary geneticists and archaeologists end up with such different conclusions? Was it because the genetic evidence pointed at, in a different direction than the archaeological findings, or was it due to differences in their theoretical and conceptual preconceptions? And why did the geneticists who compare gene frequencies in contemporary populations end up with conclusions that resembles the conclusions that pre-war racial anthropologists had reached through their measurement of uh, skulls from Sami graves. <coughs> the main <coughs> argument of uh, uh, Cavalli, uh, Menossa and Piazza was uh, well, was that of a parallel evolution of human languages and of genetically uh, distinct human populations. And a similar idea characterized physical anthropology when it arose as a discipline in the mid 19th century. Biological races, as defined by skull shape, skin color, and so on, overlaps with linguistically defined peoples. That's why these assumed races were originally given names such as Slavic, Germanic, or Lap. When scientists later acknowledged the lack of any simple concurrence between language differences and differences in assumed race-specific traits, these designations were transformed into linguistically neutral terms such as Nordic, East Baltics, or Alpine, or Lapoid. And until well into the 20th century, however, much physical anthropological research was still based on the assumption that, for example, all Germanic peoples, such as Norwegians and Swedes, even if they are racially mixed, today have their roots in a primordial, pure Nordic or Germanic race. And in a similar way, the racially mixed Sami had supposedly originated from an ancient pure lap race with Asiatic roots, which was seen as a subcategory of the so-called Asiatic or Mongolid race. This was Skreiner's way of thinking. Uh, Post-war academic criticism of pre-war Scientific racism typically dismissed the notion of primordial pure races, which, besides uh, being a scientific idea, also happened to be the driving force behind the Nazi uh, attempt at racially purifying the German people, as well as many other racial ideologies of the time. The main counter-argument was that humans have always moved around and mixed, and that there are no empirical foundation for believing that people were less mixed in the past than they are in the present. Cavalis Foydisa, who started his career in this period in the 1950s, is well known for his anti-racist arguments. And in the introductory chapter of this uh, book I'm talking about, the race concept is dismissed as uh, both a uh, scientifically misleading concept, but also as a dangerous, uh, socially dangerous concept. I will still argue that traditional notions of race and even ideas that look conspicuously similar to a notion of mm, original racial purity is built into this, uh, pro was built into this project. So, this is a book about human evolution based on population genetics. In line with the modern synthesis, Cavalli Sforza defined evolution as the change of gene frequencies or gene po pools in populations. Such change can be driven by migration and exchange of genes between populations, by natural selection, that is the survival of the fittest, 
and by genetic drift. That is the accumulative effect of random fluctuations in the frequency of genes between generations. The idea was that the analy analysis of populations living today in different places gives us a cross-section in time of this continuing process and can provide us with insight into how these processes have unfolded in the past. Uh, the study uh, included more than 76,000 gene frequencies related to almost uh, 2,000 different population names, and this huge amount of data was made manageable by merging these populations in a stepwise manner into first 491, and finally into 42 aggregated populations. But this process was not based on an assessment of genetic similarities and differences between the sampled populations. It was based on geographical, physical, anthropological, linguistic, and, uh, uh, and uh, ethno so-called ethnographic criteria. So what was the theoretical foundation for using non-genetic criteria for defining genetic populations? In the introduction, the author uh, explicitly dismissed the biological concept of race. They were also critical to the uh, physical anthropological criteria upon which traditional race categories are based. Skin color, eye shape, facial features, and so on are affected by selection and adaptation to varying environments, and they may thus be misleading in the attempt at reconstructing the phylogeny and prehistoric migrations of human populations. But in spite of this, physical anthropological attributes were second to geog geography, a key criterion for classifying populations. Uh, and as far as I can judge, this must have meant that traditional racial markers were the, used as a criterion for the basic ordering of the genetic data. And this may be one of the reasons why the deepest and assumedly oldest split in the tree they constructed, uh, to a large extent, um, resembles traditional race categories. Uh, and actually, in spite of uh, dismissing the term race, the authors systematically used traditional racial terms such as Caucasoids and Mongoloids to categorize populations. So, in short, this project looks quite similar to what Cavallis Forza himself had uh, categorized as racial taxonomy in this influential textbook uh, from uh, the 1970s. And here, as far as I have managed to understand, these racial categories were taken as a given. So they are not the product of uh, the, a comparison of the gene frequency data, they are the starting point for uh, comparing the gene frequencies. The use of geography was furthermore based on the assumption that geographically located populations are relatively isolated and that long distance population, uh, migration was infrequent before the rise of intercontinental sea travel. So the project therefore aimed to reconstruct the global distribution of genes prior to the 15th century and omitted therefore more recent immigrant and so-called mixed populations. And this was also the reason for a specific focus on indigenous peoples such as the Sami. They were assumed to be particularly isolated and old populations and would thus function as a peephole into human genetic variation in the distant past. So also in this sense, you could argue that the study was based on some idea about original purity. Uh, linguistic and cultural differences was another key principle for delineating populations. The argument was that cultural differences generally overlapped with human populations and gene pools 
since, uh, as Cavalli Soiza argued, the constitution of a genetic pool is determined by geographical factors, socio-economic distance, and a variety of cultural factors, religious, linguistics, etc., all of which operate on cultural pools and affect them in a parallel way. So our main aim of the book was to construct maps that show the global distribution of gene frequencies before 1492 and to construct this tree that indicate relationships between geographically distributed populations. So this tree is a matrix that shows the so-called genetic distance, the degree of... Oh, wait a minute. The degree of uh, genetic similarity between populations. Using average linkage, a statistical method, the researchers had identified the population pairs with a closest match. They turned these into the first split in the tree. The two populations were then pooled, and the pooled populations compared to find the best match, and this process was repeated until there were only two populations left. So the tree is actually nothing but a statistic uh, a description of genetic uh, similarities and differences between a set of geographically... Uh, uh, wait a minute, there's something wrong with my... Okay, so here we are. So this tree is nothing but a statistical description of genetic similarities and differences between a set of geographically, uh, culturally, and linguistically defined populations. The tree is, however, interpreted as a depiction of human population history, where these nodes are seen as actual historical events, a series of population splits that has given rise to an increasing number of populations that through the last 100,000 years has spread and conquered the, uh, the, the, the planet. Uh, and the, uh, the theory was tested and this, uh, this, um, this uh, say this, this um, scale of genetic distance was kind of interpreted as a as a timeline, uh, and this was based on uh, on uh, comparison with archaeological uh, knowledge about prehistoric events and the presupposition about uh, 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 that all these branches were uh, evolving at the same speed. So in this way, you can say that the purely descriptive taxonomy was transformed into a depiction of phylogeny. The problem is, however, that the true depiction of human, uh, the phylogeny of human populations should, not, should uh, not look like a bifurcating tree. It should look more like this, like a branching river on a flat surface. If you were to take into consideration the fact that populations may both split up and also become intermixed with each other. The authors were, of course, aware of this problem, but since they didn't have the statistical tools to construct a branching river, they constructed a, a tree instead. Thus implying that prior to Columbus, no human population has ever mixed. Again, this depiction of uh, human history looks conspicuously similar to the old idea of uh, originally pure races. So, my argument uh, is that there are kind of this idea about, uh, or this racial ideas are somehow uh, <laughs> implicated in this uh, project, but that doesn't imply that I um, claim that Cavalli or his uh, co-workers you know, were scientific racists or anything like that. To the contrary, uh, uh, as I said in the introductory chapter, the race concept is uh, is uh, criticized, and this is also 
criticized, say, on normative grounds. And so, uh, uh, Cavalli has a long, uh, had a long uh, story of uh, anti-racism. Anti uh, when the American psychologist Arthur Jensen in the late 1960s published an article where he argued that the average African-American school child were genetically less intelligent, this uh, was the start of a bitter and polarized controversy in the uh, USA. And uh, in this debate, Cavallis Forza joined Jensen's critics. He condemned the idea that cultural, social, or economic differences between races are caused by inherited differences in psychological abilities. And this controversy helped sparking his interest interest in the question of the transmission and ev evolution of cultural traits. He argued that racialist thinking was based on a logical error of equating causation with correlation, he argued. But the problem was that transmission of cultural traits often follow the same path as the transmission of genes, making it hard to separate them analytically. Together with his colleague, uh, Marcus Feldman, Cavalli published a series of uh, theoretical works where they tried to explain cultural evolution with the help of theories and methods from quantitative population genetics. They saw culture as something that are transferred between individuals through learning and imitation, and which can be divided into small separate elements. The idea was popular, popularized as memes by Richard Dawkins in 1976. Cavalli and Feldman saw these cultural elements as parallel to genes. They mutated, they were transferred between individuals and selected for and against, and they were subjected to drift. And uh, this is how culture is described in this history and geography of the human genes. It's talked about as cultural pools, with assumed, which assumedly overlap with human populations and gene pools, since they are determined by the same factors. Uh, so the coevolution uh, is explained as the result both of uh, culture affecting biology and geography and migration affecting culture and biology. But the arrow of causation is uh, never pointing in the opposite direction from biology to culture. This is what they were opposed to. Um, yeah, so the main aim of the book was to demonstrate this co-evolution, meaning uh, that the evolution of, or the um, phylogenetic tree of human populations fit with a tree of human languages. That was the, this is the basic uh, claim. But to test such a hypothesis, the first task would of course be to check if there really is a fit between genetic and linguistic variation. However, since language was used as a criterion for identifying and delineating many of these populations, they will, of course, by their very definition, coincide the populations and the language community. And actually, in spite of this partly circular construction or correlation, the tree still doesn't demonstrate a very high degree of overlap. However, this theory of uh, co-evolution was not seen as a rule without exceptions. The population can adopt a new language without changing its gene pool and vice versa. So any deviation from the match between linguistic, uh, the linguistic and the genetic tree could thus be explained through an ad hoc hypothesis. And I think the Sami case is an example of this. <clears throat> they were one of the indigenous peoples that received special attention in the study. 
According to genetic distance and average linkage, the Sami branch belonged in the European Caucasoid group. Kavalis-Hoysa, however, claimed that the Sami ancestors were not European Caucasoids, but uh, Asiatics from the Uralic uh, mountain region. Uh, so, what, what was the evidence for this narrative? Well, the evidence was, uh, or the argument was not based on genetic data. If you look at the book's list of genetic distances, the Sami were not particularly close to the Kumi and Mari, the uh, 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 um, present-day inhabitants of the assumed uh, Uralic area of Sami origin. Uh, the Sami language, so, so why, why claim uh, Uralic ancestry for the Sami? The Sami languages belong to the Uralic language family, <coughs> which assumedly originates in the Uralic region. Uh, and uh, as representatives of the Uralics, they used the Kumi and Mari, who genetically was defined as Mongoloids. And this meant that the speakers of the Uralic languages belonged on two sides of the assumed genetic split between, uh, between uh, Mongoloids and Northeast Asians. Uh, I mean, Caucasians and, and uh, Northeast Asians, or whatever was the name they used here. Northeast Asians, yes. So this would have been a challenge to the theory of co-evolution if it hadn't been for the, uh, the, the uh, Uralic origin theory. And of course the idea was that uh, the Sami had wandered into uh, to, uh, what later became Scandinavia and there they had mixed with the uh, local people and therefore they genetically were more close to the Caucasians than to these Asiatics. Um, and again, this uh, theory was uh, quite similar to the theory that Skreiner put forward uh, half a century earlier. And but it was strongly at odds with this theory that was dominating in, uh, among Scandinavian archaeologists studying Sami prehistory. Since the early 1980s, in the wake of the Alta conflict, the struggle on Sami indigenous rights and so on, increasing numbers of archaeologists had turned their attention to Sami prehistory. But they had not turned to physical anthropology or genetics for help in clarifying the ethnic identity of prehistoric populations. Instead, they had sought inspiration in social anthropology and in Frederick Bach's uh, famous introduction to ethnic groups and boundaries. Bach accused mainstream anthropology for portray portraying ethnic groups as biologically as uh, <coughs> biologically, socially, and culturally self-perpetuating entities, and thus for implicitly upholding the traditional view that a race is a culture, is a language, and thereby concealing the fact that ethnic boundaries do not necessarily coincide with population boundaries or with cultural differences. According to Bart, ethnic entities should not be seen as the product of isolation, which was Kavali's theory, but as the way to organize social interaction among human groups. And in order to understand ethnicity, Bart and his co-authors had directed their attention toward the boundaries between ethnic groups. How these boundaries are established and reproduced, how they affect the social interaction between human groups, uh, and so uh, studies along these lines demonstrated, according to Bart, that ethnic boundaries affect only a limited set of cultural features, that culture can vary, be learned, and change without any critical 
relation to the maintenance of the ethnic group and its boundaries, and that human beings can cross ethnic boundaries without the boundary being broken down. In short, ethnic boundaries may persist despite the os osmosis of personnel between them, as Fredrik Bart said. A paper from 1983 by the anthropologist and archaeologist Knut Odner signalized the breakthrough of a Bartian concept of ethnicity in the study of Sami prehistory. And instead of asking where the Sami came from and when they had settled in Scandinavia, Odner asked why Sami ethnicity arose and how it had been reproduced until the present. His answer was that ethnic boundaries in modern Fennoscandia arose some 2,000 years ago in a, as a way to organize economic exchange between populations that utilized different ecological niches. Um, yeah. And uh, this approach had lasting impact. So in uh, uh, Samen's history, oh. Uh, something happened with my uh, presentation. Well, doesn't matter. Uh, this book I was referring to, this is uh, the, uh, uh, um, a revised version of Odner's account is included. The authors claim that the ethnic groups and boundaries of northern Scandinavia arose during the last century before Christ. Uh, and. Uh, ethnic differences were signalized by the help of specific cultural behaviors and symbols, such as specific burial customs and dwellings, and therefore by studying ethnically relevant aspects of the material culture, architects, <laughs> archaeologists could reconstruct prehistoric ethnic groups and boundaries. So, finally, there. <coughs> There are no cross-disciplinary scientific consensus about the concept of ethnicity. The term is defined in various ways by historians, political scientists, sociologists, and anthropologists. But it can still be argued that Bart's uh, approach to ethnicity has been a key point of reference in these debates, in specifically in, uh, among anthropologists. According to the American sociologist Andreas Wimmer, Bart instigated a paradigm shift in the anthropological study of ethnicities, ethnicity. Uh, and, uh, which, which means that anthropologists no longer study the culture of ethnic group A or B. Instead, uh, uh, they study how the ethnic boundary between A and B are inscribed on a landscape of continuous cultural transition. And this paradigm is in sharp contrast to the basic assumptions upon which Cavalli's theory of cultural genetic co-evolution rests. So this uh, paradigmatic shift that the Wimmer is talking about did uh, not affect Cavalli's for us work. So to sum up, population geneticists and archaeologists studying the roots of the Sami in the 1990s came up with different and mutually incompatible answers. Archaeologists interpreted cultural artifacts from archaeological findings, while the geneticists studied gene frequencies among contemporary populations. But the reason why they reached different conclusions was not that different types of evidence pointed in different directions. Uh, the gene frequency data was open for various interpretations. Marshall Cavalli's uh, Manozzi and Piazza's data on Sami genes were taken from uh, publications by the Swedish geneticist Lars Beckmann. But Beckmann's own interpretation of these data were not in agreement with Cavallis. When he summed up in 1996, for uh, two years after the publication of uh, Cavallis' book, when Beckmann then summed up uh, four decades of research on, uh, on uh, Sami population genetics, he argued that uh, there was no strong evidence pointing to an Asiatic origin of the Sami. The overall results suggest instead, according to him, 
that the Sami is a European Aboriginal population with a unique genetic constitution. So the mutually incompatible narratives, Kavalis and, and uh, the, uh, say the Odnush, about the roots of the Sami, uh, they are not the result of different types of evidence pointing in different directions. Instead, it's, uh, I argue that these researchers represented separate research traditions dominated by different and mutually incompatible theoretical preconceptions about the relationship between biology and culture. Well, I'm not uh, very much into it uh, in the sense that I have really made research on it. I wanted to kind of follow this case with the Sami prehistory and so on uh, up to the present, but I never got that uh, far. Uh, but of course, I think, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that happened since uh, this book was written. This was based on classical genetic markers. Now you've got the genome revolution, then you've got the Y chromosome studies and the uh, mitochondrial DNA studies, and now we've got the whole sequence, genome sequencing uh, technology, and then uh, you've got the, the uh, ancient DNA. So all this kind of changes, you know, what kind of um, questions you can ask, and I don't know, you're you have got much stronger <laughs> methodological tools, of course, than, than you had. And, and I think moving from only studies of contemporary populations to also being able to study the DNA of, uh, or the genetics of uh, uh, ancient populations, of course, changes this whole thing. But still, I think the basic problems of uh, how do you delineate populations and this model, what kind of model do you have when you're uh, going uh, uh, using biological data to, to, to uh, look at cultural uh, groups, uh, culturally defined groups and all that. I mean, these basic conceptual problems are still there and I think it's, uh, uh, it's maybe there are better discussions about it now than it used to be, uh, I'm, but I'm not sure. And when you see how these things are marketed, I mean, how one thing is what scientists do when they are doing their research, and one thing is what the scientists do when they present their results to the public and to uh, colleagues in other disciplines and so on. There is a lot of, of simplifications, I think, and, and misunderstandings. Yeah, well. Thank you very much for that, and I, it's, it's difficult to know how to respond because whenever I, whenever I hear about Cavalli Sforza, I get so angry, I sell such a knot in my stomach, I get so furious. I, I, and I actually think we are right to be furious. I think there's, there's reason to be extremely angry about the way in which these genetically based uh, models are, are built and the premises on which they're built, partly because these people refuse to listen to anybody else, least of all to uh, 
to the Sami themselves or any other of the indigenous people that they're, they're talking about. But I, 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 I've been trying to find, because I think these guys are really basically racist, that, that racism is founded on a combination of a, a logic of inheritance and essentialism. If you put inheritance, if you, if you put together the idea that the delineations of a being are acquired through inheritance and that this gives the being, along with others, a certain essence, you've basically got racism. And I think that, that logic, which combines essentialism and inheritance, is alive and kicking in contemporary biological anthropology, even amongst all of those who would insist that they're not racists at all. It's, it's, it's still there. And they still talk about Homo sapiens sapiens as a subspecies. And what the hell is that if it's not a race? So they're, 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 still, they're, they're still working with that logic. And, um, and, and I think that the, 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 the real problem is, is the concept of inheritance. Because that implies that a human being gets the basic delineations of their existence ab initio, at the point of conception, and that their life is nothing more than the expression of that. And, and, and I think really we, you know, that that concept is as dangerous as the concept of race, and yet it's still built in to mainstream neo-Darwinian theory. But the question I was going to ask is, 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 is this, that it's about the, the, the population thinking, it's about what it means when we talk about the Sami, because with sort of modern thinking about these things, it's simply assumed that, well, you know, here's one Sami, here are five Sami, we can, we can count up the number of Sami in a community or in a nation or, in a, or all the Sami all together and come up with a, with a number as though Sami is, is a population, a plurality of individuals. My understanding is that that's not what Sami means. Um, Sami means a certain way of being alive in a country in relation to the land of that country. It's not actually a term that denotes a plurality of individuals at all. But it has come to mean that through a modernist inflection that has turned ways of being into a numerate quantity of of individuals. I, I don't know what it's a comment really. I don't know what we do with this, but 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 I I I, I don't know. We, 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 we regret the fact that there's not proper communication between the social anthropologists and the and the geneticists. But my question is, I don't know if you can answer it, what the hell do we do when these guys over there are convinced that they're onto the truth and are not prepared to listen to anybody? They don't listen to social anthropologists. They certainly don't listen to the people themselves that they're talking about. What do we do? Have you got any suggestion? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I, th I think the, I, I, uh, in general, <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> but uh, I think there are uh, the picture is not that. I mean, when you're talking about geneticists, I think you, uh, I mean, you have the geneticist and you have the biological anthropologists, and I think some of those at least are engaging in more broader discussions and are actually talking to also to the social anthropologists and so on. So there are, I mean, it's not that black and white picture, I think. I mean, some of the people who are most uh, kind of strongest opponents of Cavalli's Foisa is among the biological anthropologists, actually. John Marx, for example, is... Uh, hmm? yeah. so, so, I mean, there are, there are discussions going on, and if you look at the last... This year, actually, the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, they updated their statement on race, which I think is quite... Uh, quite um, uh, say... Uh, nuanced and the basic uh, argument is that race is not a biological thing it's a, it is a historical uh, construct that has a lot of <laughs> problems um, but yes I, I, uh, I totally agree that there are a lot of uh, of this research that is uh, um, and this lack of thinking about all these 
problems built into the population concept, uh, yeah, which is a big, big problem both scientifically and especially there when you talk about the social uh, in meaning of the work that this science uh, do in society when you have these DNA tests on web and you have all this kind of marketing of this kind of research. You get uh, over and over again reproduced this idea about uh, ethnic groups are biological entities that you can take a DNA test and find out uh, if you are a Sami or a Norwegian or whatever. I mean, this is a basic way of thinking and I think is affecting society very much at, at present and that is not good. Even if many of these people working on these things would say that they this is not what they mean and this is not the message they want to bring out. Uh, this may, might be the message that is coming out of this, this kind of research. Maybe I was very unclear, but that's, yeah. Okay, do we have any more comments? No, in that case, what? On? Tim's frustration because I mean one of the problems is that um, that the kind of uh, le le legitimization of this as sort of based on scientific uh, hard facts has a very uh, sort of convincing uh, force to the general public. I mean it's very easy for them to sort of, or it fits very well with the preconceptions that most people have anyway. Yeah. So, so I think, I mean, the most serious thing is that sort of how this sort of masks or dresses up uh, findings in the language of sort of hard science in a way, which is, uh, which is very difficult. And, and I'm thinking because the, this sort of the, the the understanding or the the discourse of uh, what was his name? Carlos Fosa. Carlos Fosa. I guess it's not sort of. Uh, it would go down very well with uh, with people's uh, the kind of understanding that people have. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah. yeah yeah it resonates well with uh, <laughs> you know kind of uh, everyday-ish uh, way of yeah. thinking about these things. Yeah. So. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's a kind of cheating, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, also something when you talk about this way of presenting uh, uh, knowledge as, you know, based on hard yeah. science. Uh, and uh, you use a lot of numbers and you make this kind of yeah. or, or trees. It, it's uh, very convincing, it is exact. Science, but if you look into it, it is extremely uh, based on interpretations and, and uh, uh, assumptions. For example, I'll take one example here: is that there is nothing in the data that uh, tells us which way these nodes should be directed. So, when the, la the Sami and the Uralics are put next to each other here in the, this presentation, it's just uh, based on the arbitrary or not arbitrary, but the choices of the researchers, because all these branches could be uh, organized a different way. There's nothing in the genetic data that, and there is also not, not much that connects these groups genetically in the genetic data. So that's more or less like, a, yeah, just saying that these people have something to do with each other by putting them on a tree like that. But it looks very scientific. Um, I, I, I was, um, when you were talking, I was thinking that uh, this could be an example of uh, uh, archaeology of knowledge, not done by a philosopher, but by an archaeologist, and that um, this, uh, these uh, layers of attempts of creating a meaningful dialogue between ideas and evidence, the idea aspect is kind of uh, blending in ways that we need to extract, as it were, to dig them out, which I think you've been... Uh, uh, working, but, but that's at least what I heard. Um, uh, there's, um, I don't know if you come across a book by uh, Lorraine, edited by Lorraine Daston. It's called uh, Science in the Archives. 
And sh sh have you heard of it? I heard, uh, yes, but yeah. I haven't read it. I no, uh, it. but it's um, uh, the idea there is like, I mean, there's so many, these layers of uh, meaningful dialogue between ideas and evidence. She would, uh, I think, classify into three categories. So one, first one being, uh, let's say, um, uh, first nature. It's about observation and, and, uh, and notes, uh, note taking and, uh, let's say, uh, things that are still unstable. Uh, second nature would be like uh, when it's negotiated in terms of analysis and hypotheses. And then the third nature would be when it's stored and retrieved and made available as some sort of archive. Like it materializes, uh, it becomes like more, more and more material somehow. I found it striking that uh, in this uh, uh, negotiating between uh, or discussion of gene pool and, and, and the cultural pool, there's this element of, of design that comes in with a really, uh, I mean, the, a making aspect, which is either in the limitation of the repertoire of people who are drawing these, um, these trees by hand or, or their desktop publication uh, equipment, that they, they will get, you know, convey at the level of the third life a, a kind of information which is uh, where design, the, the design actually is quite decisive of what can be read from it. Um, yeah, so I guess that was just a comment in a way. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you, Jun. I mean, I'm not sure that, I mean, the kind of field notes that you take in order to, um, to be true to uh, the two observations, uh, they are kind of drawings. <laughs> <laughs> in a way, or the kind of descriptions that are uh, that are uh, somewhere on the on the road to becoming uh, something analytical. But I mean, uh, what about writing? I mean, that's the anthropological sort of key way of processing observations, isn't it? Maybe, but but I, I'm strongly in favour of the view that we should be uh, bringing drawing much more centrally into anthropology, I think it's, uh, and, and it's, it's a very powerful tool of, of observation. And, and um, instead, what's happened mostly is that anthropologists have been trained to use uh, film or cameras and that kind of thing, and, and on, on the idea that, well, what's the point of learning how to draw when we've got all these easy to use cameras which give you, you know, fuller record and, and the rest of it. And I think that is, that is a fundamental mistake. And, and, and I think the source of the mistake lies in the idea that drawings are images, uh, rather than the traces of a, a record, a trace of, of an observational process. Uh, because you're actually watching, and, and then the drawing is a kind of trace, a record of that process of, of watching. And, uh, and, and in that sense, it never, it's never complete any longer than watching it. It's always a sort of work in, work in progress. And I think if we could if we could get away from the idea of, because there's this silly opposition between word and image, which, which makes us think that, that if a drawing is an image, it's on the other side of the fence, so to speak, from, from text. There's something fundamentally different. But if we, if we can say that, well, you can write, you can sketch, you can draw, you can run into one another without any sort of crossing any barrier. You don't have to say, oh, I'm drawing now. I, I, my relation to this what I'm looking at is totally different. You can flow in and out of, 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 of right handwriting and drawing really easily. And, and I think that's something we should be encouraging. Though, the, though perhaps one other side of it is that we should be, I, I also believe we should be getting people in the field back to handwriting their notes. Uh, Handwriting is, is good, and we should absolutely do that. But I think maybe you make a silly opposition between uh, uh, <laughs> film and drawing, because I think film is also <laughs> film is also a way of uh, watching and seeing things, 
and it can be done uh, as an artist or it can be done as an observer uh, in many different ways. And I think that is also a very uh, uh, useful tool. Yeah, I think we should uh, round off now because we're uh, almost half an hour <laughs> late. Um, I just want to conclude that discussion because uh, I think the same in archaeology, we're heading towards uh, uh, digital documentation techniques and they're wonderful, really wonderful. But we tend to take photos or photogrammetry uh, and we postpone the interpretation. So we bring it home and then we start the interpretational process. And that was what drawing forced us to do, was to interpret then and there. So I think we, uh, this is a challenge for the Research Council. Maybe the next, uh, <laughs> the next uh, seminar will be on uh, drawing as a method of observation and interpretation. We'll <laughs> on my mind all day. When I came here and I asked at the hotel lobby, uh, what's the way to the building? They pointed out to me, oh, she said, you mean the hist I, I said, uh, the Museum of Cultural History. Oh, she said, the Historical Museum. And when I came to the entrance, it said, Historisk Museet. But up here, everybody is talking about the Museum of Cultural History. Is this a museum of history <laughs> or a museum of cultural history? And please, what difference does it make? The, the, the historical museum is a building. Uh, is this building? But uh, yes, but the Museum of Cultural History is our organization. It's an institution. It's, it's an institution, yeah. So the, so the, the Museum of Cultural History is an institution. Yes. The historical museum is a building. Yes. And the institution <laughs> is partially but not completely located in mm. the building. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I just want to make sure that you know that you're in a museum at the end of the day. So we do have some artifacts, uh, but uh, the uh, reason for bringing the artifacts into this context is uh, that I would uh, like you to focus with me uh, on the methodological potentials, uh, potentials of, uh, uh, of uh, focusing on the making of these objects uh, like I have done in my field works in, uh, in Tonga. Uh, when I joined the Ethnographic Museum here in Oslo back in uh, 2001, I decided to start taking things seriously. I felt that as an anthropologist with a responsibility of caring for the kinds of things people have brought back from the Pacific, over the last 150 years or so, I should make an effort to learn more about the things that people create use and surround themselves with than most anthropologists. As research partner in the project Identity Matters, Movement and Place in Oceania, I therefore in 2004, quite a few years ago, sought apprenticeship with the Tongan woodcarver Feao Fehoko, whose workshop was located at the outskirts of Nualofa, the capital of the Polynesian Kingdom of Tonga. My primary aim was to learn as much as possible of what one needs to know in order to make beautiful, valuable, and useful things in the form of a small selection of wooden artifacts such as these headrests, or kari, and this kava bowl, kumete, which complements a wider repertoire of artifacts referred to as koloa fagatonga, or Tongan wealth, a category which is otherwise dominated by plated fine pandanus mats and printed bark cloth. My hope was that the knowledge, the skills, and the themes and topics that my attempts to master the Tongan art of wood carving actualized might lead to um, discoveries which would produce insight about something else and something more than how to make beautiful, valuable, and useful things. In other words, the material focus had a methodological aim in the sense that I wanted to make it the core of my procedure of discovery in this fieldwork. I would not, of course, want to claim that such a discovery procedure is revolutionary in a discipline where participating or participatory observation is a methodological mantra. 
But taking things and not least how they are made seriously involves a much more explicit emphasis on the methodological potentials of participation in creative engagements for the discovery of cultural values. If I were to choose a label for such a procedure of discovery, I would have to uh, call it something like methodological materialism. Thus, what follows is my attempt to explore the potential ethnographic rewards, or what I'd call methodological materialism. After about a week, a week's hard work with the chainsaw, disc grinder, chisel and mallet, the raw block of cassia or acacia wood that the wood carver had provided for my first project had received the shape that I was quite pleased with. Feao, the wood carver, had tried to explain to me the difference between a bowl with legs and a proper or true carver bowl. He had shown me how the four legs could be carved out in a perfect symmetry around the bottom of the bowl if you imagined or placed a mental net on what was to become the underside of the bowl and decided which cells to cut away and which to keep. He had encouraged me to work really hard at the wood just where the legs jutted out of the block to make the joining of the legs and the bottom as sharp, as precise, and first of all, as similar as possible in all four legs. He had shown me how to take hold of the bowl with my hands to feel for differences in, of thickness <coughs> and make hands and eyes work together in order to judge what still needs to be removed to make a true cover bowl and not just a, any bowl with legs. After a few more days of modification with chisel and mallet and sanding with ever more finely grained sandpaper, for now, Feao pronounced, ah, this is it, now it has become a true cover bowl and not just any bowl with legs. We make many like these in the workshop, he went on, but cassia wood, acacia wood, is not very suitable if you want to, the cover bowl to last for a really long time. It cracks easily and the legs may break off after just a few years. Fehi wood and toa, two kinds of hardwood, ironwood, are much harder to work with, but also much more suitable because it does not crack so easily and because the legs don't break as quickly. So if you want a cover bowl which will last for 100 years, you should carve it out of toa or fehi wood, he said. The concept which he, which he used was aonga, or suitable, or suitability. It was one that I had encountered many times before during my previous field works on Kotu Island in uh, uh, the Hapai group a bit further north in Tonga. It was used about all materials which through modification or manner of use were uh, effective as means of achieving specific goals or of realizing intended results. The husk of certain kinds of coconuts were, for example, described as aonga, for making senit or kapha. The leaves of the coconut palm were suitable to make the roof, walls, and floor mattings of traditional houses and baskets to carry crops back to the village from the garden. The leaves of different kinds of pandanus palm were suitable for plating different kinds of mats, certain kinds of stone were aonga for repeated use in the earth oven without coming brittle from the heat of fire, certain kinds of black pebbles were aonga for decorating graves because they became shiny when soaked with coconut oil. Large corn, box, uh, box, corn beef boxes divided in two were aonga for baking bread in the earth oven and gift wrapping ban was suitable to plate with pandanus in order to achieve brightly colored body mats and so on. So I was wondering whether Feao's emphasis on the significance of suitability in carving was limited to the function of the carved object, or whether suitability was also re relevant with regard to the shape one was trying to achieve. In other words, I wondered if one of the things the carver had to know about was the suitability of raw materials with re regard to particular shapes he was minded to carve out. In order to discuss this further with him, I asked Fial to comment on a story about a well-known master carver title on Kotu Island, in Hapai, the place where I had done my first field works in Tonga 15 years earlier. And the story I told him went like this. The first one appointed to the master carver title of Vakalilo was a competent Tufunga Tawaka, or shipwright, boat builder. 
and built one of the ocean-going double-hulled crafts which sailed with King Tupou I on his campaign against Fiji in 1854. It is said that King Tupou I sought out a well-known boat builder on the densely forested island of Tofua where he escorted him into the forest, the story goes. After a while, the carver paused, pointed to an enormous tree and said, look over there, that's no tree but a vacalillo, a hidden boat. The tree was felled, the boat was built from it, and since then the master carver and his descendants have drunk their kava under the title of vacalillo, the story says. I told Feau that to me the story presented the creativity of the boat builder as his ability to bring out a boat already existing, as it were, in the tree, hidden from others, but obvious to him, because of his knowledge and experience. In such a perspective, his competence appeared to be to bring forth something already created by natural growth. Fiao politely conceded that it was a nice story, but that such an interpretation did not fit very well with his perspective as a woodcover. He went on to explain that his own interest in the suitability of materials for his carving projects was not at all about bringing out shapes already residing within the raw material. The suitability of the raw material, he argued, lies in other qualities than those related to the shape of the finished object. Does it crack easily? How are the grains of the wood? Is the wood hutaha? That is, are the grain unidirectional? Or are they fehufaki? That is, cross-grained. What happens when it gets wet? How bendable is it? How resistant is it? How light is it? Such things. The raw material does not hide the shape that the carver brings out, he felt. The shape, it is totally up to the master carver to decide. Since the making of kava bowls were what we were working on, uh, he used that as his example. When the master carver makes a kava bowl, he said, it is he who decides how the feet come out from the bottom of the bowl and where they are placed under the underside of the bowl. If he makes it noaiape or haphazardly, the legs will not be evenly spaced and will not come sharply and precisely out of the bottom of the bowl, as they should on a true kava bowl. If he works taitokanga, that is, without paying attention, the bowl may turn out unshapely and oblong instead of perfectly circular, and then it will become just a bowl with legs and no true kava bowl. The raw material must be suitable for what you want to make, but you are the boss, and it is you and not the tree who decides how the shape turns out. It is your ability to decide, to decide this that makes you a tufunga, a master carver. The way Fiao described the craft of his own carving, it appeared very much as the materialization of something mental in the form of knowledge, embodied skills, and ideas about material suitability. In the master carver's presentation of his own perspective, his creativity, first of all, appeared as the ability through knowledge, skills, and authority to discipline, in a way, the raw material and transform it to a well-proportioned, well-polished, and above all, correctly shaped artifact. In sharp contrast to an inspiring thinker within material studies, such as our guest, Professor Tim Engel, the Tongan master carver appeared to embrace rather than reject a perspective making creative activity materialization of a memory of an ideal pre-existing form. Rather than emphasizing the co-creativity of materials and engaged practitioners, as Ingle does in his fascinating work on weaving a basket from 2000 and in many later works, uh, Feau's perspective puts the emphasis on the maker's will and ability to give the raw material its appropriate shape and form. While Ingle rejects the distinction between subject and object in approaching making and creativity as a materializing process, the Tongan master carver insists on being a subject who forms an object from a mental blueprint and who may enjoy recognition for his competence as a carver based on the quality of the resulting carved object. In On Weaving a Basket, Ingle argues that the Western tradition of knowledge, which rests heavily on the Aristotelian distinction between substance and form, as well as on a Descartesian distinction between subject and object, have turned the standard perception of making into a process whereby an active subject realizes an idea by forming passive components of an environment of which a subject is no part. 
he argues, and since he's here, I'm sure he will correct me if I misrepresent him, that this is not only a particularly Western understanding of creative processes, but also an unrealistic distortion of reality. Thus he argues that the Western standard understanding of making turns it into a process where raw material, which already exists in the natural state, is cultivated or refined by making it as similar to an already existing mental blueprint. But as Engel points out, not all making is like carving, or perhaps even very little making is like carving, and takes the form of reworking an already existing material object. To his mind, basket weaving, where the artifact emerges as an aggregate of repeating reciprocal flows of effects within what, what he has called the field of forces, and where the maker and her knowledge, skills, and will is one out of many generative components, gives a more realistic understanding of what making is in reality entails. In this light, my Tongan wood carver's perspective on his uh, own and other makers' creative activities appears to be a Descartesian rather than an Ingoldian perspective. Now, it is conceivable that Feout's perspective on the suitability of raw materials and the significance of his own agency is a result of recent westernization and that creativity was perceived in a way which was more in line with Ingalls' perspective before the significant European influence on Tongan thinking over the last two centuries. On the other hand, it is very easy to find what I would call cultural resonance in Tonga for Feau's presentation of making as a process where passive objects are transformed and cultivated by forceful subjects to become socially acceptable and culturally valuable. Cultivation and cultivatedness definitely has a high standing in a Tongan hierarchy of values, and it is not easy to see that the ev evaluation of the cultivated, the shapely, and well-proportioned, and the refined, above the raw, natural, and spontaneous is a European import. When people talk about child rearing, for example, the emphasis is definitely on measures perceived to form and mold the person and give him or her a straight and steady course. Quite firm child-rearing measures are described as necessary in order to make children hangatono, which may be translated as a one-directional growth, instead of pico pico or crooked growth. The people among whom I worked on Kotu are gardeners, and several of them have justified the necessity of physical punishment in child-rearing through an analogy with how gardeners cultivate banana plants by pruning, that is, cutting off undesirable parts of the plant. In this way, they say, you avoid getting a plant which is faka pico pico, or crooked, and get higher quality bananas and a better yield. The same goes for children, they would say. If you do not cut off actions where spontaneous desires are realized at the expense of situationally specific requirements for appropriate conduct, the person shall turn out crooked and lose his or her way. In other words, Fao's emphasis of the agency, control, and authority of the master carver and his understanding of the creative process uh, as the master's realization of a correct form through a disciplining transformation rather than as co-creative and reciprocal exchanges in a field of forces, resonates very strongly with the general preference for the cultivated before the natural in Tonga and the general emphasis on the significance of authority and rank. This does not, of course, detract from the value of Ingalls' perspective for achieving a realistic understanding of how the mental and the material is entangled in the world's regeneration of itself particularly his emphasis on the fact that people do not stand outside their environment, but like other organisms, are engaged and involved with components of the environment, I find extremely inspiring and important, because it invites us to put emphasis on practical experience, embodied skills and implicit knowledge, which partly has significance beyond language, but partly also gives verbal concepts their significance. I will use the remainder of my presentation to explore the potentials for discovery uh, for which such an emphasis on practical involvement, to my mind, paves the way. 
And as a researcher who is first of all interested in people's reproduction and modification of common understandings, evaluations and preferences, Fiao's own perspective on his making remains invaluable. Not first of all because it has allowed me to learn a bit about tongue and wood carving, but for opening up a space where experience and concepts are substantially linked to one another in a way which offers rich potentials for discovering and exploring central cultural ideas, values, and preferences. So let me return to the woodcarver's workshop again. After I had carved the two carver bowls made of, um, of acacia, acacia wood, Fe'au felt I should now be ready for new challenges and provided me with a piece of toa or iron wood, which he felt was suitable for making a Tongan head or neck rest. The piece of wood was considerably harder than the acacia wood for the kava bowl, but after about a week I had turned it into a well-proportioned headrest, which Fiao found acceptable. After having polished the headrest with coconut oil in order to make it more brilliant and shiny still, Fiao brought out a larger and darker piece of wood for me to make another headrest. The previous raw material had been hard enough, but the new piece offered considerably more resistance when I tried to carve it into shape. My hands and wrists soon started to ache and my chisel appeared to have little effect on the piece of wood. Next to me, an, an, another apprentice carver in his late teens was faring much better in transforming an equally hard block of wood to a finished headrest. His chisel was no, was no sharper than mine, but I noticed that his grip around the handle of the chisel was looser and that the chisel's angle was still very precise, making each cut count. So I concentrated on copying him. The tight grip on the handle of the chisel that had worked well enough on the previous headrest worked to channel the force of my blows too much into my hands, wrists, and arm when making this one. This would demanded that you manage to guide the angle of the chisel with perfect precision without grasping the handle tightly. Over the next week, I gradually got the hang of it, and the initial relentless resistance of the wood gradually gave way to one which allowed slow progress. During the week, I nevertheless complained to Fiao about how tough it was to beat this wood into shape. Yes, Toa is a tree that fights, he said. So when you strike it, it strikes you right back. I objected that the first one I made, which was this one, was of the same kind of wood, but not equally hard. Of course not, he said, because that one was from later on the tree. This one is from the very beginning. The words which he used to describe the quality of the first piece of wood was mu apeia, no, mu, mu ipeia, which may be translated as it is later, it is behind, it is still young. Like all other things which grow, he explained, most of the essential quality of the plant is concentrated closest to the root or origin, and it becomes less of that quality when you move away from the root. Just as kava made from uh, the part of the plant close to the roots is stronger and more bitter, and just as the taste at the root end of the sugarcane is sweeter, so also the wood close to the root end of the iron tree is harder, he explained. This was not the first time I had encountered the oppositional pair of concepts of mu'a signifying the beginning, the front, before, or the preceding end, and mu'i signifying the back, after, or the following end. This was an oppositional pair which was used quite often, both when the horticulturalists on Kotu talked about how yams should be cultivated, and when the master of ceremonies explained how food should be laid out in a ceremonial food presentation. Thus, horticulturalists would say that the most beautiful yam plantation would be the one where yams were planted by cutting up and sorting the pieces of the seed yam and plant them in separate rows depending on whether they came from the preceding, middle, or following section of the seed yam. The speed of growth, they would claim, was faster in the pieces from the preceding end and ever slower, closer to the following end of the yam plant. Thus, also, a plantation cultivated by this planting strategy would be more beautiful and orderly or well-proportioned, they said, because it would visualize the manner of growth of the yam in the garden. 
Similarly, masters of ceremony responsible for laying out the components of ceremonial food presentations would describe their work in terms of the distinction between the preceding and the following end. The preceding end of the yam, they said, should be turned towards the preceding end of the food presentation, where the people of seniority and high rank should be seated. That is, the chiefly end. And so elsewhere, I have argued that in many fields of practical engagements with the surroundings in everyday village life in Tonga, the relationship between what is located closest to a point of origin and thus precedes and causes what follows in its wake contributes to naturalize ideas connected to difference in rank and seniority, or to make them very real. To conclude then, when we look at touch and lift, which I invite you to do after this, <laughs> the carved headdress I uh, made under Fell's directions, the visual and tactile difference between the headdress made from the wood closest to the tree's origin, and that made from the wood following after is quite striking. But even more important for my exploration of the preferences, judgments, and perspectives people shared and I wish to understand, was that I, in making the headdress, engaged the difference between what precedes and what follows in a very concrete manner. A manner which might well be akin to the manner in which this, this difference becomes significant to Tongans, at the intersection between experience and words and concepts, where I would suggest that a methodological materialism might seek to develop its ethnography. Like most fieldworks, the one in the master carver's workshop at the outskirts of Nukualofa was uncomfortable at times, with plenty of grime and dust from, uh, from uh, cutting, grinding, and endless sanding, and plenty of painful joints from sitting in awkward positions for hours on end. But it also had its upsides. Firstly, in the clear aim to learn as much as possible about how to actually make objects of cultural significance to Tongans, which meant I was less insecure about how to spend the days of my fieldwork than in other fieldworks I have undertaken. Secondly, it involved the satisfaction of learning a new skill, resulting in concrete and quite nice things. Thirdly, and most importantly, however, it involved engagements with materials and people which open up for the discovery or verification of cultural notions with ramifications far beyond the uh, woodcarver's workshop. So looking at the things I made under Fe'au's guidance today, and particularly noticing the difference between them, I hope I may be justified in paraphrasing the master carver Vakalilo, who pointed out the boat hidden at the tree to King Tupol I, and thus say, these are not headrests, but a hidden paper on Tongan values and a procedure of discovery. Thank you. That was quick. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. And thank you for showing us this uh, nice object. <laughs> Good job. Uh, comments? Questions? I was just wondering, when you started carving the wood, you, you said that you were watching and you kind of observed how they were, the kind of the techniques they used, but could you just say something a bit more of how, how you kind of, how, when you started working the wood, did he kind of give you instructions and then follow you up, or did, you, did he give you instructions, you had to observe what he was doing, and could you just, he, well, he was uh, quite close at hand in the, in the beginning and uh, took over uh, several times and, and, and sort of just to show how to, how to work and pointed out where to, where to concentrate, particularly, okay, you have to, it was especially in the sort of the judgment of how I was going or where I was going. That he, that he would say that, no, no, you, you have to, you feel this, you have to, you have, it's too fat here. It's still fat, you have to, you feel it with your hands and see, you have to get this off and you work there. And so, so he was sort of going back and forth and telling me, most of all, where to, 
to concentrate my effort, not so much how to do it. Because he will just, he would just point and, uh, and it was more up to me to sort of figure out uh, exactly how to uh, engage with the wood in a way. But, so he was more interested in how to get it to become the kind of, have the shape and to look like the kind of thing he was thinking about, as, as I understood it. You know. No, I was just thinking about the, the, the woodworker that saw the boat in the tree because uh, they did have a lot of, or in the medieval uh, uh, wood carving we, or the sculptures we see that they, sometimes you can sort of almost see how the sculpture has been a bit restrained by the uh, wooden core that yeah. they chose for it and it's also been uh, we have an example of um, um, a Mary from a Calvary group that is a little bit ooh, a little bit overstretched and uh, it's been uh, art historians have said you know is the is the a de degenerated one or is you know it, uh, it's not uh, the top piece, and, but it's actually caused by a big knot in the wood being just yeah. here. And I think you know the wood car carver saw the tree and thought, "Oh, it just has the right shape of a leaning Mary." And then making it, it was leaning a little bit too much because he had to follow that tree. So it's interesting how they yeah. he saw the boat in the tree. <laughs> Yeah, and I was, I was interested, I, I always, I found that story very inter interesting and, I, and beautiful in a way. And, uh, and, 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 and as I said, I interpreted it as a way of, uh, of focusing on the, the mediating role of the, of the carver in a way, of sort of evoking something that, uh, that was potentially there already and only he could see it. But uh, what interested me was that the, the carver, at least in the context of what we were doing, he was sort of, he rejected that interpretation. And he, 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 he just went for another interpretation which concentrated on, on uh, uplifting the competence of his profession, in a way, mm -hmm. of sort of, okay, no. And, and my point was that, um, was that this, uh, sort of fits well with how uh, how rank and authority is very important in Tongan society and that of sort of being the top man and being on top of the hierarchy and having sort of the the led or having the right to be there is very important to people mm -hmm. and, uh, and so th so he used this as an, as an opportunity to, to sort of uh, to, to, yeah, to talk about his own uh, abilities as a convert, and that, and in doing so, he he uh, presented it in a way which was very hylomorphic, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 I was sort of struck with that, and uh, and uh, and uh, and so even though I I sort of I guess when I started engaging with with carving the, the, the stuff, I was learning things in a way which rests more heavily on sort of Tim's, Tim's theories, but still I was very interested in his sort of, uh, in his perception of his own uh, capabilities because it opened up sort of towards the, the, cultural, uh, the cultural surroundings, yeah. And that is of course very different from you know, the Christian interpretation of God as the creator and the craftsman performing an idea that's already made. Mm. Because, you know, everything has been put there okay. for us to find. <laughs> uh, so so uh, uh, that actually uh, also, uh, in th that way, if you're carving the Virgin, you avoid the problem of uh, idolatry mm. because you, you are actually not making the virgin. It's, it's the, the, the virgin was already there mm. 
and it's just sort of developed out of the core of yeah. Yeah, your material. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, since uh, we we kind of, uh, in a way, uh, we, we have some road together. So I know you from uh, way back uh, and your work. And this time you used a lot more of direct uses of uh, Tongan language, uh, and uh, because I I took it because you were in, uh, involved in making and so. Uh, at the same time, it's uh, difficult for me not to read the presence of uh, uh, generative analysis in what you're saying, since you're talking about material, uh, methodological materialism, mm. and also about uh, procedures of uh, discovery. So I'm uh, wondering a little bit, this in lingo, uh, wh where the uh, uh, procedures of falsification would be. So let me, um, let me explain. Uh, for me, it is uh, interesting to listen to you uh, under the lens that uh, the object kind of explains is a theory of language in the act of making, that uh, language is explicating, explicated uh, in the process of making, making something, so it be kind of the gradient of, uh, of things understood or not, in a way. And um, uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, let's say, the preceding and the following end of the tree, it's a bit like uh, the good and the, the bad end of the stick, in a way, in, in, in our terms. Uh, you know, when, I, when you are using, I was wondering if it applies also when you are in the making process that there, there's a hit and impact going two ways, like to, at the two ends. Like this, one, one, at one end of the tool, the impact is on, on the wood. At the other, hand, uh, other end, mm. the impact is on, on the hand. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and there's a kind of embodied knowledge at, at that level that you learn through imitation and so forth. And I was just wondering if, um, you know, that the, there, there, there are w uh, the aspects in which you falsify as the things that you learn, both at the level of language and uh, at the level of manufacture, is an aspect of, of, of uh, making which is neither, which is neither uh, object nor language that kind of looks beyond uh, mm. that level, you know. Uh, it's a little bit to, uh, to what you, uh, you know, your, your, your question about hylomorphism, because then that would be a two-way interaction according to, uh, as far as I've read Tim, mm. you know, the, the you would have uh, half, uh, 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 transformational half chains, that they were happening, t uh, things at both ends of the tool, at the material end and in your body, and that you would inquire in the relationship when things are, you know, going the right way. Mm. Uh, in that case, it, 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 you know. So I'm just wondering how you would negotiate. Uh, uh, why do you conclude with hylomorphism? And on which basis? Because it were linguistic, ultra, I mean, statements from your informants, right? Yeah. Well, the way the way uh, fit out. Well, the way the carver talked about uh, his uh, attitude towards the uh, towards uh, his own creativity was kind of hylomorphic in the sense that uh, that uh, he figured it out as a sort of okay I have this idea in my head yeah. and uh, I I put this or I make something that is similar to that in the world yes yeah which uh, which was uh, what I was referring to but when it comes to falsification I don't know Frederick Barth once uh, talked about model buildings, building in sort of an in day-to-day -day field work where we we talked about also you, you build sort of partial models and you and you take them out into society and you act by them, and you and you and you try to use them in situation, take them from one situation, use them in another situation, and see how people respond. See if you're able to to sort of use a distinction between. Uh, uh, the front and the, the back in a culturally appropriate way. Uh, if you can make a joke, if you can point to something and, and invert it and get a laugh and things like that. So uh, I, the, the sort of falsification is sort of by building sort of an understanding and, and exposing that to, to, uh, to practical use. Yeah. 
you know, the situation is what that's the, sort of the, the mode yeah. of yeah. working that I've uh, I practiced in a way, yeah. I see, because I was just wondering if the nature of what is going on is identical to, uh, to what people are, you know, is it like matched to what people are saying, or are you inferring it from other, uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, backdrop, which wouldn't be in the entire, uh, the same thing, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, native theory in this case, where is the theory? Is it a, in a broader spectrum of material practice? Or is it in oral statements that are kind of linguistically constructed? Where, where would you locate that? I would uh, locate it in the, in the, in the, uh, at the intersection between uh, words and practice, yeah, in different situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, ha I had a question about um, uh, the materials. Uh, you, uh, uh, if I understood you correct, you said something about that your woodcarver uh, was emphasizing the suitability of the materials used. Yeah. Um, and that the materials, if it was good or bad materials to use, that depends on the functions either the practical, but also the conceptual functions. Um, would you say that uh, the, um, uh, you as a woodcarver uh, is controlling the, the, the materials and making them suitable uh, for the functions? Is that a, a way of saying it? The way the way of seeing it is, from my experience, it is one of the most um, common words that you encounter in everyday life. Is the, the term aonga, which means suitable. That I mean, the 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 point is that uh, people appear to be extremely uh, at attentive to what kind of use they can put this thing to, regardless of what it was made for in a way, that they can sort of, uh, okay, I can use this for, some, for something. I mean, so it's, uh, so it's, uh, it's a, a phrase that you, uh, that you encounter all the time, and, and which I tend to think about the, the, the sort of the, the pervasiveness of, of uh, sort of the use of this uh, is somehow related to uh, a history of uh, having to cope in uh, an environment which doesn't have a lot of things, <laughs> which where you r really have to be able to use the, the things that you have for very many purposes. And, uh, and, uh, and that also means that whether the thing comes from abroad or whether it's grown up in Tonga, it's always people pay very much attention to what kind of new use they can put it to. Like if it's a corn beef box or something, uh, it can always be used for something afterwards, something else than keeping beef in. And uh, gift wrapping can be used with plated mats in order to uh, create a pattern and things because it has some quality that they're after in, uh, in producing it. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful and, and, and interesting and challenging and I'm trying to, I, I'm thinking of, of, of two things to sort of which, which would, would I think where we could sort of meet in the middle and, um, and one is um, one, one is the, 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 the reason why I, I, I wanted to emphasize the the, the the sense in which a form emerges out of the process of making is to actually allow recognition to the making process itself. So as I understood it, part of the problem of, of the hylomorphic model, at least as it had been taken up in modernity, was that um, the work of practitioners, the, the, the people who are actually making stuff, is rendered invisible. Yeah. So, so that all the creative work is, is, is put on the, the side of, of design and the maker 
is, uh, is nothing more than, let us say, a mechanic or, 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 or a machine or is, is, is invisible altogether. And, but clearly, there's actually a very skilled, uh, very time-consuming, very effortful process involved. And, and we can still say that the, the, the actual thing you have there emerged out of all that work, despite the fact that throughout uh, you, or, or the master in this case, had a, a very clear picture in his head about what he wanted to make. Yeah. Uh, so that the problem really with the hylomorphism is not so much the idea of having a prior form, but the notion of imposition. The notion that something comes into being simply through a kind of um, molding process. So what I came to think of then is what, what is the closest to the perfect instantiation of a hylomorphic model would be some forms of 3D printing, where um, actually you know, the computer or you, or his, come, you've come up with a design, and then you plug it into this machine, and then it, it deposits, I don't know how these things work, but it deposits layers of some sort of foamy plastic, which then, um, uh, then over, over after a while, um, there, there's your form, and it's not required anybody to do any, any work at all. So, so the difference here in this case is that you actually have a very difficult, um, very resistant material. And, and as you said, this material does have properties of inclinations of its own, which you have to respect. Um, otherwise, the thing's going to crack. So you could still, you can still, I, I think you can hold both positions mm -hmm. at once quite easily. Can say yes, indeed. This is a master maker, master craftsman, has a definite idea of what he's going to make, has a clear sense of form and the rest of it. But still, it takes all this work to to produce it. But the other thing I was thinking mm -hmm. too is that is that every piece of wood is unique. I mean, you could no no two chunks of wood can be can can, can ever be the same, even if they're, they're from the same tree. They're from different parts of it. Uh, the grain is different, and and, and so on. So it's an interesting problem that I came across once um, years ago working with somebody who is interested in, in, um, in old Finnish musical instruments. There's an old uh, traditional instrument called the kantele, a sort of lyre, um, where the main part, the, the resonating chamber, is a piece of solid wood that is then cut uh, open, or not cut open, but, but is excavated, so as to make something a bit like a, a kind of box shape. Piece, so you have to have to gouge it out, and um, the people who make these have, have passed away now, and, and there are a few examples in museums. and And, and, and the question w was posed actually to, to the museum people: is how can we uh, recreate this this instrument so that it's authentic? And and one view would be to say, well, the, the thing to do is to uh, create another piece that is exactly of the same form, dimensions, everything else as a, as a specimen that we have in the museum. And the other would be, no, the way to do it is to take a piece of wood and use exactly the same methods, uh, mm. try and, try and re re recreate the skills. And, and the, the point was that if you want to produce an artifact that is exactly the same as the one you've got in the museum, then you can't use the traditional methods. Mm. You have to bring in some gadgets. To, to actually, put. or if you're going to use the traditional methods, then you're not going to get something that's identical to the one in the museum because it's a different piece of wood. And I guess with this case, uh, because every piece of wood is different, if you had a, a, a series of bowls, um, we would we would be very impressed by the fact that no two bowls are alike. Mm -hmm. That be, because the even though they've been made in using the same techniques, and even though the maker has a very firm idea about what the design is, no two bowls are going to be the same because no two pieces of wood are the same. And we would value that. So I guess the question is, would, 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 would your master craftsman, if you said to him, look, no two pieces of wood are the same, you know you what you want to make, but, every, but actually this bowl is not identical to that in exact measurements and everything else, would he say, that, that, that's fine, that's not the point? I mean, what would he say? No, I, I, think he, I think he would, he would 
he he would uh, he would he would agree with you that no piece of uh, wood are the same, but he would still insist of, on the the categorical difference between uh, the the wood from these opposite ends of the tree, yeah, and uh, and and uh, and he would also, or actually he would he would sort of be very pleased if he were able to make two bowls that were actually identical. <laughs> he, he's, he's, he, he's aiming for that, in a way. So his, his, his idea about uh, being um, uh, a master carver is to have the maximum control of the outcome. So in that sense, he might not be so different from the Christian craftsman who would say that unlike God who could who's a master craftsman and could produce the perfect whatever it is um, all of uh, 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 anything that a mortal can produce is, a, is, a, is an approximation to that so that the, the perfect carbon is, a, is, a, is not something that ever exists unless, unless God made it mm. and, so and of course it. these people are very Christian yeah. Yeah, the, there's no doubt about it. But uh, uh, so, uh, so, so it's possible that there's some Christianity in there somewhere, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but, I'm, but I mean, for, for me, on the more sort of pragmatic uh, fieldwork point of view, what I was uh, sort of fascinated by was the potentials of just, you just, hang on to gaining any sort of competence really and and see what kind of uh, of what kind of uh, experiences and explanations that crop up around there and and sort of follow from there and and for me it, it was really important to have done other field works as well in uh, in in Tonga I think if I just came to the wood wood carver's shop this would not mean the same to me as when I've done field works in a local community for one and a half years before. So, so it's the sort of, but, but, but I found that in a way, I, I understood the, the sort of the depths and significance of the concepts of Mu'a and Mu'a in a very different manner when I had experienced it in my hands uh, and the hardness of the, of the thing. And I was thinking that well, these concepts, they don't exist in a vac vacuum. They, uh, they come together with a lot of experiences in the, in, uh, during the time when children grow up in the situation when you try to arrange a feast, in the situation when you go to the field to, uh, to cultivate things. So, so they, they have, I think that my experience might sort of be, be, have something of it which is akin to what makes this, these, this give these concepts a sort of a heaviness or a content for people? So that's the. Yeah. But that's really interesting because it, it, then it raises the question of if, if your master, master craftsman had a very clear concept in his head, where did the concept come from? Uh, let's say that, that, that a traditional anthropologist might say, oh, it just, you know, it's just part of the tradition, it just came down. But, but what you're suggesting, and it's, I'm, I'm, I'm much more plausible, is that, that actually the way in which, that, that for your master craftsman too, the concept was very heavy. Mm -hmm. It weighed, we would say yeah. it weighed on his mind. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And, and that weight, where do you think, where does that weight come from? It comes from his experience. Yeah. Of all that experience of carving that he must already have had. So, so you can still argue that in some sense, the concept itself grows out of the practice yep. uh, in, a, in, a, in that longitudinal sense. If you take. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. I think we, we will move on to the, to the panel discussion. We'll have a short break first. So, and of course, this is the program today. Uh, my name is Lena Melheim. I'm uh, head of the archaeology department. Um, I'm one of those uh, PhD students who read uh, Timingold with uh, lots of enthusiasm. I think I used the summer of 2000, 
eight, banging my head against perception of the environment. <laughs> I was really, really fascinated about that book. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, to, to be here today. Uh, and there have been uh, six very stimulating papers. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot. I think I'll, the talking will be up to you. Uh, but what I think we should do is to try to think through dialogue. And that was actually the mandate of the, the Research Council when, when they uh, made this seminar. That was to... Oh, sorry. Um, to try to make steps towards tearing down or at least breaching the barriers between our diverse disciplines. And uh, the background for that is, of course, that we here at the museum, we are in a fantastic uh, situation with so many different disciplines uh, gathered, uh, not literally, but literary, under one roof. <laughs> Spread out over the whole city, though, but still we're under the same umbrella, the Museum of Cultural History. But still there seems to be uh, boundaries between us, uh, sometimes to the extreme, uh, and sometimes very difficult, difficult to, to collaborate across uh, departments somehow. So uh, I think that the Ingold course with the four A's should be a source of inspiration to us, that maybe we should try that out. <laughs> um, and I really like, like the concept of anti-disciplinarity. Anti um, but then, uh, J.P. Snow's uh, infamous uh, article from 59, I believe, about the two uh, cultures in academia is perhaps not that valid for us archaeologists because we have always been collaborating a lot with the natural sciences and more and more after the, the uh, third science revolution in archaeology. Um, also, I think we're coping, you know, with culture and nature together all the time. So that's perhaps not a big, huge difference for us. But still, we, we, we write about humans, we write about culture. Um, and my first question to, to the panel members and, and the speakers today is very, very fundamental, <laughs> perhaps a bit tough for this part of the day, but I'm sure you can manage. What is culture? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> New <question>. <laughs> okay, we can come back to that. <laughs> um, all right, uh, my, my next question concerns language, and it has already been commented upon, but I think uh, all the papers kind of uh, had to do with language in some way or the other. Like Jan was showing this kind of parallelity between uh, technology and language. Um, Jon very specifically addressed language, and both uh, Kaya and Marianne talked about the written sources and how they ki kind of uh, enhance our interpretations of the archaeological or material record. Um, and unfortunately, Thura was not here today, uh, but her talk was going to be about this. And, and her, um, her critique, perhaps, uh, of the turn towards uh, skill uh, know-how instead of knowledge um, is that language is somehow placed as or reduced to being a mere representation. But she's arguing that language can be a way of nearing, a way of coming closer to, what, to your object of study. So um, this is of course the uh, work of the scientists uh, and I feel very much uh, I feel, for me, that's a, a way of, you know, uh, of uh, being an archaeologist is very much about writing and through writing, discovering what you wanted to say. <laughs> so, but I want to open up the question a little bit uh, and ask you, 
how you look upon uh, the interplay between materi material culture and language. I suddenly remembered the answer to, the, to your first question. <laughs> um, wait, what is culture? And, and the, the answer is that, the, the, for me, anyway, is that um, culture is the name of a, is a is a word for a question. It's not the answer. And the, the, so, just uh, also nature is also the word. Human nature is the word for a question. So, so culture, the, the culture is a, a question, and the question is, um, why do why do humans' practices vary? That's all it is. It's a question. So when we say we're concerned with culture, it's a shorthand way of saying we're interested in why human practices vary. And that means that culture cannot be the answer. We cannot then say, oh, human practices vary because of culture. Or it's an entirely circular thing. And that circularity is there in a lot of disciplines. And, but it's one of the reasons why, in, in, in anthropology anyway, we've, we've actually been on, the, trying, we, we've been on the retreat from culture for some time now, even as psychologists have suddenly discovered it. But precisely for that reason, that it simply leads us into a vicious circle. That, oh, um, human practices vary because they vary, which isn't an answer to anything. That, 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 that's, that's my answer. Sorry, I, I've forgotten about it and now I remembered it. <laughs> and then we can get, well, maybe other people have something to say, but then we can get on to your question about language. Thank you. Uh, but still, people think of themselves as being part of a culture. <laughs> Some form of culture, academic culture or uh, Nordic culture, uh, cellist culture. No? <laughs> Okay, anybody who wants to say something about culture or well, the other, the next question? Uh, the word and the, and the lang language and the, and the image. Um, I'm thinking uh, because uh, one has talked about uh, like church art saying that it was made for the ones who can't read, uh, you know, for them to, so it's sort of a, a cartoon that you can recognize something. Uh, but I think that uh, the manner they are made, you know, the, 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 the composite materiality that is so um, complicated and everything, it's so much meaning woven into all the different stages of making and the different materials. Uh, we're back to this the, the word vox and the res, the content of the word being uh, lifted out and up and actually uh, giving, giving an experience uh, with your knowledge that you lift it out and above the word and give the content that can't be said with a written word. It's something, there is more to it than the word uh, because you can't reach God's language with a written word. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think that's part of it is giving uh, almost a sort of aesthetic experience uh, and of awe and awe that uh, lift you out of the ordinary. So it's something, yeah. They complement each other because without the word you don't, can't gain the knowledge because you discuss and you write with the word but then the art has another dimension. So they, yeah. it's not one or the other, they, yeah. Mm. Uh, I would like to follow up that. Um, because uh, on, of course, the, the um, um, interaction between language and, um, and materiality is there, but uh, on one level, you can say that um, uh, language, the, the, the connection between language and materiality also is a very academic way of looking at things. And, uh, and you were talking about seeing, Kaya, but it's also um, 
uh, very important for me at least to look at the, the craftsmanship and the making of things as tacit knowledge. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, a very important aspect that we haven't talked very much of today. But, but I was, uh, I mean, I was thinking about uh, the aspect of uh, words or statements also being actions in a way where, where I found some uh, surprising, uh, surprising to me sort of similarity between different papers where, where uh, actually between sort of the, the your paper uh, where you, um, where you sort of uh, approach uh, the tapestries in terms of uh, their efficacy or their sort of their, their being uh, uh, something which is uh, aims to create history in a way to to make things happen and uh, and, and 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 also in the Jung's paper the typologies of uh, of uh, or the sort of with with uh, which was sort of uh, inherited from the racists may be seen as a sort of a, a way of uh, magically uh, get, uh, making things happen or sort of uh, the, 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 it was turned it upside down. It was not sort of based on genetic evidence but it sort of, it was like it, it, it reproduced a sort of an, uh, an order through having these words and typologies and then created a sort of uh, or had the, the, the sort of potential of creating a sort of reality uh, through these, these words in a way. So, I mean, words do have this, this uh, aspect of being, um, of being actions in a way or, and or expressions or statements have effects as well, yeah. Jung's first, and then Kaya. Well, uh, yes, uh, just uh, on this um, about uh, Cavalli's force and these uh, uh, categories, uh, I think there is another aspect to it as well, because this uh, <clears throat> his work was based on it, uh, on data that was already published by other researchers, so it's kind of, it's not, I said it was summing up half a century of of research, but it was not his own research. It was kind of the, the collective effort of people working in this field. And of course, the data is uh, established by um, those data, those people who were doing that research, they had some uh, concepts in their head. They were uh, organizing this data and collecting data based on specific preconception about races or populations and so on, so you could say that this database in itself is a kind of a material uh, precondition for his work again, so that kind of the research tradition is kind of uh, inscribed, you could say, into the database, sort of, that's, yeah. <clears throat> I was also uh, a way uh, you also use words to lift things up and out like in like using analogies you then create uh, associations and pictures mental images so that's also you know you, you with using uh, the, uh, poetry and other uh, kind of not just sort of academic texts <laughs> you can uh, you can also stretch the word um, by uh, yeah. using, you know, making people, you know, uh, extend it with their own uh, heads, <laughs> their mental eyes. <laughs> if I may? Yeah, I, I, I very much agree with, with what you say and, and that I, I, I've come to the conclusion that there's one community of people in the world who really hate words and that's academics. Uh, I mean, scientists think that words are deceptive and they paper over the reality of the facts. 
Humanists think that, that, that words will never get to the authenticity of real embodied human experience, and they keep saying that we have to go behind the words in order to find this. And I, and I, and I really think that that is wrong. And you, you raised the quick question about tacit knowledge, and, and, and um, I've been thinking about this recently, and I've come to the conclusion that tacit knowledge is definitely not the right word. Uh, although we know we can accept what Palani meant when he introduced it, and of course there's this, this huge reservoir of know-how that we have, and we wouldn't be able to do anything uh, without it. But the one thing this residue is, is it, it is not silent. It is full of movement, it is noisy, it is dynamic. And if, if one thing is silent, it's explicit knowledge. It's knowledge that has been pinned down, fixed in writing, tied down to absolute coordinates, explicated. And then it's, it's dead, and no sound left. But, but, but in what we've been calling tacit knowledge is actually full of movement, and that movement includes the gestures that give rise to either spoken words or handwritten words. Uh, so poetry, too, is a craft. And, and, um, and, and, and think of all, the, all that, that when, when words, like you said, when, when we speak, I mean, the, the words come up. It's a, if you think about the performance of them, uh, they're really beautiful things, and they're, uh, and they're part of our usage. And I, I think we should treat words like, like really precious, like, like, like precious stones, like, like things of great beauty that we should treat with respect. And I, I get upset by, by acronyms, for example, which are taking over the world yeah. <laughs> uh, so that we can, a way of, of talking about things without having to talk about them, without having to invest ourselves emotionally in them. And worst of all are the are military acronyms, which, which allow military people to speak the unspeakable without even having to go to the trouble of having to say things out loud and undergo the emotional trial of having to do so. Sorry, yeah, that, that's so, my... Yeah. Third, third part, what would you call... Um, do you have another name? I, well, I, I've been trying with another name. The, 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 I, the, I, and and the, one, the best one I've come up with is haptic. Haptic, which, um, uh, which doesn't, isn't re necessarily restricted to touch, but, um, but is a, 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 a sensibility that involves um, a, 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 a bodily engagement with others, other people, with materials, whatever. Um, which is a, a, a direct and immediate, uh, and so I, I've been t uh, just something. I, I've been talking about a, a zone of hapticality, this area in which um, all this engagement is going on, which is what most people are talking about when they talk about tacit knowledge. It's just so they're not wrong. It's just I think that tacit gives the understanding that somehow this knowledge is sedimented inside the body when really it's sort of flowing around all over the place. And so tacit gives a false sense of it being silent and at peace and at rest downhill. The, it's the, the, this metaphor of the, of the but tip, not the tip of the iceberg, but the rest of it. Mm. But it's not like an iceberg. It's, it's, it's more like a, the water flowing around. That, that, that's in my... Anyway, yeah. Haptic. Uh, yeah, I very much agree uh, with that point about the acronyms. Uh, and also we see that, for instance, uh, the word geno genomic uh, diversity is now being used by race racists to argue for differences between people. So, so language is really powerful. But, but what I want to, my last question, and then I will open the floor for other comments and questions, if there are any left. Um, is we, we tend to, you know, all, all the, the concepts and words uh, and definitions we use, they, they can be filled and emptied with meaning continuously. And perhaps some of the divides between the dif disciplines are not relevant anymore, but as shown so nicely by uh, Gavin Lucas is in his book about uh, the archaeological understanding, the archaeological record, uh, he shows how uh, the uh, empirical uh, material for archaeologists was very, very different in the 17th, 18th century from now. Uh, so, so it's archaeology too is, you know, 
filled with meaning, emptied with meaning. Um, and I think it's very, very stimulating to, to, to take out meaning from some uh, words and, and create news, new, new ones. So I was thinking maybe for the Museum of Cultural History, uh, in order to, to work more uh, better together between the disciplinary divides, maybe we should start a palimpsest group. And that, of course, again, will, in a few years time, it will turn into palimpsest studies. And then it has be become this term which we need to empty of meaning again and reflect upon. Uh, and I, I think you show that so well, Jan, in, in your paper, uh, with the, the very simple uh, uh, drawings and the test you made with the students, that uh, a, a abstract symbol uh, tends to move towards something that is easily rem remembered, either a form known from elsewhere or a very symmetrical figure. And then it can be copied and then the rest is culture, in my opinion. So uh, my final question is, do you have a suggestion as to how we should, at this museum, be better at working together? Tim. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but, um... Actually, when I was uh, when I was uh, we, uh, when we established this um, the first um, we call exhibition council, uh, and which came up with the idea of uh, renewing the the core exhibitions or exchanging the basic exhibition with what we call core exhibitions. The idea was to sort of establish a sort of arena and invite different disciplines to this arena in order to, to focus on a common theme in a way. And I was thinking about uh, now, and we, we have established themes of collapse, control, heritage. The, I was thinking, how would Tim's, how would Tim's uh, sort of um, concepts that he, uh, of, the four, uh, of the four A's, how would they work as themes in thinking about exhibitions, for instance? I was, I, was, I was wondering, would they work <laughs> for, uh, for us if, I mean, the, the things that he um, suggested as a, as a sort of um, lecture themes, could they be made into workshop themes and uh, could sort of, could they, could materializations come out of that, that would make the uh, grounds for exhibitions, for instance? That, uh, because that was the way our thinking was that, I mean, in order to, achieve some sort of multidisciplinarity, one discipline can't be the sort of uh, the support of another discipline, but you have to bring the disciplines together on an equal footing around some sort of common uh, puzzle, in a way, or some sort of uh, common endeavor. And, 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 and maybe, I still think that exhibitions is a sort of a good starting point for creating that sort of arenas, to my way of thinking. Well, I, I think one way of, of uh, try to, to understand the importance of collaborating with others and, and, and discuss w with others is, is to have a common theme, as you say. And at least the way I look at archaeology is that it, it's a hum humanities subject that wants to know more about what it means to be human by studying the remains of humans in the past and uh, the material remains uh, in the past. And, and, he, he, and I guess a cultural historical museum kind of has that goal, hasn't it? it, it it's about humans. It's about understanding what it is to be human. And if you have a common kind of theme like that, then, 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 then you realize that whoever can, can produce information that will... That, that, that will help you to, to, to understand what it is to be human is important, regardless of how that information is, is uh, wh where it's coming from and, and wh what it consists of, I think, anyway. Thank you. Anyone else? 
I'm not sure if I have any advice for this museum, but in, uh, in general, I think when you're talking about uh, uh, collaboration uh, and communication across disciplinary boundaries, I think there is, uh, uh, it's important to uh, not be afraid of discussing the basic issues that might be div divisive. I mean, there are sometimes uh, uh, people from different disciplines are unable to co collaborate just because they are competing about the same funding maybe or the, the same uh, field of, uh, of research, but there are no really say, theoretical differences or, or uh, other occasions there are, you know, people who are uh, approach like I was talking about in my presentation, people are approaching the same empirical uh, questions and, and, and so on from completely different theoretical angles and they are not talking together because these different approaches are incompatible. Uh, and sometimes people, you know, uh, take, uh, you, you take data from established within one field and transfer it to another Discipline, use it as a as a uh, as facts, even though <laughs> the, the facts that are established in one discipline might be incompatible with uh, the, the theoretical preconceptions that you are working. I mean, so I mean that you need to talk about these basic uh, questions and uh, and and uh, not be afraid of uh, of uh, you know addressing those. Uh, that kind of issues, yeah, maybe that's... Uh... Anyone else? Well, uh, it's a university museum, and <laughs> one problem with, 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 the, with universities is that it tends to, 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 uh, to, to hire autonomous people as you, as, you, as you were saying, you know, it's people who want to make a career, career and they want to have research money and they want to have titles and things like that. Uh, so, and the, 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 the one thing to overcome that is to have, to have a goal which, which everybody gains from. So, so, so the, the, a good collaborative climate is a climate where you do, do something good and I gain because you do something good. A, a bad climate is when you do something good and 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 and, and I, I I have to suffer for it. You know? So so and that's typical of of universities. I worked in rescue archaeology, and in rescue archaeology we had a common goal. It was to 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 do excavations and produce reports and get new excavations. And and, and it's very much easier to to collaborate and, and in the, under those circumstances. So creating that kind of goal is is crucial. Mariana. <laughs> Um, I, I just have to say that I think we collaborate a lot uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, across uh, the disciplines at the museum. Uh, we do it all the time, but um, we we kind of stress this um, uh, this problem, especially. Uh, between archaeology and anthropology. Absolutely. And why is that? There's some history behind it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Bourdieu got the final word. Uh, <laughs> just uh, rounding this off, uh, I want to um, quote uh, Terence. He was a slave, uh, but uh, managed to become a, a comedy, comedy um, uh, uh, how do you say that, playwright? No, the one writing comedies. Comedy writer? Author? Whatever, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the, the, this was during the uh, second century BC. And he said, I'm not going to try that in Latin now, this late in the day, but he said that being a human, uh, I think, Nothing human is alien to me. So I think that's a good point of departure for <laughs> being uh, interdisciplinary. 
So uh, I open the floor for other questions, comments from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I have kind of comment, kind of question. It's going to be a bit roundabout, but stay with me. Um, <laughs> that on, on this topic of uh, interdisciplinarity and sort of language and communication between different fields, and I think this is very interesting from my perspective, particularly as being a natural scientist in a sort of humanistic dominated area, and trying to find common language with which to describe concepts and bridge these gaps. And I think this really comes back to something that Tim touched on in his, uh, in his talk um, about um, the difference between seeing matter as, say, molecular structure and spaces between the molecular structure versus continuous matter. And I think that you have to be able to marry these concepts because we as natural scientists, like, it's a fact that they, it is molecular structure with spaces, but at some point when you zoom out, it is continuous matter, and you have to be able to see the matter in both ways in order to um, be able to get a meaningful interpretation of the matter from uh, natural science analysis. Um, I just wondered if uh, anyone had further thoughts on that and maybe how we can improve this because I think it is a, it is a constant challenge. I think you, um, every time you you know as someone uh, we get. Um, fresh new chemist from the chemist world uh, that, uh, you know, diving into our world with the objects that are complicated, that have aged, that are, it's not, you know, it's not clean matter, it's not a, um, uh, <laughs> it's uh, so many layers uh, of interpretation of what you're actually looking at. And also if you take a sample you have to know a lot about the object to actually interpret that sample. So I think the dialogue in front of the object, you know, with the object in the center, uh, at least for in conservation and also must be in archaeology, that it all comes out of the object. Uh, and it's a, I think it's a, you know, it's a learning curve for both worlds to approach it, each other. Uh, so. I think in, in conservation we have, we, we have to have some degree of chemistry uh, taught to us and, and uh, the, that is because we, in, when we communicate with like chemists or physicists or an engineer, you have to be able to pose the right question and you have to understand the answer. So I guess that goes for every field that you have to, uh, in, in order to get to the borders and cross the lines, you have to get a language that you can actually interpret. <laughs> but, but my sense is, and, and I have no evidence for this, but that chemistry is a very, very strange discipline compared with many others in the natural sciences. It has a, it has a peculiar history and, and doesn't fit sort of e easily uh, into uh, uh, an area that would otherwise include, include physics and bioscience and things like that, 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 that chemists seem to have a, a sort of intuitive feel for materials um, that I, I, I think is rather unique to to that area, and and I, I've heard it in the UK, and I don't know where elsewhere. Chemists have actually, for this reason, been having a rather hard time um, in terms of funding and in terms of institutional recognition. Uh, that it's regarded as a, a, a sort of misfit within the scientific pantheon. Um, for rather interesting reasons, but that might, I might be completely wrong. But I've got that impression. <laughs> I feel like I must respond to this. 
actually, this is the first time anyone's said this to me, and I, I, I mean, yes, no, I see what you mean, um, and particularly, I guess this this idea that it's a, a, a science that lends itself to sort of an intuitive understanding of material kind of does ring, to, ring true a bit in that um, we focus very much on chemistry as applies to cultural heritage object, objects, which also comes back to what Kaya was saying, that you have to, you know, there's an experience that I think most chemists have, that when you come into contact with the material that you're studying as a whole piece, you understand your analysis a lot better. Like, there's something that you need to see that in its, visually in its context in order to be able to pose your questions and, and sort of design experiments to answer the questions that you're, um, that you're posing. Um, so this is an interesting thought. Uh, I haven't felt that we as chemists are seen separately from the other sciences in the, uh, the na other natural sciences in this way, but I will, uh, I will think on it more and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Taylor, is this a comment f uh, to the f question which I don't remember anymore, or is it a <laughs> new one? <laughs> And, and um, indicate the problem, and uh, in a playful way uh, suggest uh, a, 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 not a solution, but uh, a make a suggestion, perhaps. Um, and it is about uh, yes, language is, is troublesome because uh, it bails, and it, uh, it uh, we need to get behind it, or we need to get the facts in front of it, and so forth. But art is also uh, problematic. Uh, architects very often do uh, activities of making that are uh, strikingly close to artistic practices, yet they are not artists. And I've come across archaeologists as well, whose practices are, are bewilderingly close to artics, artistic practices, and even exhibiting, for instance, in uh, the Arsenale in, in, in Venice, and are still not artists. And even artists claim to be leaving art in order to do art. So you know, that art is a, it, it's a problematic category in the four A's, I, I, I feel, working the place that I do. There is an artist I know who uh, uh, is doing an artistic research project in um, a sculptural project that involves um, microbiology. So she did a microbiology course at the university. Uh, where she had to do a cytochrome oxidase test. And in this uh, 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 test uh, form was written the following uh, concluding words. Draw the organisms you have observed and indicate the result of the two enzymatic tests and submit these uh, to, the one, uh, uh, to uh, one of the instructors for approval. So you should draw something and have it approved. And it says, Try to draw the organisms to the uh, to the same scale, uh, and she's an artist, and 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 she was, uh, you know, it's a very uh, a bewildering place to be for an artist in that particular aspect because she was asked to draw, and so uh, uh, what do we make of this? Uh, for me, the haptic juncture, or the. Uh, for for me, the haptic senses in the way the joiner of the, the other senses. Uh, Ioanni Palasma, for instance, he, in, uh, micro, in his interest for, for microphenomenology, is interested in how sight, hearing, taste, and smell are, are specialized uh, haptic senses, in the sense that uh, a sight is a, a specialized sensitivity to light, hearing is a, is a haptic sensitivity to sound, and um, smell and taste likewise. So, uh, and this is quite interesting that these specialized senses still are in touch with touch, you know. Uh, and I'm wondering this act of drawing where we're actually 
uh, we are, are combining something haptic and something visual at the same time. They become this kind of a, a, a loop creating, created between the vision and the hand when we draw and we look. And this is a, somehow enhances our ab ability to observation. So I'm just wondering, what should we do with drawing? I mean, this is, uh, I guess, your initial question uh, with anthropologists. Do we want to return to drawing somehow? Uh, uh, do we want to go further with drawing? At um, NMBU, there's this uh, 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 drawing teacher in, in uh, landscape architecture who has been uh, working with microphenomenology in many, uh, during many years, for instance. So the drawing is definitely not about uh, drawing contour and, uh, and value, uh, value sketches and things like that. It's not technical in that sense. It's a different sort of intelligence entirely. And I'm just wondering if, if this is in a way uh, a, a missing link because when we have been discussing here now, art has in a way disappeared out the back door. It, it is implicit, I think, and it's very present in the kind of work that you do. It's celebrated in, 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 in the way you are theorizing and making and also by your, your practice as a cellist. And what are these practices, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of are present and absent at the same time. I'm just wondering, what are we doing with them? My um, old uh, mentor, or uh, a thesis director, Frederick Bart, uh, was very uh, good at drawing. And, it, it, you know, we don't see that anywhere. It's very strange. And I'm just wondering if the ambivalent, ambivalence with regard to the object has something to do with uh, uh, you know this uh, this uh, this element. I don't have the answers to this, but I definitely would like to explore them uh, a lot more. And um, if any anyone is like-minded, I think it would be interesting to organize uh, activities at uh, uh, at um, you know um, research academic level of pra practicing drawing and involving them in research practices somehow. Uh, I don't know. This is, uh, if some people are interested in that, I'll be glad to continue that, uh, that conversation. I'm not a great drawer myself. I do draw a lot, so it does have that element to it. But uh, I'm kind of struck about how we now discuss about natural sciences and humanities, but we, uh, in a way, what of artistic practices or is that relevant or which element are we talking about when this practice kind of has a tendency of slipping out the back door to, uh, I don't hate to use that word tacit, but it's, it is a bit tacit for me. Well, in, uh, when we uh, restore a medieval sculpture, for instance, or a panel, um, we, you know, with the background of all the knowledge we have and understand to date about that object, when we, uh, we have a uh, philosophy behind how we want to um, hand it over to the public, you know, uh, the, the, the visual restored image, and it's both, it's a strong ethic in it because it's a historical document that we uh, are manipulating, but we are thinking that we, uh, we want the public to first meet uh, an object and then that they, that it, uh, represents itself as authentic, though has many layers of history behind it and is very far removed from what it once was, but to bring it uh, by uh, uh, manipulating the damage, like the white chalk ground that is scattered all over, and we bring that those with a special way of retouching so you can see them when you get closer, we bring them in a level behind the actual original polychrome and get the polychrome to step forward. So we work with both the surfaces and the pore and to present it as a piece of art. If it's 
that much left of it that it can be reached that level. And we work it up from the damaged image and with this, uh, the way we retouch, we can stop when we can see it goes together. And my former colleague, he worked with uh, perception psychologists to understand how, what is it that make the eye pick up some uh, damage in, you know, uh, that it's so it's the border, it's where the eye meets a border that is very different, it will react. So the, it's, we work a lot with the borders and then in the middle it doesn't matter because the eye just passes over it. And so, so it's lots of those kinds of thinking behind how we present an object. So then we actually use our knowledge into a practical, ap apply it to the object. And that's the result you will see when you, you experience it as the public. Yeah, yes, I agree with that lecture. Yeah. But the importance for the science behind this is the knowledge about what we look at. And it may, because in the 1920s, yeah. uh, uh, we have lots of uh, sculptures. It was a big group of sculptures that were repainted. That was, uh, um, they used uh, Reprin paint stripper. That was new and fresh product on the market with benzene and ethanol. And you could heat it up and you could you know, remove what they thought was oil painting on tempera, but they didn't have the knowledge. They didn't know that it was, the original was oil painting. Because in theory, Van Eyck uh, you know, invented that. And this was 200 years before. So they didn't have the knowledge and they meant to do something good, but they removed original structures and um, damaged because they didn't have the knowledge. But now we have because of all the analysis being performed, we know a lot more and we have also learned from our colleagues bad mistakes. Uh, and we also work in a manner that you can remove it again and you know, it's a lot of uh, development in the field. So uh, you can also say that if they, other ways of treating that, like the Viking ships that they you know, used alum that are now uh, very difficult to treat, but maybe we wouldn't have the have the sledges at all if they wasn't weren't treated. That that was what they could do then. So it's a constant development of factual information together with all the rest of discussions around what one can do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I was just. Uh, I didn't know that, uh, well, you told me just now that Frederick Bart used to draw a lot and what happened to the drawings, I don't know. But, but um, I'm thinking that uh, the, the way that most anthropologists 